Power of Us, a story about friendship, written by Duncan James, and on this occasion, read by Duncan James, because hi, I'm the author. Before the story begins, a short little bit that isn't a story. A community centre in England, and in other countries too, is a building with rooms available for the use of people living nearby. They can be small or large, depending on the communities they serve. Historically, they offered opportunities for people to study and socialise, something they still do today. They are open to everyone, including the sociable, the introverted, the generous, the needy, the brave, the shy. The clubs and societies found at community centres fulfil different roles. Many are designed to bring people together through some kind of shared activity, welcoming anyone and everyone with special rules to ensure that respect and friendship be extended to strangers from the moment they arrive. This story is dedicated to all the real people in real community centres. And now, let's crack on with the story. In the early 21st century, in the town of Bournemouth, in the south of England, a story about friendship that starts with one man alone is about to unfold. Tuesday the 7th of June. Evening sunlight illuminated the grassy lawns, flowers, scattered trees, clock tower and woodland of Store Park. A river ran along the far edge of the park. A road ran along the near edge. A short single track road led into the park, stopping at a gravel parking area with a scattering of cars that lay in front of a large red brick building with a grey tiled roof. Ivy grew brazenly up the walls and roof, hiding large sections from view. A heavy wooden door faced onto the parking area with an age-worn sign to the side. The sign read, Store Community Centre, built by our Victorian ancestors, enjoyed by generations, open to everyone. Beyond Store Park sprawled an urban landscape of mainly two-storey buildings along straight and curving roads, sorted into groups of terraced, semi-detached and occasionally detached houses. Sometimes the houses were joined by a low-rise, school, industrial or other building. A man wearing boots, dark trousers, a battered coat and a large rucksack approached the door of the community centre. He paused. His hand reached out. He opened the door and walked in. Within lay an open area with three corridors leading off it. Taped to the back of a chair were handwritten signs directing the reader towards Badminton Club, Store Chess League, Quiet Study Room and Power of Us. He looked at the sign. He looked back towards the door. He took a deep breath. He headed down a corridor. A little way along the corridor, a door lay partly open. A woman in her mid-forties stepped out. She was dressed smartly in trousers and a blouse. She smiled in greeting as the man approached. Good evening. He stopped. She continued. My name is Cheryl. I run Power of Us. What's your name? My name is Dean. Great to meet you, Dean. We start in about twenty minutes. Cheryl pulled the box from inside the room into the corridor. This is a box of clothes. I mean, obviously you can see that, she smiled. You'll also find towels and shower gel in there. You're absolutely welcome to join us and I'm delighted to see you. Entry is free and all I ask is that you use the community centre showers to clean up and take some fresh clothes and shoes from the box. She pulled a second box into the corridor. Anything dirty, including used towels, can go in this one. Dean picked up the two boxes easily. He turned and headed back down the corridor. The showers, called out Cheryl, are left at the end and second door on the right. Thank you, replied Dean. Dean stood just outside the door where he had earlier met Cheryl. He put down the two boxes. He adjusted the colour of his pink shirt. He tucked on the waistband of his green trousers. He looked down at his bright yellow trainers. He paused. He picked up the two boxes and walked into the room. The floor had a thick weave grey carpet with various marks and stains. The walls were off yellow, with flakes of paint peeling off. The ceiling was covered in battered grey tiles and home to six fluorescent tube lights. Chairs were scattered round the edges of the room. Tucked into a corner was a stack of folding tables. Cheryl sat on a chair next to a window that gave a view out onto the park. She was reading a piece of paper covered in handwritten notes. Hello again, Dean. You can put the boxes down by the door, thanks. You can put your rucksack there too, next to my sports bag and handbag. Dean put the boxes and his rucksack on the floor. 
Can I plug in my Kindle and phone, please, to charge up, if you... that's OK? Of course. Dean knelt down. He reached into his rucksack and pulled out a charger, a Kindle and an iPhone. He set the Kindle and iPhone to charge. Bye, Mum, said a girl's voice from outside the door. Dean stood up awkwardly, nearly bumping into a girl as she walked in. Hello, said the girl. She put down a small backpack decorated in a camouflage pattern of greens and browns. She was nine or ten years old, wearing a pink dress decorated with flowers. My name is Emily. Emily smiled. Dean gave a small smile in return. Hello, Emily. We play games first, said Emily. Then there's hangout time afterwards to drink some biscuits. You don't have to pay. You can give a donation at the end. What's your name? My name is Dean. What's your... S sorry, I know. Emily. All right, hello. Cheryl smiled as she sat reading. Usually we sit down and wait until seven o'clock, explained Emily. Usually Abdul is early. Hi, Cheryl. A male teenage voice came from the doorway. Hi, Emily. A boy in his mid to late teens appeared. He wore an unbuttoned blue and white shirt over an Apollo 11 t-shirt. He added his backpack to the growing collection. Good evening, Abdul, said Cheryl. Hello, Abdul. Emily indicated towards Dean. This is Dean. Hi, Dean, said Abdul. Nice to meet you. Is this your first time? Yes, replied Dean. Emily looked at Abdul. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Abdul's gaze was passing over Dean's clothes in the two boxes. And you? You need to help me with my homework, said Emily. What is it? asked Abdul. How you classify fish names, especially in the Pacific? I printed a sheet, so you just need to help me understand. That's not actually your homework, is it? said Abdul. I'll need to know eventually. Yes, if you let me help you with your actual homework first. It's important too. OK, said Emily. Now let's sort out the kitchen. She looked at Dean. We make a tray for later with a sign that says Power of Us. Otherwise, sometimes another group takes all the mugs. Perhaps, said Cheryl gently, as Dean is new, you might like to wait in here. Take things a bit more slowly. I, Dean looked at Cheryl, down at his bright yellow trousers, up at Emily, at Abdul. I'll wait in here, thank you. OK, Emily walked out of the door. Abdul followed Emily. We're very friendly here, said Cheryl. Hopefully that's all right with you. Yes, said Dean. At the moment, I'm not used to talking with other people, I mean, that's all. You can sit down if you like. Thank you. Dean walked over a chair and sat down. He looked down at his lap. He scratched his knee. His gaze drifted around the room. A drip of water fell from the ceiling, landing on the carpet towards the centre of a dark stain. One of the fluorescent lights flickered and buzzed. Cheryl turned over her piece of paper to look at the other side. A fox walked past the window. Dean's gaze settled on the boxes and bags near the door. He looked at Cheryl. Cheryl? Cheryl looked at Dean and smiled. Yes? I'm worried my clothes smell. Shall I move the box, the one with my clothes in, that is, outside? That's a nice thought. Thank you for that. But I always move the boxes just before we start, so I'll sort that in a bit. OK, said Dean. Footsteps approached down the corridor. A man in his mid-fifties walked in. He wore a smartish green shirt, beige trousers and dark blue deck shoes. Good evening, Cheryl, he said. Good evening, Carl. Cheryl indicated with an open hand towards Dean. This is Dean. This is his first week. She indicated towards Carl. And Dean, this is Carl. Carl smiled at Dean. Good evening, Dean. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, said Dean. Cheryl looked towards the door. We'll get started as soon as Emily and Abdul are back from reserving our tray. Cheryl, Emily, Carl, Abdul and Dean were stood in a rough circle, facing inwards. The door was closed. The pile of bags remained, and the two boxes were gone. A cuddly toy dolphin was flying through the air towards Emily from the direction of Cheryl. Emily caught the dolphin. Tray! She adjusted the dolphin in her hands. Species of tree! She threw the dolphin at Dean. Dean caught the dolphin in one hand. Oak! He looked around. His eyes settled on Cheryl. Colour! Dean threw the dolphin at Cheryl. Cheryl caught the dolphin. Blue! The door burst open, and a woman swept in, slightly out of breath. She was in her late thirties. She wore a dress with a wavy orange and green pattern, a purple satin skirt, a purple satin scarf was draped across her shoulders, and a green handbag swung from one hand. "Hello, Florrie," said Emily. "Hi, Emily. Sorry I'm late." Florrie dropped her scarf and handbag down with the other bags. "That's all right. Hello. Good evening, Florrie." The circle adjusted as Florrie joined. Cheryl indicated towards Dean. "You won't know Dean." Florrie looked at Dean and smiled. 
Hello, Dean. Hello, Flory, replied Dean. Cheryl looked at Carl. Sandwich. She threw the dolphin at him. Carl caught the dolphin and paused. Triangular. Cheryl sat on a chair, looking down at a piece of paper. Facing her in a semicircle were Carl and Flory sat on chairs, and Emily Abdul and Dean sat on the floor. Emily grinned. Story time! Cheryl nodded towards Dean. Dean, we always have a story at the end, and it can be anyone who tells it. And we always let Cheryl tell it, said Emily, because she's very good at it. That's very kind of you, said Cheryl, but you all know anyone can take a turn. And, explained Emily, each week is a different story with different characters and different other things, so you don't have to know what happened before. Thank you, said Dean. This sounds good. Cheryl gave a final glance at the piece of paper. In the far future, a spaceship is drifting through space. As it spins slowly and relentlessly on its axis, a man in a spacesuit finishes cutting a circular hole the size of an access hatch in the side. Just a few centimetres of metal still connect the circle to the rest of the outer hull. The arcing laser torch fizzes to a stop. The man shakes it and puts it in a pocket of his spacesuit. He takes hold of the cut circle of metal and pulls upwards. The silence of space is unaffected by the bending of the metal. The circle hinges up and away from the hull. The edges of the newly cut hole glow faintly orange, with a trail of superheated particles escaping from one particularly hot spot. Without breaking the circle off completely, the man stops pulling. There is now enough space for him to enter the spaceship. The man uses manoeuvring jets to drift through the hole whilst avoiding touching the hot edges. Inside the ship, the man activates magnetic clamps on his boots. He is drawn to a surface and click sticks to it with both feet. He braces and pulls the circle of metal back into position. He takes the laser torch back out of his pocket and begins resealing the gap. After a few minutes, the seal is airtight and the room automatically regains pressure. A faint humming sound from the walls and the occasional light popping sound from the direction of the sealed hole replaced what had been the silence of a vacuum. The man gets out of his spacesuit to reveal a soldier's uniform. He pulls a laser gun from a holster at his waist and holds it to the side, aiming downwards. He moves towards a door. The door opens. The soldier steps through to a short corridor. He keeps the gun aiming downwards. At the other end of the corridor, a robot warrior stands blocking a doorway. The twenty hold hostages you are holding behind that door, says the soldier. Release them now. The robot simply stands. Your programming has been tampered with, continues the soldier. Remember, your pro primary programming is to protect these people, not to trap them in that room until they die of starvation. The robot simply stands. I'm sorry, says the soldier, as he begins shifting his weight and bringing his gun to aim at the robot. The soldier's movements are precise. His genetically enhanced reflexes and computer-enhanced brain are controlling his body with increasing speed. The robot simply stands. The aim of the soldier's gun approaches the robot. The robot seems almost ethereal. With no sense of anything having changed, the robot is moving, dodging, dancing, staying outside of the aim of the gun. In a blur of movement, the soldier speeds up. So does the robot. The soldier's aim is reacting, chasing the lithe form of the robot. The robot moves in a continuous blur. The soldier's aim adjusts it. The soldier's aim keeps adjusting. The robot keeps up its relentless dance. The soldier stops trying to aim his gun at the robot. He lowers it to his side. He begins to close the distance with the robot. The robot unsheathes a vicious looking monoblade with self-guided throwing capabilities. The robot holds the blade ready to throw. The soldier stops and stands. He looks at the robot. How? asks the soldier. Can you dodge like that? I am monitoring your brain waves. I can anticipate your every move. I can even monitor the messenger chemicals in your computer enhanced muscles. Whatever your body tries to do, I can respond before it even does it. You will never get past me. And I do not want to hurt you. Please leave. But you are hurting the people in the room behind you. I am not, says the robot. Their lack of food is doing that. I am simply following instructions. The soldier sighs. Can't you see? Someone has changed your programming. You are killing them. Yes, yes and no. Please leave. The soldier sighs. He turns round. And as he does so, he slams his gun back into his holster. At the same moment, his finger depresses the trigger. A laser bolt flies at the speed of light from the barrel of the gun, reflects off an armour plate in his boot, and smashes into the robot. The robot drops lifeless to the floor. The soldier walks forward, steps over the robot, opens the door, and rescues the hostages. 
For me, that's a retelling of the David vs. Goliath story, said Abdul, mixed with the classic problem of amoral technology. Flory looked at Carl. So he didn't mean to shoot the robot? That is the point of the story, said Emily. Or at least I think so. I thought maybe that was something he'd practised, said Abdul. I mean, maybe he trained to make that shot specifically to beat robots. Perhaps that's why Cheryl was emphasising the deterministic nature of the universe with detailed descriptions of everything that happened. Perhaps, said Carl. But we don't know what the characters were thinking, said Dean. We never actually heard. We only know what they did and said. I had the same question once, said Flory. It's because Cheryl's stories don't say what the characters are thinking. Third person objective point of view, explained Abdul. It's a style of writing that adds realism, being a bit like how plays are written, but it means you have to deduce for yourself, if you want to of course, what the characters are thinking. And, he paused and looked at Cheryl, Cheryl started to speak, and the point of the story is whatever you want it to be, finished Abdul and Emily in unison. Hmm, said Dean thoughtfully. Everyone stood up. Abdul disappeared out the door. Emily and Carl headed towards the tables. Cheryl and Flory walked towards the bags. Dean followed Emily and Carl. You can help me with the table, said Emily to Dean. Carl can do one on his own. He's very strong. It's old man's strength, laughed Carl. Your hair disappears and you start growing out in the middle. But at least you can impress the youngsters with supposed feats of strength. Feats of strength. Carl picked up a table and carried it to the centre of the room. Dean and Emily took one end each of another table and followed. Carl manipulated his table, causing the legs to flick out neatly and touch down on the grey carpet. Cheryl appeared with two chairs to put next to the table, and Flory placed a packet of biscuits on it. Dean casually held his, and Emily's table, in the air as Emily extended its legs. I've brought blockers. Carl headed towards the bags. If anyone wants to play... Emily moved away from the table and gave Dean a thumbs up. Dean allowed the table to settle onto the floor. Do the tables go together? No, said Emily. We have a games table and a not games table. The biscuits mean the other one is the not games table. Abdul appeared holding a tray with mugs, an insulated jug of hot water, a jug of cold water and other drink-making accoutrements. He placed the tray on the knock games table. Did someone say blockers? I'm in. Dean, are you playing? It's a board game. I'm thinking this is very unfair on Dean, said Cheryl. Normally we get newbies in waves in September and January, but poor Dean is on his own. Let's all introduce ourselves one more time. Dean gave us a nervous, Dean gave a nervous smile. I'll start, continued Cheryl. My name is Cheryl, and I'm the organiser of Power of Us. Emily gave Dean a friendly wave, and I'm Emily. I'm still at school. I'm young, but most people say I'm actually quite old. My name is Abdul, and I'm still at school as well. I'm doing my final exams next year. This is actually very helpful, said Dean. Carl returned from the pile of bags holding a board game with blockers written on the box. My name's Carl. I'm the oldie of the group. Flory looked at Dean and smiled. Hi, Dean. My name's Flory. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, replied Dean. Excellent, said Cheryl. And Dean, if you're not sure whether you want to play blockers, blockers yet, here's an easier decision. Would you like a biscuit? I'm good, thanks, replied Dean. I'll just have a drink of water. Everyone sat down. Carl, Emily and Abdul sat at the games table. Cheryl, Flory and Dean sat at the not games table. Flory looked at Dean. So, how did she hear about Power of Us? I saw a poster, said Dean, in a shop window, and I thought it sounded like fun, and I thought other people who like the sound of it will probably go as well, and so they'll probably be like me, so it's probably a place where I'll fit in. That's it, really. Does that make sense? Flory laughed gently. Yes, it does. And I met Cheryl at a meditation evening. She told me about it then. And, well, I've been coming ever since. Click, clack, click, click. To the accompaniment of clicking and clacking, Carl, Abdul and Emily began sorting red, yellow, green and blue plastic game pieces into piles. Carl looked across at Cheryl. Is this our first new person in two months? Yes, said Abdul. I typically have one new person every month or so, but usually they don't come back. I'm not counting the semi-regulars, of course, who come every so often. Then there's us, the regulars, said Emily. Usually we're all here, and I've not missed one for over six months, and neither is Abdul, and neither is Cheryl. I hardly count, said Cheryl. I have to come. Actually, you don't said Carl. And you don't have to run this either, so I'd say you absolutely do count. Click. Emily put a green game piece on the square playing board. Clack. Carl put down a blue piece. Click. Abdul put down a yellow piece. Flory passed something absent-mindedly towards Dean. Can you hold this for me? Dean took it. He looked at it and frowned. You've given me a biscuit. 
Flory smiled. I guess you'll just have to eat it now. Cheryl looked at Flory. How are the cats doing this week? Really well, replied Flory. I'm back down to 15-ish. Phantom's been formally adopted by a nice family. And he's put on plenty of weight, so I'm sorry he'll do fine. She looked at Dean. Do you like cats? I've never really been into pets, said Dean. Nothing against them, but I like to travel. Where have you been? asked Flory. Oh, said Dean. Germany, France, Croatia, Afghan, Norway, Canada, and all around the UK too. Flory's eyes widened. That's a lot. Is that with work, or... With work, said Dean. I used to be a marine, then I went into the Royal Engineers. What do you do now? asked Flory. Oh, said Dean. I could have got an early pension, but I decided not to, because it reduces the annual amount a lot. So I'm just between... between things. Do you miss it? asked Flory. Miss what? asked Dean. Flory frowned. I'm not sure. Do you miss the travel? Or just being in the army? I suppose it was really sociable in the army, so how about that? Do you miss that too? Well, explained Dean, the Royal Marines is part of the Navy. I then transferred to the Royal Engineers, which is part of the army, but I don't miss the social life. Not that I... I just... I found it all a bit too much sometimes. A lot of quiet people actually join the Navy because you're out at sea and you get a lot of space. But I managed to start my career by joining the Royal Marines, which is a sociable branch of the Navy. Do you miss the travelling? asked Flory. Yes and no, replied Dean. I do miss exploring new countries, but now I'm exploring in and around Bournemouth. I love the new forest. Cranbourne Chase, the Emily squealed loudly. So predictable. Dean, Cheryl and Flory looked towards the games table. Let me guess, started Cheryl. Abdul won, finished Emily. We're going to... well, it's going to happen. He's blocked off so much of the board. I think we should get a head start next game. Sure, said Abdul. That's fine by me. Carl looked across at Dean. You doing okay? You getting interrogated over there? Dean gave a shrug. It's fine. We've got space for one more player, said Carl. And if you don't care about winning, you can go next to Abdul and just spend the whole game blocking him. Abdul stifled a smile. Dean stood up. Okay. He picked up his chair and moved over to the games table. Cheryl smiled. Trust a game to draw all the boys to the and Emily, interrupted Flurry. The boys and Emily, corrected Cheryl, to the same table. Flurry started chewing on a biscuit thoughtfully. What are you thinking about? asked Cheryl. Oh, nothing. Flurry pulled out her phone and tapped at it. Did I tell you already? I've had a short hair visiting my garden for a while. She showed the screen a little absent-mindedly to Cheryl. I've started going out and feeding her, but he seems a bit shy and awkward. You are the cat whisperer, said Cheryl. I'm sure she, or he'll, start to feel more at home. She, said Flurry, indicating towards the phone screen. And yes, I hope so. Carl and Dean were putting away the tables. Emily, Flurry and Abdul were tidying away the chairs. Cheryl appeared in the doorway pulling the clothes boxes back into the room. Thank you everyone for coming along, said Cheryl. If I can remind you all again that there is a community meeting on Thursday and I think we should all try to make it. It's approximately eight weeks until the planning committee meeting when a decision will be made. This is a chance for our voices to be heard. It's on Thursday here in the main hall, so I'll either see you on Thursday or next Tuesday. Bye everyone, said Emily as she headed out of the door. Carl, Abdul and Flory began heading for the door. Cheryl caught Carl's eye. Remember to tell Emily to wait for me if her mum doesn't turn up. Will do, said Carl, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for a great evening, everyone, said Flory. Good night, said Abdul. Dean walked over to the two boxes. He started to pick one up. He stopped and put it back down. So, there's a meeting on Thursday. You've not heard, said Cheryl. It's about Store Park. You know it extends a long way from this building, yes? It runs as far as the river, plus there's the woodland. They want to build over it. Build over it. He knelt down next to the boxes, starting to retrieve his original clothes. Is that allowed? I'm not sure. I agree it sounds odd. We're supposed to be finding out more on Thursday. I need to go and get changed. Is that okay? Of course, said Cheryl. I need to see the caretaker. Plus I have a couple of other jobs. So you've got a few minutes. She handed Dean a piece of paper. If you could quickly fill this in with your name, age and a rough idea of where you live. If I keep track of who comes, it helps me get funding to pay for the room hire. Dean took the piece of paper and looked at it. Sure, only I've not got an address, in case you hadn't guessed. That's fine. Cheryl handed Dean a pen. Just fill out the bits you want to. Perhaps write no fixed abode, as that actually helps me with getting funding. Thursday, the 9th of June. It was early evening. Cheryl was stood outside the entrance to Store Community Centre. She was watching as a figure walked towards her with a rucksack on its back. Good evening, Dean. 
Good evening, Cheryl. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm worried about the meeting, but pleased to see you, said Cheryl. There are still 15 minutes or so before it starts. Emily and Carl are in the hall already, saving a seat. I was wondering. I don't usually come to meetings. The boxes are in my assigned storage cupboard. Come with me and I'll sort you out. I just need a shower, said Dean. I think my clothes aren't too bad today. Plus, I don't want to have faff around after the meeting. A woman stood in front of a microphone on the stage at the front of the hall. Red velvet curtains hung behind the stage, with a white screen hanging in front of them. Approximately 40 people sat in the audience in rows of chairs with plenty of space to spare. There was a quiet babble of talking. Towards the back were Cheryl, Carl, Emily, Abdul, Dean and Dean's rucksack. No flurry, said Carl. One of her cats is ill, said Cheryl, so she can't make it. Did she rescue another one, asked Abdul. Not this week, explained Cheryl. I think it's Polly with an upset tummy again. Free pop thrum. The hall's PA system fizzed, popped and thrummed. The audience fell silent as eyes turned towards the stage. Thank you for coming. My name is Gitty Wright. The PA system amplified Gitty's voice across the hall. I work for the Planning and Buildings Department of BCP Council. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this meeting is part of the public consultation process relating to the planning permission application relating to Store Park. This includes the entirety of the park, running from the river to the road, including the riverbank itself and the woodland. However, it does not include this community centre. If we can dim the lights, please. Gitty raised her hand up to her eyes and peered towards the back of the hall. Emily whispered, Why doesn't it include the community centre? The community centre is on land owned by the council, explained Carl, so that's protected. But the park isn't, or at least it's kind of complicated. The lights dimmed and a new light projected from the back of the hall, over the heads of the audience, and struck the white screen behind Gitty. Gitty pressed her thumb down against something in her hand, and a map of Store Park filled the screen. She directed a red laser pointer towards the map. I've put this up for you to look at, while I explain a bit more about the process. As any of you that have applied for permission to build an extension or something similar will know, a planning like this, a meeting like this, is not usually necessary. However, the role of the Planning and Buildings Department is to do appropriate publicity based on the nature of each individual application. In this case, it is felt that a public presentation now and in four weeks' time is appropriate for an application of this size to create an appropriately thorough consultation process. Why is this even allowed? shouted someone loudly. Store Valley is a public park. In fact, said Kitty, the covenant for this land is more complicated than that. It is true that it is maintained by the local council, but it does not come under the auspices of the legislation relating to that which is known in common parlance as a public park. Store Park has been owned by a number of generations of the same family. The current owner has decided to apply for this planning permission. Thank you for your question, though, and I encourage you all to keep calling out, because that is what a meeting like this is for. Kitty pressed her thumb down again. The screen changed to show an artist's impression of a series of houses and small blocks of flats with people walking amongst them. Small grass areas and a scattering of mature trees. Abdul whispered, Funny how there's never any wish rubbish, and the grass is always immaculate in the imaginations of those who submit planning applications. Emily whispered slightly less quietly, It's a park, except apparently it isn't. Ugh. The lights came back on, and Gitty smiled. Thank you all for sitting through my presentation, and thank you for your questions. Remember, the second public meeting is in just over four weeks' time, on Saturday the 7th of July. And the planning committee meeting, where the decision is finally made, is in just under eight weeks' time, on Monday the 1st of August. Kitty paused and pointed towards a table at the back of the room with a man sat behind it. Over there is David Jones. He has asked me to invite you to go over and say hello. He is organising a Facebook group to coordinate local residents, and for those of you without Facebook, he is happy to keep you in contact with the group via email or over the phone. Carl frowned. At least David is happy, whispered Abdul. Cheryl quietly sighed. Dean looked around the hall. Santa on a unicorn, said Emily. Tuesday the 14th of June Power of Us was in progress, with bags lined up by the door, and the chairs and tables pushed against the walls. Cheryl, Carl, Abdul, Florian, and Dean stood in the centre of the room in a rough circle with Emily in the middle. Star Wars, called out Flory. Emily shook her head. She swooped silently around with her arms out to each side. It can't be, said Abdul. It has to be five words. The Flight of the Phoenix, called out Carl. 
Snakes on the plane, suggested Apple. No, that's four words, sorry. Emily shook her furiously. She raised her hands up to the top of her head. She poked one finger of each hand forwards to form two horns. Come on, encouraged Cheryl, we can get this. Suddenly Emily stopped. She looked towards the door. The others followed her gaze. Stood in the doorway were three men, looking casually into the room. Oh, sorry, said one of the men. We were looking for Gary. He started to turn round, and his eyes fell on Dean. Dino? Dino, what are you doing here? Dean frowned. Hi, Steve. This is a community group called Power of Us. Who's Gary? Steve moved ahead of the other two men, further into the room. He's a friend of a friend. He's got something. That's pretty weak, Sauce, said Dean, moving casually forwards so that Cheryl, Abdul, Emily, Florian, and Carl were behind him. Steve shrugged. One of the men behind Steve moved. Dean's eyes flicked to the moving man. One of the man's hands was reaching for a handbag. Oi, shouted Dean. Steve, the other two men, and a handbag started to disappear out of the door. My handbag, shouted Cheryl. Dean sunk into his knees and accelerated forwards. Steve, the two men, and the handbag disappeared through the door. The door began to close behind them. Dean reached out and pressed against the edge of the door, preventing it from closing. His feet skidded over the carpet, and his shoulder bounced against the door frame as he powered into the corridor. Abdul was following close behind. Dean slowed to a stop face to face with Steve, who was now holding Cheryl's handbag somewhat provocatively. The muscles in Steve's face tensed, and his jaws clenched. You never say much to the hostel. You're hardly even there. Is this where you hang out? Abdul watched from the doorway. Dean moved fractionally backwards, away from Steve. Steve moved forwards, more than compensating for Dean's backwards movement. Steve and Dean's faces drew close, barely millimetres apart. You trying to stop me, asked Steve. We both know life's not fair. I'm just taking. He waved Cheryl's handbag in the air. My fair share. Nothing's worth fighting over, said Dean, as he again moved fractionally backwards. Steve mirrored Dean's movement, moving forwards and shaving the distance between their faces down to even less millimetres. Who said anything about fighting? Abdul continued to watch from the doorway. Cheryl, Carl, Florian and Emily stood slightly further back, also watching. Dean spoke gently. It's fine. You can go. Trying, growled Steve, to tell me what to do. Suddenly, Dean was flying backwards. Dean crashed into the floor. Steve was closing on Dean, aiming a violent kick at his knee. Dean adjusted his legs. His knee moved so that the blow would strike higher up. Steve's foot made contact with Dean's thigh. Dean's whole body instantly spun on the floor, pivoting round his hips. He grabbed Steve's leg and began to stand up, carrying Steve's leg upwards and at an unforgiving angle. Both of Steve's feet rose off the ground. He twisted in the air, losing his grip of Cheryl's handbag. Dean rose powerfully. Steve tumbled in the air. Cheryl's handbag flew through the air. Dean disengaged. Moving with relaxed confidence towards the other two men, Steve thudded into the ground in an off-balance half-crouch, immediately balling one of his hands into a fist. Cheryl's handbag landed on the ground. The other two men started to run away down the corridor towards the main entrance. Dean turned towards Steve. Steve was moving towards Dean, his fist swinging towards Dean's face. Dean moved fast towards the incoming blow and his hands flicked out, striking hard and precisely against the side of Steve's head. Steve went limp. His body fell floppily to the ground. Dean moved to pick up Cheryl's bag. Steve was now lying prone on the ground, completely still. Footsteps were disappearing into the distance. A piece of carpet was slowly rolling back into position after having been scuffed up in the air. From the doorway came Abdul, who looked up and down the corridor. Dean placed a hand gently on Abdul's chest and gave him Cheryl's handbag. Could you look after this for me? Abdul took the bag and nodded. The... started Flory. She stopped talking. Is he alright? asked Cheryl. Dean crouched down next to Steve and nudged him. He slapped his face and frowned. I think... I, I didn't mean to. Dean moved Steve so that he was on his side with his head angled slightly downwards, with his mouth open. Can someone phone for an ambulance? Two tables were pushed together in the centre of the room. Dean, Flory, Cheryl, Abdul, Carl and Emily were sat round them, and a male and a female police officer were stood next to the two empty chairs. The female officer was speaking. I'm sorry that we had to further disrupt your evening with all these questions. That's all right, said Cheryl. Do you know your way out? Yes, thank you, replied the female officer. The officers headed for the door. 
What an evening, said Flory, with a glance towards Dean. As the officers left, a woman with manicured hair, smart clothes, and a reassuring smile appeared just inside the door. Hello, I'm looking for someone called Dino. Cheryl looked at Dean. Dean shrugged slightly. That's me, said Dean, although my name is actually Dean. Hello, Dean. My name is Morgan. I'm a reporter with the Bournemouth Times. We're always looking for positive news stories, and I was hoping you could tell me a bit about how you heroically stopped a robber from stealing a handbag. Hello, Morgan, said Emily. Morgan looked at Emily and smiled. Do you have some kind of identification, asked Cheryl, to show that you are a reporter? Morgan moved towards the table and pulled out a card, holding it out for everyone to see. Have you heard about Steve, asked Cheryl. Will he be all right? I've been told that he is fine. No harm done. Morgan looked at Dean. It would just be a few quick questions. Well, Dean started to stand up. He sat down again. I suppose that, yes, I could ask her a few questions if you like. And, Morgan sat down on a spare chair. We could take a couple of photographs as well. I will obviously mention the community centre. I can mention your group as well. Tuesday, the 21st of June. Dean was walking across the car park with his rucksack on his back, approaching the entrance to the community centre. Standing outside were Cheryl, Emily, Abdul and Carl. Good evening, Dean, said Cheryl. I'm really pleased you decided to come along tonight, despite everything that's happened in the last week. Dean slowed to a stop and joined the group. He looked at Emily. How to train your dragon? Yes, squealed Emily. How did you work it out? It was the horns, replied Dean. He appeared at the entrance to the community centre. Why are the doors locked? Oh, said Cheryl. Haven't you heard? I thought... She reached into her handbag and pulled out a slip of paper. First things first, here's my phone number. I'm giving it out to everyone so we can stay in contact as a group. She handed it to Dean. Carl nodded. And just because the community centre is closed, that doesn't mean we can't still be friends and be there for each other. Carl smiled at Dean. Dean took out his iPhone and scanned in Cheryl's details. That's a fancy phone, said Emily. Can you afford it when you're homeless? Dean laughed. When you're homeless, it's almost impossible to operate without one. Imagine not being able to access email or video messaging or online forms. He resumed peering at the door. So what's up with the community centre? They've temporarily closed it, said Cheryl. Haven't you seen the local news? Dean shook his head. To be honest, I was embarrassed by the whole thing, so I went away for the week. Away, asked Emily. Where did you go? Hiking in the new forest. But how? Emily looked quizzically at Dean. Do you have enough money to go on holiday? Dean laughed. I need to teach you about homeless people. For starters, it doesn't necessarily mean you're poor. And even if you are, we have a bit of a homeless folk network to help each other out. For example, we share good spots in the countryside where you can camp without being disturbed. He paused. Although, actually, I was camping at one of my secret spots. And, it being June, I had to avoid disturbing nesting night jars. Isn't that illegal? asked Abdul. I mean camping in the new forest away from the official campsites. It's essentially impossible, said Dean, to be homeless and not break the law. I just try to be responsible when people don't seem to mind. Did you see any night jars? asked Emily. Dean nodded. I watched a pair on their nest, from a distance, obviously. Incredible, said Emily. Cheryl motioned to get moving. I've got Flory's number, so we don't need to wait for her. Let's get going. She led the way across the car park, away from the community centre, and the others followed. Where are we going, asked Dean. Until the community centre reopens, explained Cheryl, we're going to run power of us at my flat. Emily adjusted her pace so that she was walking next to Dean. Who's Gary? Gary? asked Dean. The robber last week asked for Gary, clarified Emily. Oh, that, said Dean. Gary is imaginary. It's a standard trick. A potential thief walks confidently into a room, and if no one is there, they steal some stuff. If someone is in there, they simply claim they were looking for someone. They just make up a name, and then, when this imaginary person isn't in said room, they leave. Clever, said Abdul. I think, said Dean, that me being in the room threw them off a bit, made them go off plan. I know Steve, Steve from one of the homeless shelters, and, as you witnessed, he's mad as a box of frogs. My flat's this way, said Cheryl, as she indicated for everyone to keep following. Cheryl turned a key in a lock and opened a door. Welcome to my flat. They entered a living room with a table and six chairs in the centre, a simple open plan kitchen to the right and two sofas and a television to the left. Opposite was a second door. My partner John is in, but he'll be keeping out of the way. Cheryl indicated towards two boxes on the floor. Dean, I retrieved these before the community centre was closed. She indicated towards the door opposite. And through there, first on the right, is a bathroom with a shower. Thank you. 
Dean put his rucksack down and took a set of incongruous clothes and a towel from the box. We'll wait for Flory and then we can start, said Cheryl. The table and some of the chairs had been moved to the side of the living room, leaving a clear space in the middle. Cheryl was sat on a chair, with the others facing her in a semicircle. Abdul, Emily, Flory and Dean were sat on the floor, and Carl was sat on a chair. Cheryl looked up from a piece of paper. Many years ago, before drones or phones or planes or trains or computers or commuters, there were travelling entertainers who would go to villages. These entertainers might narrate stories, tell jokes, play music, sing songs, tell fortunes, organise games or perform impressive feats. One particular entertainer liked to challenge her audience. She would always start with a joke about a man with one hand. Within the audience, some would laugh, some would cry, and some would fall silent. For this joke was able to be funny, or sad, or inspiring, or melancholy, depending on who heard it, and when they heard it. She would then tell the joke about the man with one hand again. And then she would tell it again. And then again. And again. Again. With each telling, reactions would change. Some would stop laughing and start to cry. Others would stop crying and start to laugh. Others would get bored and start to heckle. Finally, she would look at her audience and ask simply, How about I just tell every joke once from now on? Cheryl closed her hands together. Is that it? asked Emily. <sighs> Abdul sighed as he reached his hand up to his forehead. I think it's about, or actually I'm not sure. I like it, said Flurry. Everyone stood up. Carl and Abdul began moving the table back into the centre of the room. Dean and Emily started moving chairs. Cheryl and Flory headed for the kitchen area. So, said Flory, do we know why the community centre had to close? Cheryl looked at Flory. You never were one for reading the news, were you? What news? asked Dean. Carl laughed awkwardly and glanced briefly at Dean. It was, started Emily. The community centre, interrupted Cheryl, was getting old. They've been threatening to close it for a while. Really, said Abdul. My theory is that it's something to do with the attempt to get planning permission for the park. Dean pulled out his phone and started tapping at the screen. He navigated to a news site and tapped on an article. He began to read. And this is what he was reading. Two thugs disturbed the peace in community centre. Dean, are you all right? Steve and Dino, two regulars at the King Street Homeless Shelter, were involved in... Dean! Dean! The suitability of Store Community Centre as a modern and safe facility has again been brought into question. Are you alright? The decision has been made to close the community centre until a solution can be found. Do you want to play a game today? You can choose. Dean looked up from his phone. He opened his mouth as if to speak. Five faces were watching, worrying, waiting. Dean closed his mouth. Dean, said Carl, do you want to play a game today? You can choose. Dean looked back down at his phone, his eyes drawn to one of the words on the screen. The word being thugs. Dean, Dean. Dean looked back up. This. Crinkle, crinkle. Flurry was fiddling with a packet of biscuits. Emily started to move towards Dean. Dean, said Cheryl, I don't think it's your fault. Emily reached out to touch Dean's arm. Didn't you know? Dean gently avoided Emily's hand. The physical prowess he had shown the week before, manifesting this time as a casual ability to avoid human contact. He moved towards the door and picked up his rucksack. He opened the door. He paused. I... There was silence. Yes, Dean, said Flory. He walked out the door, closing it a little more forcefully than was necessary. Saturday the 25th of June At this particular spot, the river stour had reeds spread across its whole width. The water was swashing its way through the reed stems, carrying eddies with it as it then broke free. The banks were full of life with long grass, willow trees and lush plants. Stretching away from the river on both sides were fields set to pasture with, to one side, a flock of sheep grazing in the distance. Dean sat by the river, his rucksack on the grass beside him. He was looking through a pair of binoculars at a branch overhanging the river. On the branch was a metallic blue kingfisher perched and staring into the water. Suddenly the kingfisher flew downwards, transformed into a blur of orange and blue. He followed the motion with his binoculars. 
As it lanced through the air, the kingfisher adjusted its aim and dived into the water. Circular waves spread outwards, marking where the kingfisher had disappeared beneath the surface. Flashing wings burst upwards. Water splashed outwards. The kingfisher was rising into the air. It flew up and away down the river, droplets of water arcing through the air in its wake. He lowered his binoculars. He took a deep breath. He pulled his phone out of his pocket. He rolled it over slowly in his hand. A reluctant thumb touched the green call button on the screen and the phone lifted to his ear. Good morning. Cheryl speaking. How can I help you? He sat in silence. Hello, said Cheryl. Dean spoke quietly. It's, it's me, Dean. I'm sorry. Dean, it's lovely to hear from you. Are you all right? I'm sorry about walking off and taking your clothes, and I've left my smelly ones behind. I know that's not the deal. I'm not even thinking about that, Dean. And you're welcome to come to my flat and have a shower and get a fresh set of clothes whenever you like. I've washed the ones you left behind. Five of us know what really happened. And all the people who read that nonsense in the newspaper have probably already forgotten about it. Dean shook his head. But I'm to blame for the community centre closing down. Oh, Dean, I don't think you are. I saw the newspaper article. One, said Cheryl. The people to blame for the community centre closing down were the people in the council who allowed it to fall apart in the first place. Two, that newspaper article was a lie, and we both know it. It is true that the community centre attracts people like you. Specifically, it attracts caring people who will try everything they can to avoid a fight, and then, when forced to fight, will give first aid to the person who attacked them. Tell that to Morgan. She says I'm a thug. Cheryl sighed. We both know that's not true. Just because you're in the army, that doesn't make you a thug. I, I, I know, Dean sighed, obviously, and the opposite is actually true. The Royal Marines trained me to be a killer, but they also taught me to be respectful, to use that training appropriately. I mean, otherwise the country would be full of people being killed by retired Marines, but he took a deep breath. Anyway, maybe you're right, but still people will have read this. I mean, people obviously... Not not everyone reads the Bournemouth Times, but some people do. Dean, I've got a challenge for you. Ready? Yes. What was big in the news exactly a year ago? Nice nice try, said Dean, but that doesn't mean I won't remember once you tell me. It was about Store Square. Now can you remember what happened? I, Dean paused, no. Someone stole a bench and tried to sell it on eBay. OK, I remember now. And, said Cheryl, the final part of the challenge is to name who stole it. I have literally no idea. Fine. You win. Hmm. Cheryl hmmed, extending it so it became a simple reassuring noise. That doesn't invalidate what you're feeling. And even if you later remember the name, you don't believe everything you read in the newspaper anyway, right? I mean, obviously it's not that simple, but basically the memorable part of the story of the co is the community centre and not you. And even if it was, well, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Not, not really. <laughs> but you're helping. Thank you. Look, I need to come back anyway. I mean, that I'd like to, if that's okay. I was going to do a nice long walk along the Store Valley Way, but I left my money behind in my trousers, and I've run out of food. I'm kind of hungry. Can can I come over and collect my stuff? How about you come over at seven? Thank you, said Dean. Perfect. And I'd like you to stay for dinner. Deal? I don't want to impose, and, well, you saved my handbag from being so stolen, said Cheryl. This is the least I can do. So, dinner at seven. Then, okay, yes, thank you. Can I turn up early and have a shower? Turn up whenever you like. You have a standing invitation both to visit any time of the day or night if you want a shower or food, and to call at any time of the day or night if you want to talk. John and I are looking forward to seeing you later. Thank you, said Dean. Saturday the 25th of June, evening. Cheryl opened the door to her flat. Good evening, Dean. Do come in. Good evening, Cheryl. Dean walked in and put down his rucksack. Cheryl indicated towards the box of clothes. You're welcome to change back into your own clothes or keep the ones you're wearing. I think I'll go back to my own clothes. He stifled a laugh. Thank you, though. Cheryl laughed with him. The clothes in the box are a little unusual. I'm thinking of fixing that at some point. Can I? Dean indicated towards the bathroom. Of course. Dean returned to the living room, wearing his own clothes. They were clean and ironed. Cheryl was in the open plan kitchen, gently generating clacking and scraping noises. A man in his late forties, wearing jeans and a loose-fitting shirt, was stood by the table, laying out knives, forks and plates. 
Hi Dean, we've not met yet. My name's John, Cheryl's partner. Dean walked forwards and offered his hand. John accepted and they shook hands. I left, said Dean, the towel and the clothes in the bathroom. I hope that's okay. Of course, said Cheryl from the kitchen. Now sit down, you're the guest tonight. Dean hesitated. John offered Dean a chair. Here Dean, sit down and be a good guest. Dean sat down. Cheryl brought over a small plate with two sandwiches and some apple slices. Are you still hungry? I'm... Dean looked down at the plate. I'll take that as a yes, said Cheryl. This is your starter so that when we actually have dinner, you can take your time and enjoy it a bit more. She headed back towards the kitchen. Thank you. Dean picked up a sandwich and took a massive bite. I have a question, said Cheryl. When we were talking on the phone, you said Store Valley Way. Did you mean Stour Valley Way? Yes, said Dean. I meant Stour Valley Way. I think I've read too many history books and the two names get conflated in my head. John sat down at the table. So, Cheryl tells me you were in the army. Yes, replied Dean. I was a marine. Then I changed roles and became a vehicle engineer. I thought that was really difficult to do, said John. Change roles, I mean. It can be, said Dean, through a mouthful of apple. But I was persistent, and after about three years I passed the entry test and got a transfer. Nice, said John. Did Cheryl tell you I run a garage? It's just a little one down the road. I get just enough regular customers from the streets around here that without doing any advertising or anything like that, uh, it's fine. It's mostly MOTs and services. It's nice and sociable. Dean was on to us the second sandwich. Cheryl appeared at the table, holding a serving bowl in each hand. That was quick, Dean. Dean put the remainder of the second sandwich into his mouth. He gave Cheryl a thumbs up. John quickly moved a couple of mats into position at the centre of the table, and Cheryl put the bowls down. The bowls had identical contexts. Contents. A decorative layer of steamed vegetables with risotto peeking through from underneath. Cheryl picked up a plate and started to scoop vegetables and rice onto it. How is this looking? Cheryl looked at Dean. Enough for you? Dean looked at John. Guess first, said John. Then yes, replied Dean. Thank you. Cheryl handed the plate to Dean. There'll be plenty more later if you're still hungry. She picked up a second plate and started loading it up. So Dean, did you make it far along the stour before you realised you'd left your money behind? Roughly as far as Blanford Forum, replied Dean. Then I realised and turned round. Ish. All the way along the butterflies and dragonflies were out in force. It was a hungry but nice walk. So you like wildlife? asked John. Cheryl filled out a plate in front of John. She started serving up the third and final plate. I do, replied Dean. Is that why you travel? asked Cheryl. Dean nodded. Kind of. I read a book about wildlife watching once. It said there are two types of wildlife watcher. Those who stay in one place and enjoy seeing the changes between the days, months, seasons and years, and those who like to travel and compare nature in different places. But I suppose everyone is really a combination of the two, suggested John. Dean nodded. For sure, it's obviously a sliding scale if you avoid the hyperbole of making everything a competition. But I'm definitely towards the travelling end of the scale. Although, Dean paused, probably it's more that I also like to travel, or at least I feel like when I'm travelling I've the space to be me. Do you regret it? asked Cheryl, joining the army, I mean. I get the impression you like travelling, but is that the best reason to join up? The Royal Marines that I initially joined are part of the Navy, not the Army. But no, I don't regret it. Some of our deployments felt really worthwhile. Often the people we helped were really grateful. It's not as simple as you read in the news. On the ground it's complicated, and I'd say most people, including the soldiers and the people who live in the war zone, just want the war to be over so they can get on with their lives. I often found the locals' appreciation as being there and the fact we were helping, or trying to help, bring the war to an end, but still it's, it's complicated. Perhaps we should give Dean a break, said John. They began to eat in companionable silence. Dean slowed the rate at which he was eating and looked around the room. Cheryl stole a glance towards John and smiled. John smiled back. Dean looked at Cheryl. I'm intrigued by Power of Us. I'd be interested to hear, to hear about why and when you started it. That's assuming you're the one to start it. That I was, said Cheryl. Then why? My answer to that question changes over time, but ultimately I think it's because I wanted to create a space for people to be both themselves and also meet others. Initially, said John, Cheryl had to work incredibly hard at it. If you ask me, there's a crazy amount of paperwork that's needed to run a community group. And then the first week, only one person turned up, and that one person was me. Wow, said, G, said Dean. But I told John not to come again, said Cheryl. I knew it wasn't really his thing, and I realised that it had to stand or fall on its own. I didn't want to force it. I like to let things evolve naturally. The number of people coming, asked Dean, has it increased over time? Actually, no, said Cheryl. I've spoken to other people that organise social groups. It does vary. 
But a lot of groups seem to settle into a typical group size for their given activity. A chess club, for example, can have unlimited numbers because everyone separates into pairs. Power of Us seems to have settled into being the size of a small friendship group, which is not what I originally intended, but it's fine. We've had the same regulars for a while, and it's become one of the highlights of my week, and the others seem to enjoy it too. It's as though we've become a group of friends who just happen to have a structured way of meeting. That sounds good, said Dean. Cheryl smiled and took another mouthful of food. Dean was looking down at his plate, absent-mindedly moving the small amount of food that remained around. Dean, said Cheryl, you look like you're thinking about something. Dean didn't look up, but he did stop moving the food around. How about you take your time, said Cheryl lightly. When you're ready, tell us what's up. Only Dean, this time maybe don't go for a walk all the way to Blanford Forum and back first. Dean looked at Cheryl. Do you want me to keep coming to Power of Us? Keep coming, repeated Cheryl. If, said Dean, you're a group of friends, do you really want new people, especially given what's just happened? I've been thinking anyway that maybe it's best if I stop coming. Oh, Dean, said Cheryl, we've talked about this already, and I'm happy to talk about it again as many times as you need, but understand my opinion won't change. The newspaper thing is a non-issue as far as I'm concerned, and regarding new people, well, I can usually tell immediately if someone will keep coming, and if not, Emily is my bellwether. And anyway, with you, I was sure you'd be back. Dean frowned. Sorry, said Cheryl. Maybe that wasn't very clear. I mean, yes, of course we want you to keep coming. We were all worried about you after you left. They've all been phoning and messaging me to check for news since Tuesday. Multiple times a day, said John. In the case of, he stopped as Cheryl looked at him. Dean looked into the serving bowls. Perhaps I could have a bit more? Cheryl smiled. Only if you promise to come on Tuesday. I, Dean stumbled for words. I'm sorry. Cheryl spoke quickly and apologetically. I meant that in fun. Our friendship has no strings and no expectations. If you come along on Tuesday, that's fantastic. And I know everyone will be delighted to see you. And if you don't, that's fine too. And on a completely unrelated issue, you can have as much to eat as you like. Tuesday the 28th of June. Cheryl opened the door to her flat and saw Dean stood outside. Good evening, Dean. She moved to allow him in. Good evening, Cheryl. He walked in and took off his rucksack. He looked at the box of clothes. Can I? Of course, and I've put hand wash liquid by the sink if you want to wash your clothes and put them on the radiator to dry. And, she indicates towards the spot on the floor next to the wall, I've already got a charger here so that you can plug in your phone and your reading thingy. Wow, said Dean, thank you. The door into the living room from the direction of the bathroom opened. Dean entered wearing a green, blue and black outfit. Flurry, Emily, Carl and Abdul watched him walk in. You're still a hero to me, shouted Emily, as she ran up to Dean and gave him a hug. Dean patted Emily lightly on the top of her head. Good evening, Emily. He looked at everyone else. Good evening, everyone. Evening, Dean. Hi. Good to see you, Dean. Emily stepped away. Dean momentarily seemed to have something in his eye. Cheryl motioned with her hand, indicating for everyone to form a circle in the middle of the room. Everyone was sat in a semicircle facing Cheryl, who was looking up from her handwritten notes. A dancer is training. He is soon to be performing a solo dance routine to music at a competition. He has a teacher with whom he is taking regular private lessons. Teacher, says the student one day, sometimes I am balanced when I finish the final spin at the end. However, sometimes I'm off balance. I sort of disguise it when it goes wrong by lowering my knees, but I think the judges will notice. It will pass, replies the teacher. At the next training session, the student turns up to see a dozen or so people waiting along with the teacher. He walks in, and everyone claps and cheers. Today you are to dance in a pretend competition, explains the teacher. You will be performing in five minutes. Wait, what? says the student. Four minutes and fifty seconds, says the teacher. The student begins warming up. Everyone else, apart from the teacher, takes a chair and forms a curved line looking towards the performance area. The teacher stands waiting. As the five minutes come to an end, the teacher reaches for a switch that dims the lights. Music starts to play. The student moves into the performance area and begins to dance. The small audience woo and wow and gasp as the student dances. As the music reaches a crescendo, the student makes a final spin. His knees lock and he falls over. The crowd still cheers. But there is a taste of disappointment in the air. The dozen or so people stand up and leave. The teacher and the student are left alone to begin the lesson. At the end of the lesson, the student speaks to his teacher. Teacher, now I'm off balance every time I finish the routine. It will pass, replies the teacher. On the evening before the competition, the student is on his own. 
he is dancing on a suitable area of concrete outside his house, undertaking a final practice of the routine. As he reaches the end of the routine, he thinks of all the times the spin has worked, and all the times it hasn't. As he comes out of the final spin, he finds himself perfectly poised. He has never felt this perfect before. With this moment of excitement still echoing in his mind, the student finds his phone and calls his teacher. It worked! I feel so confident now. I think I needed the full experience of the fake competition you set me to really understand and properly learn what to do. Now that I am again close to the time of the performance, all the learning has come together. Thank you. It will pass, replies the teacher. Abdul put his head in his hands. Flory started to clap. Emily and Carl briefly joined in. I think, said Abdul, that we should call our group Power of Zen, not Power of Us. And I guess you had to change the writing style for that, as we had to know what the dancer was thinking. Cheryl smiled and headed for the kitchen, with Flory following close behind. Carl walked over to his bag, which had a board game called Carcasson propped against it. Dean, Emily and Abdul started moving the table and chairs. So, said Abdul, is everyone coming to the meeting on Saturday? I thought the second public meeting wasn't for another week, said Carl. They've pushed it forward, explained Abdul. They're going to have some kind of big announcement. And the community centre is magically open again, just for this meeting. Emily looked at Abdul. Perhaps they're not going to try to get planning permission after all? Perhaps they've listened to everyone? That would be nice, said Flory. As she put a plate of biscuits and a mug on the repositioned table, she sat down on a repositioned chair. Cheryl sat down next to Flory. Everyone please help yourself to drinks from the kitchen. Carl headed for the kitchen. I've not had any emails from David Jones. Is anyone in the actual Facebook thing? I'm a member of the Facebook group, said Abdul. A few people have been posting messages of support. Some people have written out letters explaining why the park should be saved. Is someone reading them, asked Emily. You mean from the planning department, clarified Abdul. I don't think so. Some people don't seem to understand how Facebook works. It doesn't magically mean the people you write to actually see it. Perhaps they're just trying to sound like they care, said Carl, as he returned to sit at the table. They might just be virtue signalling. Emily frowned. Are Kitty and David actually going to listen? Should we do something? Maybe, said Carl. But I think we should wait and see what's announced on Saturday. Flory looks at Dean and smiled. So, Dean, what have you been up to recently? Dean saw everyone looking at him. Well, I went exploring up the Stour Valley Way for a few days. It's a great time of year for butterflies and dragonflies. For me, the dragonflies are the novelty, as they're specialists in that kind of habitat. One morning, I saw a stand of reeds with almost 50 adult dragonflies emerging. That sounds amazing, said Carl. Do you always go there, or do you have other favourite spots? I like to go to the New Forest as well, replied Dean, and the Purbex, although it's a tad more awkward to get to. So, said Emily, we're going to this meeting, yes? I think so, said Cheryl. Everyone nodded. Carl, Abdul, Flory and Emily were packing up their bags and getting ready to leave. Cheryl was straightening the chairs under the table. Dean was headed for the bathroom. Wait a moment, said Emily. She ran up behind Dean. Dean stopped and turned round. I need your email address, said Emily, and I need your phone number. I want to send you something. She handed Dean a piece of paper and a pen. Dean started writing. And what are you planning to send me? He handed back the pen and paper. It's a surprise, said Emily. She turned round and headed back towards the others. Dean, said Carl as he walked over. Yes, said Dean. Take these. Carl handed Dean a small pile of tickets. They're foot passenger tickets with a chain ferry across the Isle of Purbank, which you probably already know. They've been sat in my wallet for months, and I'd rather they got used. You, you sure, said Dean. Of course, said Carl. Dean accepted the tickets. Thank you. Thursday the 30th of June Dean sat on a tusk of grass at the edge of a marshy pond on Hartland Moor. His rucksack was leaning on another tussock of grass. All around were lush plants with many in flower, some within the grass and some within the pond. Brown, blue and white butterflies were flying through the air, feeding on the flowers, basking on the ground. A small powerful bird of prey with scythe-shaped wings was swooping fast over the marsh, chasing dragonflies. Beyond the moor, fields lined with hedgerows, stands of pine trees and rolling hills. Dean held his phone up in the air. Pling, pling. He lowered his phone and looked at his screen. There was a message from Cheryl. You can come over to mine before the Saturday meeting, if you want to have a shower. Just arrive an hour or so before the meeting is due to start. Cheryl, kiss. He tapped at the screen and wrote a reply. That sounds great. Thank you, Cheryl, from Dean. He continued to look at the screen. 
There was another message from an unknown number. This is Emily. I brought you a copy of No Wrong Turns. It's about someone who goes cycling around the world. I thought you might like it. He smiled and tapped at the screen. Hello, Emily. Thank you very much for the unexpected present. I'm looking forward to reading it from Dean. He put his phone in his pocket and reached for the rucksack. He fished around inside and pulled out his Kindle. Saturday, the 2nd of July. Kitty Wright stood in front of the microphone on the stage at the front of the main hall at Store Community Centre. Approximately 30 people were sat in the audience producing a low hum of talking. Sat towards the back were Cheryl, Emily, Abdul, Dean, Carl and Flory with Dean's rucksack nearby on an empty chair. Emily looked across at Dean. Did you read the book yet? I just started it last night, replied Dean. I'm enjoying it so far. Thank you again. Flory looked at Emily. When did you give him the book? I sent it to his email address, explained Emily. Oh, very modern, said Cheryl. I'm impressed. Squirr, thrum, pop, pop. The hall's PA system squacked, thrummed, popped and fell silent. The eyes of the audience fell on the stage. Kitty looked out over the hall. Thank you for coming this second time and at such short notice. As many of you know, my name is Kitty Wright. I work for the Planning and Buildings Department of BCP Council. The second meeting was supposed to be next Saturday and that is still going ahead. However, this will now be the third meeting. Today's additional emergency meeting is part of my department's commitment to offering appropriate publicity of plans and related developments in a timely manner, judged on a case-by-case -case basis. She paused and looked down at a stack of pieces of paper that she was holding in her hands. Abdul whispered, Council Communication Drone 53K1 functionality confirmed. I'll start by quickly recapping what was covered last time, continued Gitty. A planning application has been submitted for conversion of the park to housing, with significant elements of the park retained in amongst the houses and the small blocks of flats. A second planning application has now been made, which is going to be considered at the same time at the same planning committee meeting. This new application is regarding a new build replacement for this community centre, offering an immediate solution to the problems we are currently having. The, someone called out from the audience, how come the community centre is suddenly open again? Can't the council make up his mind? Or is it only open when it suits you? And what gives you the right down to, what gives you the right to tear down this historical building? shouted someone else. The Kissy stopped and took a breath. I understand your concerns, but it was felt that due to the need to make the planning process fair, the venue of the already arranged public meeting should not be changed. She paused. While it is true that this is a grade two listed building, however we, the local planning authority, can give permission for the demolition of a building like this if it is in the greater interest of the local community. Meaning and nothing is decided yet. That is why we have this process. She paused. And so to continue. This additional planning permission is for the construction of a new community centre at a different location in the park. The full details are in all the usual places, including at our offices, on our website, and additionally, I have brought some paper copies with me. She held up the pieces of paper she was holding and indicated with them towards a table to the side of the hall. I'm going to put these on the table. There's more than enough for everyone to have a copy if they wish. And you can see David Jones, who many of you have already met, as he is running the Facebook group, is there next to the table. He has offered to cover some issues that have cropped up within the group. That is actually all I have to say today, although I'm going to be around for a couple more minutes or longer if necessary if you have any questions. For the rest of the evening, I'll leave you in the capable hands of David. David walked away from the table, heading in the direction of the stage. Gitty moved off the stage, heading in the direction of the table. Five people from the audience stood up and followed Gitty. Everyone else remained seated. David approached the microphone. Thank you everyone for coming today. My name is David Jones. Many of you already know me from the last meeting or from the Save Store Park Facebook page. Abdul whispered. Or don't know me because I'm useless at sending emails. Gitty put the pieces of paper down on the table. Three of the people who had followed Gitty picked up some pieces of paper and headed back to their seats as the other two people began quietly talking with Gitty. The planning permission for the community centre, continued David, is in fact related to the housing application. It is for a new community centre to be built from scratch that will give another 50 years of maintenance-free shared community space for the store community. This will be finished first before the housing, housing which of course includes subsidised housing for key workers, David paused. The two people who had been talking to Gitty headed back towards their seats. Gitty headed for the door. This new community centre will be fully funded by the builders, continued David. The permission to build the housing would then be dependent on the builders completing the community centre first, a standard timing condition that more complex developments often have. 
Ultimately, this means that our store community gets a guarantee of a completely new community centre at no cost. Personally, I'm going to support both the planning applications, as I think that together they offer a unique opportunity. He pointed towards the table. The rest of this session is a chance for us to talk among ourselves and look at the new plans. I don't think there's enough of us to justify using this microphone, so let's be a bit more informal. Some of you might like to convene at the table, others of you might like to form your own small discussion groups. David stepped off the stage and, along with about half of the audience, he walked towards the table. Cheryl stood up and headed for the table. Abdul, Carl, Dean, Florian, and Emily followed. Dean had his rucksack in his hand. No cost, said Abdul as he walked. It means apart from the minor cost of not having a park anymore. Kitty said that the park would still be there, said Florrie, mixed in with the houses. I fear G Gitty may have been exaggerating a tad, said Carl. Emily overtook the others and began squeezing through a scrum of bodies to close in on the table. Cheryl, Abdul, Carl, Dean and Florrie stopped and waited. Emily retreated back out of the scrum. Here, she held up a piece of paper that showed an artist's impression of the new community centre. It looks really nice, said Carl. I'll give them that. Can we look at the floor plan? Emily held up another piece of paper. Carl leaned forwards and took a closer look. Yep. It's... Abdul scratched his nose. It looks a bit small. Cheryl pointed towards the bottom of the page. It says here, the new community centre will have a 50% improvement in activity-specific provision. That sounds uh, good. Excuse me, everyone. Excuse me, everyone. David has his hand up in the air. The hall fell quiet and almost everyone turned to look at David. I'm getting asked a lot of the same questions, said David, so I think we should do some of them as a room. Alec? A man cleared his throat and those standing closest to him stepped away slightly. I was asking David if there would still be a room suitable for the tennis table club. I mean the table tennis club. Thank you, Alex, said David. Absolutely there will be. Every club that was running before the community centre was shut down will have space in the new community centre that is purposefully tailored to their needs. Abdul whispered. The word club is a bit vague. What about the heating? called out someone else. David nodded. Good question. There will be underfloor heating throughout the building with individual thermostatic controls in each room. And, unlike in the existing community centre, it will be a brand new system that will be easy to maintain. Carl sighed quietly. Dean looked at Carl and raised his eyebrows. I think, said Carl, this is kind of a waste of time. David, asked Emily loudly, how does planning permission work? Do we all get to say what we want at the final meeting? Of course we do, said David. Personally, I'm recommending that we should say yes. Someone else had their hand in the air. David, could you tell us if they've considered using solar panels on the roof? Cheryl looked at Emily, Carl, Abdul, Florian, and Dean. She mouthed the words, shall we go? They began heading for the door. As Dean walked, he lifted his ever-present rucksack onto his back. So, said Emily, this meeting was just to tell us stuff. Technically, no, said Abdul. I think they're also making themselves available for community feedback. Carl chuckled. I've kind of got to go, said Abdul. I've got a study exchange booked. And I'm supposed to be seeing someone about a cat, said Florrie. Then we'll see each other again on Tuesday, said Cheryl. Sunday, the 3rd of July. Store Park was bathed in the light of early morning. In the river, fish swam against the current, holding their position relative to the bank. In the woodland, a grey squirrel leapt from the ground into a beech tree. On the river, a coot appeared from below the surface, with green waterweed hanging from its bill. In the woodland, a human figure moved at a low crouch beneath the trees. In a tiny clearing within the woodland, Dean lay in a sleeping bag next to his rucksack. He opened his eyes and slowly lifted his head. His gaze fell on a grey squirrel scampering along the branch of a beech tree. Dean muttered to himself, So it's you making that noise. The squirrel froze. It looked beyond the trees, in the direction of the community centre, where a dog was running around on the grass. I suppose I ought to be getting up. Dean started wriggling free of his sleeping bag. The squirrel turned, leapt and danced acrobatically out of sight. Dean's feet emerged from his sleeping bag. He pulled a stuff sack from under some rolled up clothes he had been using as a pillow. He started to push the sleeping bag into the stuff sack. Suddenly he froze and looked around. Surrounding him were the sounds of the woodland, the fluttering of leaves, the rootling of small animals in the undergrowth, the occasional puck of something falling to the ground from a tree, a scrunching of leaves that almost resembled the sound of footsteps. Dean shrugged and finished squishing his sleeping bag into the stuff sack. He put it into his rucksack along with the improvised pillow. He lifted his rucksack onto his back.
He began scuffing his feet along the ground where he had been lying. The leaves and twigs roughened up, obscuring the flattened imprint that recalled his prone body. Dean stopped. He started to turn around. Shh! came a whispered voice. There's a gold crest near you. Dean finished turning round. He mouthed the words, Hello, Emily. Emily was stood in a low crouch nearby. She was wearing subdued coloured clothing, along with her camouflage backpack. A shoulder bag hung to her side. A pair of binoculars hung round her neck. She was aiming a camera at a pine tree. Dean looked where Emily was aiming the camera. A tiny grey and green bird, with a bright yellow line on the top of its head, was hovering below a cluster of pine needles. It darted left, darted up, darted right, landed on a thin branch. It began to walk along the branch, pecking occasionally at the bark. Click! Emily put the camera in her shoulder bag. Dean whispered, What are you doing? A survey. Someone's got to do something. About... Oh, right, you... Dean paused. Can I help? Today I'm doing a bird survey, and writing down other things, too. And the camera? It will be a report, explained Emily. I'm going to show it to the planning committee meeting. Every photo is tagged with GPS coordinates, date and time. It's what scientists do when they do surveys. Wow, a room full of people and shh, Emily pointed upwards. Great spotty woodpecker. She took her camera out of her shoulder bag and began aiming it into the canopy. Dean very quietly started to take off his rucksack. Click. Emily returned her camera to the bag and pulled out a small notebook and pencil. She wrote something down. Dean retrieved his binoculars from his rucksack and put them round his neck. Tell me how to help. Help me look for birds. The better the report, the better. Emily began walking and Dean followed. A sharp, short bird call came from the undergrowth to the right. Emily and Dean slowed and stopped. Bird contact note, whispered Emily. Dean nodded and slowly raised his hand not too far from his body. He was pointing into the undergrowth. A tiny brown bird was perched on a fallen tree trunk with its slim tail pointed upwards. Click. Wren, whispered Emily. Can you see anything else? She began to scan with the binoculars. Dean looked beyond the wren, a black bird with a yellow bill, digging into a pile of leaves. Male blackbird, but you've already seen that, yes? Emily lowered her binoculars and followed Dean's gaze. Yes, but I'm writing down every sighting to show how common different species are. She raised her binoculars to look towards the blackbird. So, a second bird appeared, the same size and shape, but brown instead of black. That's two blackbirds, finished Emily, one male and one female. I'll add them to the list. How many different species have you seen so far? Did you start today? I started this morning at dawn, eight including the wren, but I've only walked through the woodland so far. Emily indicated onwards. Come on. Emily and Dean stood in some shade at the edge of the woodland with the river nearby. Away from the river lay the grass, flower beds and scattered trees of the rest of Store Park. People were jogging, walking and doing exercises. Dogs were walking, running, sniffing, greeting other dogs and chasing balls. A man was sat on a bench reading a newspaper. Cure, cure, cure. A loud call came from the top of the clock tower. You need to photograph the peregrine falcons, yes? asked Dean. Then we're up to 18, or is it 19 species? You've got photographic evidence for, I mean. Yes, if you... Emily suddenly raised her camera. The blue and grey falcon burst from the tower. It dipped slightly as it accelerated away in a smooth arc. Click. Got it, said Emily. I never tire of seeing them. That makes 19. 19, repeated Dean. He pointed towards the river. Plus little egret. Emily aimed her camera towards the river. Click. 20. Emily looked at Dean. We need to look for butterflies on the bramble. If we wait too long, they might be too active. Lead the way. They began heading away from the river, aiming a little to the side of the community centre. Underfoot were green and yellow blades of grass. Small white, yellow, red and blue wildflowers. Scraps of colourful, plain, metallic or sun-bleached litter. A forgotten ball. Do you often come here bird-watching? asked Dean. I sometimes come after school. If it's been an annoying day, it's good. How about you? I sleep here once a month or so, and of course, I always do a bit of bird watching when I do. I think this is one of the best parks in Bournemouth, for birds that is. I'd say equally as good as Turbury Park or Talbot Heath, except with the added bonus of the river. Are you actually allowed to sleep here? asked Emily. I'm not sure. I don't think so. It's very complicated. It would be strange to make homelessness illegal, but remember what I said before. It's essentially impossible to be homeless and not break the law. The system has assumptions built into it, such as the idea that everyone has a permanent home. I've got desensitised to it all by now, including the fact that I'm essentially breaking the law simply by existing. That doesn't seem very fair. No, said Dean. But the way I think about it is, well, no one is deliberately trying to make the system unfair. Making laws is complicated, and they just forget about some of the edge cases. And I'm an edge case. Have you ever been arrested? The police are usually friendly. 
Although jobs were worth once find me for eating outside in a particular area, despite the fact I don't have a home to go to to eat inside of. But in reality, I almost never see a police officer. Maybe once every couple of years someone calls them to report me. I find that if I avoid cold sacks and industrial estates with CCTV cameras, then basically I'm invisible. Emily looked up at Dean as they walked past the play park. So, Dean, the edge case. Do you like being homeless? It sounds like fun to sleep in different places and see nature. It is fun sometimes. I don't want to suggest that you aspire to it. It's difficult to wash. If it's raining, it's pretty grim. And it can be dangerous. Dean grimaced slightly. Some homeless people have addiction or mental health issues, so you have to be careful. They might mean well, but they can behave erratically, which, of course, you saw a couple of weeks ago. A police officer came to the school once. She said that anyone could be dangerous, and that if anyone makes you feel scared or worried, you should just find someone else, someone you have a good feeling about, and ask for... She stopped, and started to peer towards an area of bramble close to some trees. Here... I find this standard bramble is good for butterflies. She raised her binoculars to look towards a small, fluttering form. Red Admiral. She lowered her binoculars and reached into her shoulder bag. Come on. How about we separate for a bit? Dean pointed towards a pair of white butterflies. There's plenty to survey, and we can do more that way. Sure. Emily decisively angled off towards a brown butterfly. Dean headed towards the white butterflies. As he did so, he pulled his phone out of his pocket and tapped at the screen. You need the GPS enabled on your phone, said Emily. Emily and Dean stood together. Camera and phone were aimed at different butterflies feeding from different bramble flowers. A couple of metres away, a low metal pole barrier lay between the park and the road. On the opposite side of the road was a cafe, with chairs and tables arrayed inside and outside. The cafe was busy, with people eating and drinking, and a sign above it read store munchies. Click, Emily lured her camera. Green-veined white. Chack. Dean lowered his phone. Small tortoise shell. Emily wrote in her notebook. That's seven butterfly species. Great. Emily indicated towards the cafe. I've got some money for lunch. Do you want to share? I've got my own money. But yes, I'd like to join you. And anyway, we need to work out how to transfer my butterfly photographs to you. You can just message them. It's not difficult. But, said Dean, you need the GPS and the timestamps too. That's what I mean. It's easy. Okay, but you need to show me. Dean and Emily crossed the road to the cafe. They stopped next to an A-frame blackboard that declared in chalky script, Please wait here to be seated. The woman appeared, wearing an orange and white checked apron and carrying a wooden clipboard. She smiled. Hello, Dean. Hello, Emily. Hello, Maria. Hello, Maria. Maria looked at Emily. Is your phone on? It's on silent, replied Emily. I was birdwatching. You'll find, said Maria, a few messages from your mum when you look at it. Dean frowned and looked at Emily. Yeah, how come you're... Because it's important, said Emily. Someone has to do something. About what? asked Maria. We're doing a survey of the wildlife in the park. Maria looked at Dean. We? Dean half nodded and half shrugged. You know about the planning permission for building over the park, yes? Of course, said Maria. So does that mean you're trying to do something about it? I'm making a report to share at the planning meeting, explained Emily. Maria nodded. Very good. But Emily, your mum's been worried. She messaged me earlier and I said I could see you in the park with Dean and I could vouch for him and I'd keep a watchful eye on you. It's fine, said Emily. Is everything okay? Dean looked at Maria and Emily. I didn't think. Sorry. It's fine, said Emily. Hmm, said Maria. Well, you're right, and that's the important thing. If you'd like to come with me. Maria led the way to one of the outdoor tables. First, said Maria, what would you like to drink? Tap water, please, said Dean as he sat down. I think. Maria tapped the clipboard casually against her legs as she looked thoughtfully towards the park. She looked back at Emily and Dean. I think you're worrying about the price. There is literally no way either of you are paying for your lunch. Or is it breakfast? She looked at Dean. Well, you can have both if you like. And Dean, you're not having leftovers this time, so pick whatever you like. But first drinks. She looked at Emily. Emily, I'll get you an apple juice, yes? Emily nodded. Maria looked at Dean. Dean? I genuinely like a tap water, please, replied Dean. Then tap water it is. Maria smiled and walked away. Emily looked at Dean. Why do you think she doesn't want us to pay? Perhaps she likes the sound of what you're doing, said Dean. We're doing, corrected Emily. Monday, the 4th of July. Dean sat cross-legged on the ground next to his rucksack outside a Tesco Express. A piece of cardboard was in front of him. Written on it in black marker pen were the words, I'm doing okay, but a few pennies would help. Thank you. People were walking along the pavement, and one man was approaching Dean. Morning. The man leant down and put a couple of coins on the cardboard. How are you? I'm good, thanks, replied Dean. And you? Good, thanks. 
The man continued onwards as Dean took the money and put it in his pocket. Dean. Dean looked up. Flory! He quickly started to stand up. Flory looked down at the cardboard sign. I'd not realised you'd do this. Well, Dean finished standing up. It's not exactly the thing I'm most proud of in my life. I... So, said Flory, is it? It's complicated, said Dean. I'm freegan. I sleep out most nights, so I don't need much. And if I did need to, I'd... But I do this once a week-ish for a couple of hours. Dean paused and took a breath. There are some things you can't find in the reduced section at Tesco, like my Kindle Unlimited subscription that's due this week. Freegan. It means you eat food that shops and restaurants throw away. It's a more portmanteau, combining free and vegan. Flory nodded. Interesting. She put her hand in her pocket and pulled out her purse. Then suddenly she started to fumble it. Oops, can you hold, sorry, this? Dean's hand flashed forward. He found himself holding a banknote. Oopsie, said Flory. How did that happen? If the lady at the cafe can give you a present, then so can I. How? started Dean. That's to pay for your Kindle Unlimited subscription. Flory pulled out a tiny notepad and started to write something down. Flory, you really don't have to. Dean offered the banknote back to Flory. I have emergency money, but I prefer to keep something in reserve. Flory stopped writing and ripped a page out of the notepad. And if, Flory offered her hand forwards to accept the banknote back. Dean started to return the banknote. Suddenly, Flory placed the piece of paper in the air above Dean's hand, let go and stepped back. Dean found himself holding a banknote and a piece of paper. Now you have my phone number. Flory's hand was poised, ready to write in a notepad again. Now what's yours? Monday, the 4th of July, afternoon. A wooden sign at the end of a footpath read Branksome Chine. The footpath wound its way through a small wooded valley towards the sea. Dean was part way along the footpath, sat on a bench with his rucksack off to the side. He was watching a family of blackbirds foraging beneath an oak tree. One of the juveniles, in mottled brown plumage, lost its grip on a worm, which shot back into a hole in the ground. Pling! Dean took his phone out of his pocket and tapped at the screen. It was a message from Flory. Hi Dean, would you like to come over for dinner before Power of Us tomorrow? I'd like you to tell me all about your Kindle as I'm thinking of buying one. F. Kiss. Dean tapped at the screen. Hi Flory, that would be nice, thank you. Happy to help. What time? Where? From Dean. Tuesday the 5th of July Dean angled his rucksack out of the way as he closed a rickety picket gate. A short path through an overgrown front garden led to the front door of a two-up, two-down terraced house. He knocked on the door. Footsteps approached from within. One moment, called out Flurry. I need to stop the cats from running out. There was a whooshing fabric sound. The handle turned with a click and the door opened to reveal Flurry's smiling face. Hello Dean, it's great to see you. Come on in. Thank you. Dean stepped inside. Flurry, Dean and his rucksack squished tightly into a small space. They were surrounded by a tall curtain and the rest of the house was hidden from view. Dean leant out of the way as Flory closed the door. It looks, said Dean, much larger from the outside. Flory giggled. She pulled the curtain aside to reveal the rest of the house. The front room had two sofas covered with multitudinous coloured throws that were themselves covered in five cats who were looking towards Dean and Flory. The floor had a crimson carpet with fluffy toy mice, ping pong balls, crinkly bits of foil and strips of ribbon scattered around. The table was pressed up against the wall with Abdul sat in front of a laptop. He was wearing chunky headphones and surrounding him were books and pieces of paper. A cat was sleeping on Abdul's lap. At the far end of the room a flight of stairs led upwards. Beyond the stairs were hints of a cluttered kitchen with bowls of cat food and water on the floor. Why the curtain? asked Dean. It's a cat lock. It means that when I open the front door the cats can't run out into the road. Thump, thump. Two cats suddenly appeared at the bottom of the stairs and stared at Dean. Dean looked back at them. The two cats lurched towards each other in a bizarre dance. One of them skip-jumped up the stairs and disappeared out of sight. The other followed. Dean started to look down at his boots. Abdul turned towards the front door and lifted his headphones away from one ear. Hi, Dean. Dean looked back up. Hi, Abdul. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Sorry I can't talk. I'm in the middle of a complicated bit of maths. Abdul put his headphones back over his ear and resumed working. Dean looked at Flory. Boots off or on? This is a shoes on, boots on house. Flory started walking towards the kitchen. So just make yourself at home. Abdul's been coming over quite a bit since the community centre closed, so he can work in peace, because he can't use the study room there anymore. So that's why he's here, in case you were wondering. Dean stood off his rucksack, propping it against the wall. He followed Flory. 
Three cats appeared as if from nowhere and started investigating the straps, flaps, clips, pockets and belt of Dean's rucksack. Flory disappeared into the kitchen. Dean looked at Abdul as he walked. What about the cats? Abdul sat obliviously, writing out a long equation on a piece of paper. Oh, said Flory from the direction of the kitchen. The cats love him, and Bubbles now sits on his lap whenever he's working. It's very sweet. Abdul seems to be a natural with them. I mean, don't they disturb him? He says it's still much better than at home, and now the community centre is closed, he needs a new quiet study area. I'm just glad I can help. Dean enters the kitchen. On the ground spread an obstacle course of food bowls, water bowls, litter trays, and a continuation of the cat toy collection from the front room. The worktops were busy with typical kitchen detritus, but no open food. Along the tops of the cupboards were tins of cat food, boxes of cat biscuits, and bags of cat litter. Outside, beyond the kitchen window and door, lay an overgrown garden which ran back for approximately 25 metres. A cat looked up from one of the water bowls, looked at Dean, looked at Flory, and ran out through one of the two cat flaps in the door that led to the garden. A second cat silently dropped off the worktop onto the floor and sauntered casually towards the front room. Sorry about this. Flory picked up a couple of empty food bowls from the floor. I hope you don't mind. No, it's fine. Flory smiled. Do you like rice and vegetables? That sounds nice, thank you. Flory put a saucepan on a clearish patch of worktop. My rule is, the cats have the floor, the tops of the cupboards are for cat food storage, and the worktop is for humans. The cat jumped up onto the worktop, its upward movement segueing into a sideways movement headed for the saucepan. Flory picked the cat up and put it back on the ground, but they are quite forgetful about the rules sometimes. The cat poised to jump up again. Dean swept down and picked it up. This miscreant is Tickles 3, said Flory. She likes to be tickled, and she's the third one I've given the name to, so, well, anyway, that's her name. Dean adjusted Tickles 3 in his arms and tickled her under the chin. Can I help? Oh, you're helping already. Do you want a drink? No thanks, but I've got a question if you don't mind. You can ask me anything, said Flory. Why do you have so many cats? I mean, obviously you do, and it's great that you look after them, but is there a particular reason? My house is basically a rescue centre. Flory measured out some rice and put it in the saucepan. It started with just a couple of strays, and, well, I really enjoy it now. Sometimes a new cat just turns up, but many people know about me and bring strays to be looked after. Sometimes they don't want to be rescued and just disappear. Sometimes they stay, sometimes they stay-ish. Wow, no wonder you have so many. Flory took some items of food from the fridge. With practice speed, she was building a collection of vegetables, cooking utensils and a chopping board on the worktop. I'm constantly finding them new homes. I interview every potential owner and also make sure the cat likes the new house. If things work out, then the cat has a new safe home and a human family has a new feline friend. At the moment, I've got 16-ish living here. Sounds better than buying a new cat from a shop. I mean, how do we even start calling them new cats? They have to come from somewhere. What about all the cats that don't have homes? I agree. Do you ever rescue a cat that turns out to already have a home? Tickles 3 looked up at Dean from where she lay relaxed in his arms. Sometimes, I have a chip scanner to check every new arrival and then, depending on what it says, I either pop over to the vets so the cat can have a checkup, or I contact the registry to trace the owners. That sounds very organised. I'm impressed. Flory started chopping some beans. So I want to hear more about your travelling. What's your favourite country that you've ever been to? Easy. England. You can't quite beat home. OK, apart from England. Dean looked thoughtful. Well, for sure, Canada and Norway have amazing scenery that seems to go on forever. But for me, there's something special about France. It has everything. Mountains, farmland, historic towns, quaint villages, baguettes, pastries. Tickles three stretched a paw upwards. Dean gave the top of her paw a gentle stroke. What about you? asked Dean. I've not travelled much, but I'd like to. Though I don't like flying. Flory threw a handful of chopped vegetables in the saucepan. Dinner should be ready in about half an hour. I need to concentrate on cooking for a bit. You can go and relax in the front room. If you're looking for something to do, the cats love being brushed. I'm sure Tickles three would happily go first. Flory nodded towards a brush that was hanging from a hook on the wall. Transformed from being Abdul's study area, the table now had Flory, Abdul and Dean sat at it eating from rounded bowls. In the centre of the table were two large serving bowls covered in pictures of cats. One serving bowl had rice and the other a creamy curry. Various cats were mainly ignoring the table of food, although a couple were directing regular lustful glances towards it. Dean finished a mouthful. So Abdul, how's the maths? Mathsy, said Abdul. I was doing mechanics, working out whether a series of objects would move or not. For one of them, I had to make three different equations, what with there being three different unknowns. Flory laughed. 
It's lucky you're only using my table and chair, not also asking me to help. It just needs patience, explained Abdul. You just have to stick to the basics, write down the information provided, and it all works itself out. I'm sure you're underselling yourself, said Dean. I think you have to find your natural talent as well. Then work hard on the right things. Sound like, sounds like you've done that. Florrie smiled. Tell Dean what you want to do when you finish school. I'd like to work for SpaceX, said Abdul. But unfortunately you have to be American to work for them. Why is that, asked Dean. The United States are protective of certain forms of technology, explained Abdul. And the ability to reliably project objects high into the sky is so considered. But I hope to find something similar. And there are cutting-edge technology companies popping up all over the place. Flory looked at Dean. What did you want to be when you left school? I didn't really have a plan, said Dean. I found everything interesting, and so that didn't help narrow things down. And I had an idea about travelling the world. I think I did the right thing. Perhaps, therefore, interrupted Abdul, travel suits you because it's a chance to discover or learn about lots of different things. Possibly, said Dean, but although it has let me do that, there are downsides to travelling. Florrie was watching Dean and smiling. A cat was slinking across the floor at an angle to the table, an angle that was steadily bringing the cat and the table into closer proximity. Casually it glanced upwards as it approached within jumping distance of the table. Florrie coughed. The cat changed direction, heading off towards the kitchen. Dean sat up straighter and made a satisfied noise. That was delicious, thank you. Florrie indicated towards the two serving bowls. There's plenty more, help yourself. Dean reached for a serving spoon. Abdul looked at Florrie and at Dean. Have you heard any more news about the planning applications? Dean shook his head. Florrie shook her head. Oh, I hope we come up with something later, said Abdul. It would be a shame to lose the park and the community centre. I mean, I know we're getting a new community centre, but I like the old one. And well, if it means losing the park. And I'm not convinced by the plans for the new one. There's something off about them. And anyway, I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think that's really what I mean. So the developers seem keen to present it as such. I bumped into Emily on Sunday, said Dean. She was doing a wildlife survey in the park, and I ended up helping her. She wants to present it to the planning committee meeting. It sounds... Actually, I'll let her tell you about it later. I don't steal her thunder. Tuesday the 5th of July, later in the evening. Cheryl was on a chair, looking down at some handwritten notes. Dean, Carl, Emily, Abdul and Flurry sat facing her in a semicircle. Cheryl looked up from her notes. A father and mother and daughter and son are travelling through the mountains. Each is riding a horse, and the mother is leading another horse laden with bags. The mountains are jagged and desolate, with vast streaks of stone and rock scree painting the sides of the mountains grey. As they turn a corner past a particularly tumbly rockfall, they suddenly encounter a man with a long grey beard who is sitting cross-legged on a flat rock. Fine day to you travellers, declares the grey-bearded man. If I may, he uncrosses his legs and comes down from the rock. To pass, each of you must first tell me, whither are you going? The grey-bearded man looks at the father and indicates that he should explain first. The father explains, we are headed for a pass through the mountains. We are to build a new home on some land on the other side. The grey-bearded man indicates towards the mother. The mother explains, on the other side the land is said to be beautiful and the waters are said to be curing. I hope to heal my daughter of a malady that she has carried for two years now. The grey-bearded man indicates towards the daughter. The daughter explains, I travel because my mother loves me and she makes me feel safe. The grey-bearded man indicates towards the son. The son shrugs, I travel because my father told me to. Suddenly bursting round the corner comes an emaciated mare ridden by a particularly gaunt man wearing a red silk shirt and blue breeches. Wait, cries the grey-bearded man. As the horse and rider power onwards, so the grey-bearded man raises his hand. Suddenly the horse bearing the man in red and blue is hovering above the ground, with her hooves pouring ineffectually at the air. Whither are you going? asks the grey-bearded man. What business is it of yours? asks the man in red and blue. It is simply my place, replies the grey-bearded man. If you wish to be released to continue your journey, you need to simply explain. Then, replies the man in red and blue, you should be asking my horse, for she has been galloping for two weeks now, and I know not where she goes. Carl and Emily laughed. Florrie and Dean joined in. Emily looked puzzled. Then why is he still on the horse? Cheryl stood up and walked towards the kitchen. Everyone else started to stand, Kyle giving a glance towards the bags, but not heading that way. So, said Abdul, it's the planning committee meeting in four weeks. Kyle, Dean and Florrie moved the table away from the wall, Abdul and Emily began moving chairs. Any more news from the Facebook group? asked Kyle. 
A few things, replied Abdul. They've been sharing details about the new build community centre. David has been passing on questions and getting answers. For example, some of the community groups have had funding arranged for new equipment once the community centre opens, which perhaps you knew already. Hmm, murmured Carl, as they finished repositioning the table and chairs. Cheryl returned from the kitchen, and everyone sat round the table. Emily looked at Abdul. Does everyone on the Facebook group like the plans for the new community centre? Not everyone, said Abdul. There have been a few arguments, but my judgement is that the majority seem to like being involved planning the new one, and getting funding for new things for their clubs. What about the park? asked Dean. Are people talking about that? Abdul looked round the table. Is no one else on Facebook? Cheryl, Carl and Dean shook their heads. I'm too young, explained Emily. I'm on it, said Flory, but only so I can be a member of a local cat protection group. I don't read anything else. And I don't write anything because I've forgotten how to. At least not without making the caption to a photo. Mind you, I've had my account frozen for a few weeks for suspicious activity, so I can't do anything anyway. What were you doing? asked Cheryl incredulously. Flory shrugged. Nothing. Nothing is likely the reason, said Abdul. Most people check their feed and post stuff. If you don't, your account is flagged as suspicious. Not being addicted to scrolling is to be not considered as human these days. Abdul, said Emily, you were going to tell us more about the park. Sorry, said Abdul. So yes, the park is being talked about on Facebook. In response, the plans have even been changed, so that the river frontage is retained as public land. Two houses have been removed from the application. Carl muttered sarcastically. What a bunch of community heroes. The others turned to look at Carl. Sorry, said Carl. Did I say that out loud? What do you mean? asked Emily. Carl sighed. What I mean is that you don't just submit a planning application and expect to get it all. Anyway, not in a situation like this. I'm guessing they were always intending to remove that from their application if asked. You know, said Flory, I've been thinking. Can't we just renovate the old community centre? It's a nice building. I've been thinking the same, said Carl. I reviewed the plans for the new one, and I'm not impressed. Do you remember their activity provision statistic? Well, I did my own maths. The new community centre will be smaller. I mean, you can mess with the numbers however you like, but the fact is that it will be smaller. Which wasn't exactly the headline of their announcement in the hall, was it? I... How about... Carl looked at Cheryl. Are we going to the public meeting on Saturday? Abdul leant back in his chair and looked knowingly at Emily. Perhaps it's time to jump off the horse. You mean, said Dean, don't go to the meeting. Exactly, said Abdul. But we have to go to the last one, said Emily, with something resembling a huff and a sigh. Don't we? That's when they make the decision. Santa on a unicorn, this is so ridiculous. I agree it's ridiculous, said Abdul, and I only meant we missed the one this Saturday, not the last one. And why is Santa on a unicorn, by the way? Carl nodded in agreement and looked at Emily. Emily crossed her arms and sighed. Perhaps, suggested Flory, we could have our own meeting on Saturday. How about we meet at Bournemouth Central Library, said Carl. On Saturday, uh, they've got loads of useful resources, plus they've got plenty of tables so we could spread out on one, and remember we're allowed to talk quietly, we could do some planning of our own. Saturday then? Cheryl looked round the table. Until then, we can all try to think of ideas and start doing our own research, if we want. I think trying to talk it through now is tempting, but... She looked round the table. What do we think? I've not got Saturday school this week, said Emily, so I'm free. I'm free, said Abdul. Dean nodded. Saturday suits me, said Flory. In that case, said Carl, with a glance towards the bags. Board game, anyone? Friday, the 8th of July. Dean sat by the river at Iford, approximately six kilometres downriver from Store Park. A little egret stood on a rock, moving its head slowly as it looked into the water. Dean had a pencil and paper in his hand, and his binoculars round his neck. His rucksack lay on the ground nearby. Pling! Dean reached for his phone. It was a message from Flory. Would you like to come over for dinner tonight? I've still got some questions about how to use a Kindle and which one to buy. 7pm? Question mark. F. Kiss. Dean tapped at the screen. Hi, Flory. Yes, please. I can't believe we forgot to talk about it last time. Also, we could talk through some ideas before the meeting tomorrow. From Dean. Friday, the 8th of July. Evening. Dean stood by Flory's front door with his rucksack on. He looked down to his side. A black and white cat sat on the path next to him, staring at the door. The door opened, and the cat became a blur of fur, streaking into the house. Poor Thumps disappeared into the distance. Simba, said Flory, and Dean. And of course, Dean, you can come in as well. Dean joined Flory in the already breached catlock. Flory closed the door and smiled at Dean. Dean smiled back and looked at the curtain. Flory pulled the curtain aside and headed into the room. 
Dean shuffled out of his rucksack and propped it against the wall. He knelt down and started to loosen the laces on one of his boots. Flory looked back. Don't worry about your boots. Keeping the floor clean is a lost cause with so many cats walking in and out all the time. Dean took off one boot, shifted his kneeling position and started untying the other one. I know, I remember you telling me last time, but I'd better not today. I've been exploring along the river and they're pretty muddy. Hi Dean, Abdul called out from where he was working at the table. Hi Abdul, replied Dean. Flory headed back towards Dean. She bent down next to him and whispered, Um, Dean? Dean looked at her. Flory had one hand pinching her nose and the other pointing down at Dean's unbooted foot. Dean looked down at his grubby sock. Oh, I'm sorry. I obviously washed before I came here, but feet are difficult. I... Dinner's not ready yet, said Flory. The bathroom is easy to find upstairs. You can use one of the towels from the top shelf. I don't want to intrude, said Dean. Then, smiled Flory, have a shower. That way your feet won't be intruding. Tickles Three appeared next to Dean. Hi, Tickles Three, said Dean. Missed you. Tickles Three sniffed Dean's exposed sock and rubbed up against it. Flory, Dean and Abdul were sat round the table eating. Five small serving bowls lay in the middle of the table with the remains of roasted vegetable salad, whole grain salad, cucumber salad, green leaf salad and hot rice salad. This was so nice, said Dean. Thank you, Flory. Yes, thank you, added Abdul. Flory beamed and looked around the room. So that's 18-ish hungry mouths I'm feeding this evening, or 19-ish including myself. She looked at Abdul. Tell Dean about your idea. My idea, Abdul nodded. So, at school, we just had grant funding for some new computers. I was thinking that perhaps we should try applying for a grant. A grant for what? asked Dean. Obviously, said Abdul. We don't want them to build a new community centre. Or at least not the slightly rubbish one they seem to be disguising as being really good. Because I followed up on what Carl said, and I agree completely with him. So anyway, I was thinking we should renovate the one we already have. Or at least demonstrate it can be done. We could combine its history and architecture with new technology, like underfloor heating. I mean, the existing building is a living connection between the past, present and future, and the heart of the community. Or at least that's what Gitty said in a council publication a couple of years ago before suddenly changing her tune. Then we have a non-zero sum game, making their offer of a new building moot. This is possible if we can get a grant. Flory looked at Dean. What do you think? It sounds good, said Dean. We just need to solve the park issue then. How's Emily doing? asked Flory. She never really said what she was up to on Tuesday. But I did sense she was very motivated, as usual. Well, I guess I can tell you a bit about it, said Dean. She started doing a wildlife survey of the park. She wants to use it to show why it shouldn't be built on. Will that actually work? asked Abdul. I don't know, said Dean. But she started on Sunday. She seems really serious about it. That's pretty amazing, said Flory. I've been helping her, said Dean. And that's why my boots are muddy. I've been surveying other bits of the river. I mean, Emily didn't ask me to do that, but I thought a comparison survey would help. Would it be useful if, asked Flory, I helped you? I don't know, said Dean. Emily's the one in charge. I'm simply in an assistant role. But I guess you could ask her tomorrow. Flory ran her gaze over the serving bowls. Keep going, you two. And we've got pudding later as well. Pudding, repeated Abdul, with what sounded like surprise. Dean knelt by Flory's front door, putting on his boots. You can stay over if you like, Flory indicated towards a sofa with five cats arrayed on it. For example, that sofa turns into a bed. That's very kind, replied Dean, but I'm used to sleeping outside, so I'll be fine. Okay, Flory paused. The offer's not going away. You can stay over whenever you like. Saturday the 9th of July Shelving stacks filled with books crisscrossed the vast open plan library. Intermingled were tables, book displays, computer stations, book trolleys and other library paraphernalia. Readers, researchers, students, browsers and librarians were sitting, standing and walking around. A low noise of pages flicking, computers humming, self-service machines beeping, people whispering and librarians helping filled the air. Amidst this subdued hive of activity, Kyle, Cheryl, Emily, Dean, Abdul and Flory were sat round a table. Dean's rucksack was under the table, out of the way. Last chance, said Kyle quietly, so we're definitely not going to the public meeting. It seems like a waste of time, said Emily. Flory and Dean nodded. I'm on board with going rogue, said Abdul, in which case, what's the plan? How about, suggested Kyle, we start by sharing what we've come up with since Tuesday, or before then as well, obviously. Abdul raised his hand part way. I was thinking we could apply for a grant to renovate the community centre. Florian nodded in agreement, and I was wondering if we could do some kind of fundraiser, like a raffle or something. Dean looked at Emily. 
Emily, do you want to explain what you've already been up to? The others looked at Emily. I'm doing a nature survey of the park, said Emily. I'm going to write a report and show it to the planning committee meeting. Perhaps then they'll decide not to build on it. Do you need any help with that? asked Laurie. It's okay, said Emily. Dean's already helping. And, added Dean, I've started doing mini surveys of other places in Bournemouth for comparison. That sounds good, said Emily. Cheryl looked at Emily and Dean. So not only are we having some excellent ideas, some of us have already started. Kyle looked around the table. I've had one idea. There might be some kind of a legal precedent related to exactly how the park is owned and its history of use that means the park can't be built on. Who are capital flight investments? asked Emily. Who? said Flory. They're the ones that are going to buy the land, explained Cheryl. I mean, presuming planning permission is obtained. They are the actual company who will be doing the building work, and so they are quietly helping with the application. The Bournemouth Times got a bit of a scoop on them, and that's how we know who they are and what they are willing to pay for the land. And, added Carl, I have independently verified the information. It's good. Sebastian Leveson Gower owns the park. Remember that the council have permissive use of the land as a park, but that's all. And once planning permission or rather both planning permissions have been obtained, well, then Sebastian sells the land to Capital Flight Investments and it's goodbye park. It's a weird name for a developer, said Abdul. It's more of an investment company, said Carl. They just do whatever they can to make money. We see a park, they see pound signs. I don't like the sound of them, said Emily. Carl stifled a laugh. Emily looked at Carl and shrugged. It's fine, said Carl. I was thinking the same thing. It's just the way you said it that made me laugh. Everyone looked towards Cheryl. Cheryl looked towards Carl. It's good or cool, I think. Then Kyle started to stand up. It's research time. Some of us have clearly got a specific focus already. The rest of us can help or look into our own things, but no rules. Research what you like. We can compare notes afterwards. Everyone was sat round the table. Arrayed across the table were books, leaflets, A4 files, pens, paper and two laptops. Abdul was talking. And so in terms of typical grant deadlines, this is very last minute. We've missed out on a lot of promising ones already, and it seems like most things are virtual now, with most of the grant books here in the library years out of date. Although that has helped me find a couple of obscure grants that aren't well publicised. This includes Abdul paused and looked round the table. Sorry, I seem to be launching into a lot of detail. Is that OK? Of course, said Carl. This is great. Keep going. Abdul continued. This includes, and you're going to like this, a special fund for urban parks in the south of England without a matched funding requirement. Matched funding requirement, repeated Dean. Abdul looked at Carl. Matched funding is a big thing these days, explained Carl. The idea is they'll give you half, for example, in which case you'd have to find the other half, but... Abdul took over excitedly. But not all grants. And really old grants often don't need any much funding at all. Like this one I found. This particular grant is bizarrely specific, but Carl said a lot of grants are, because they're often based on the particular interests of the wealthy person who set them up. And this grant is for purchasing an established park in the south of England that's been in use as such for at least 100 years. It pays for it to be gifted to the local council. It also pays for the running costs for the first five years. How easy is it to get? asked Cheryl. Yes, said Abdul, about that. Based on my calculations regarding how the grant works, the park's too valuable. Well, that's to say, it's complicated. Are you saying, asked Emily, that we need the park to be worth less money? Yes, confirmed Abdul. If it were less valuable, then we could potentially use this grant. Emily looked at Dean. As you already know, Emily and I have been doing the survey, and so we've been trying to learn a bit more about what exactly makes a survey good. And it seems that whatever wildlife we find, the developers can simply demonstrate how they intend to mitigate the damage, and therefore planning permission will still be granted anyway. Mitigate, asked Flory. It's a legal word, explained Dean. For example, if there are rare newts, they move the newts to a new place, and then that means the problem of the newts is mitigated. Emily growled. Apparently newts are a problem. Wait, said Abdul. So every rare animal or plant you find means they have to, Abdul looked at Emily and winced, mitigate, he winced again, the problem away. Emily growled, mitigate. Which, said Carl, as though thinking out loud, costs additional money, meaning the effective value of the land is reduced. Exactly, said Dean. That's what we worked out as well. We just weren't sure until now whether this was a good thing or not. Let me check, said Cheryl. More wildlife means more mitigation costs, means their profit is reduced, which means the value of the land is reduced, which means it might be within reach of the grant. I agree, said Carl. Everyone is correct, said Abdul. Pretty much howsoever you game this, it is a plus for us. And, said Emily, I found a rare fungi on Sunday as well. Dean nodded, as the others looked at Emily. 
Emily continued, because fungi aren't animals or plants, they're a totally different life form. Cheryl laughed. I think we've got the right person in charge of the wildlife survey. So, said Carl, clearly Emily needs to push on with the survey. Dean looked at Emily and gave her a thumbs up. Emily gave a thumbs up in reply. Oh, and, added Dean, I think my surveys of other places around Bournemouth are a waste of time. I mean, given we're trying to demonstrate high mitigation costs, so I'm stopping those. Carl held up his hand. I think we're doing well so far. Emily and Dean are doing the wildlife survey. Abdul and I are applying for a grant to buy the park for the council. And, by the way, I looked into the legal situation, and I don't think there's anything about the ownership or history of the park that prevents them from building on it. More thoughts? The grant, said Cheryl. Are you sure it doesn't need you to be a charity? It doesn't, replied Abdul. Remember, a stipulation of the grant is that the land is donated to the local council. No independent organisation is required. But what about the community centre? asked Florrie. Cheryl reached for one of the books on the table. She flicked to a page and turned it to show to the others. I found this grant. It's a capital investment grant for community infrastructure. The only catch is that we need to be some kind of non-profit organisation or charity to apply. I found a similar grant with the same catch, said Abdul, so I guess the charity thing is an issue. Can we just set up a charity? asked Flurry. Good idea, said Cheryl, but way, way too complicated, and effectively impossible in the time we have. I'm a member of Lonk Lodge, said Carl. It's a social club. Fundraising is a big part of what we do as well. We distribute the money to mainly local charities and organisations. I'll ask them about accepting the money on our behalf and holding it. And they are non-profit. Lonk Lodge, repeated Flurry. That sounds fancy. Do you have a special handshake or special names for each other? No, said Carl. Nothing like that. What if, asked Abdul, we collect the money and it doesn't work out? Do we need a contingency for that? Let's try not to think that way, said Carl. But if that does happen, then Long Lodge has systems in place and essentially all the money is returned to the people who made the donations and any that can't be so redistributed go to a mix of charities with various timescales and procedures. This seems too easy, questioned Dean. I mean... Could we really just solve the whole thing just by applying for a couple of grants? Am I missing something? Oh wait, you said matched funding, interrupted Abdul. Remember, there's a matched funding requirement for all the possible grants we found for the renovation of the community centre, added to which the possible grant for buying the park is capped too low, so there's still a lot of work to do. I'm starting to realise this is all interlinked, said Dean, and getting complicated. Getting complicated, Flory sighed. And what's match funding again? Suppose, explained Cheryl, that the repairs to the community centre cost £100, and suppose we have to raise 10% match funding. Then we'd have to raise £10 ourselves, and the grant would then pay the other £90. It's that simple. Well, basically, ish. Kyle nodded. And before you ask, you can't just match two grants against each other, at least not in this case. And the percentages vary wildly. Florrie put up her hand. So, I was reading about fundraising. She reached for two books and held them up to show the others. There are lots of options. We can do a sponsored walk, we can run a tabletop sale, we can have a coffee morning, we can also just ask people to donate. But, said Abdul, and I'm just clarifying, but it's going to cost way more than £100, isn't it? Yes, replied Cheryl. I was keeping the explanation simple. Emily was tapping her fingers thoughtfully on the table. So the important thing is the planning committee meeting, yes? How do you mean, asked Carl. Emily looked at Abdul. It doesn't matter what people say on the Facebook page. She looked at Carl. It doesn't matter what capital flight whatever want. She looked at Cheryl. If we go to the planning committee meeting and show them a better alternative, we win. You could say that, said Cheryl tentatively. Carl nodded. I'm with Emily on this as well. I think we would have a fairly strong case. Fairly strong, Abdul sighed. What about the fact that the developer is offering to pay for a supposedly fancy new community centre and bribing people with new equipment for their clubs? And I bet they have an expensive lawyer or two. I'm not sure you should repeat that in the meeting, said Carl. But again, I find it difficult to argue. And we have to be ready for them to argue they will generate local jobs, improve local housing provision, that kind of thing. Emily sighed. But, said Dean, if we find a way to save the whole park, then maybe we can trump their plan. Murmurs of agreement came from round the table. I'm sorry, said Dean, but I've got one more question. What if the council doesn't want to be given the park? I've been wondering that too, said Carl. And there might be other wrinkles. Things we've not thought of. But we've got four weeks to do our best. Abdul looked up from a book. I think I can answer the council question. There's an FAQ in this grant directory, which I'd already checked anyway. And the short story is that it should be fine in this case. Well, said Cheryl, I feel like we've already accomplished a lot. Kyle looked at the others. So I'm helping with the grant, with Abdul taking the lead, and Cheryl helping out as well. Abdul and Cheryl nodded in reply. And, said Dean, 
Emily and I will carry on with the survey. You go for it, Emily, said Flurry. Can I help too? No, thank you, replied Emily. Because it's a survey, it's better not to be a big group. The more wildlife we see, the better. OK, said Flurry. Cheryl looked at Flurry. Do you want to start working some more on the fundraising ideas? I can help you if you like. I think I'm very much the junior partner behind Abdul and Carl on the grants, so I can spread myself out a bit. Flurry smiled. Of course. Thanks, Cheryl. Sunday, the 10th of July. Dean and Emily sat within the open grassy area that lay between Store Community Centre and the river. Directly in front of them was a patch of long grass that had escaped the lawnmower. Dean's rucksack lay nearby. A notebook and a pencil lay between them. Within the grass were flowers with butterflies flying lazily in the cool, late afternoon air. I wish they left all the grass like this, said Emily. Imagine all the flowers and butterflies then. Dean was flicking through pages of flower illustrations in a book called Wild Flowers of Britain and Ireland by Marjorie Blamey, Richard Fitter and Alastair Fitter. I know, right? I suppose there has to be a compromise. He looked up from the book. Ribwork Plantain. Shall I add it to the list? Can you point to it again, asked Emily. In real life, not in the book. Dean leaned forwards. He moved aside some grass stems to reveal a rosette of long, ridged leaves. Emily aimed her camera towards it. Click. She leaned in for a closer look. It's got thin leaves, so I agree. You checked in Blamey for similar species, including at the end of the description. You have to do that too. I did, and all the other possible species have broad leaves. Then that's okay. I've been thinking. I hope we don't have to compromise at the planning committee meeting. If you keep compromising, the other person eventually wins. Dean laughed. I'm not sure that's quite right. I... What do you mean exactly? Well, normally you have to share things. Like if everyone gets to use the gold paint in turn. But you can't share a park. If you build houses over it, then that's not sharing. It's like using up all the gold paint. Dean raised his eyebrows. Fair point. And actually, I've got a theory about words like share, compromise, rude, respect, and so on. I think they're really useful generally. But when you're talking about a specific thing, then, interrupted Emily, it's better to talk about what's actually happening, not just use one word to win the argument. You're thinking about the meeting, aren't you? I'm right they'll use sneaky talking to get their way. Remember we've got Carl. I've got a suspicion he's going to be very useful when it comes to sneaky talking in the meeting. Dean picked up the notebook and pencil and started to write. But I'm developing a theory that you're pretty handy in a debate as well. Emily was following the path of a white butterfly with her camera. The butterfly slowed and settled on a yellow flower. Click! She lowered her camera and continued to watch the butterfly. Female orange tip. Very good. Dean put the notebook back on the ground and started peering at a small blue flower. It's interesting to see how the butterflies find the flowers, even in an isolated spot like this. I wonder if they can smell them. I mean, their eyesight isn't very good. Emily picked up the notebook and pencil. Fifteen species of butterfly and... She ran the pencil down a page. And approximately forty species of flower. I don't usually identify flowers this much. Dean points at the blue flower. I think this is Germanda Speedwell. What do you think? We have to check it in the book to make the report more reliable. Yes, ma'am. Pling. Dean reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. He tapped at the screen and started to read. It was a message from Flurry. I was wondering if you'd like to come over tomorrow. Perhaps you could have a look at my garden. One of the cats got caught in some bramble and cut his nose, so it really needs doing. I need someone to do it, and it would be nice if it were you. I'd pay you, obviously. F. Kiss. Dean put down his phone. He looked out over the park. Emily pointed at the blue flower. So will you look this up? Dean continued to look out over the park. Dean, said Emily. That was from Florrie, and I'm not sure what to do. She's asking me to come round tomorrow and do her garden for her. That sounds like fun. You can make it into a wildlife garden. Dean smiled. Normally I'd agree, but she has a lot of cats. I don't think it's ever going to be much of a wildlife garden. Oh, uh, OK. But it still sounds like fun. I know, but she wants to pay me. Is it a quick job, asked Emily. No, I think it might take a few days. OK, so... Emily paused. I don't really understand work, but we talked about it at school once. A few days counts as work, doesn't it? So then it's not fair to do it for free, and it's not fair to say no, so I think you have to let her pay you. Hmm, maybe. Plus, she already gave me some money a week ago. What for? It was a present, said Dean. Then compromise. Let her pay you, but minus what she gave you as a present. Well, I don't think that's how presents are supposed to work. But that's how compromises work, Dean laughed. Yes, said Emily. Now, will you look up this flower? Monday, the 11th of July. Dean was stood in front of Flory's front door. 
His hand reached out to knock. Suddenly, the door opened. Hello, Dean, said Flory. Good morning, replied Dean. Flory made space for Dean and his attendant rucksack in the catlock. He stepped inside. Flory closed the door and opened the catlock. She looked at Dean and waited. He took his rucksack off. So, shall I get started? If you like, replied Flory. But please make yourself at home. Do you have any tools? Dean moved out of the catlock and into the house. He indicated in the direction of the garden. Shall I have a look? OK. Flory overtook Dean and headed in the direction of the back garden. There's a shed and there might be some in there. Dean and six cats followed along behind. Flory opened the back door. The six cats bounded out into the garden. The shed is over there, inside all that ivy and bramble. Flory took a key from a shelf and handed it to Dean. And this is the key. Thank you. What do you want me to do? Whatever you like. I'm really not a gardener. I just get someone in once a year-ish to stop the neighbours from complaining. You sure? asked Dean. Of course. I'm going shopping in a bit. But Abdul's coming round to study if you need help finding things. And I'll be back in time for lunch. Just one thing before you go. Of course, Flory smiled. Do you have a garden waste bin? The woman, who usually does it, takes the rubbish away somewhere. OK, then I... Dean looked around the kitchen. Can I go and get something and come back in about half an hour? Flory retrieved a second key from the shelf. She gave the key to Dean and smiled. This is a key to the front door. Now you can come and go whenever you want to see me. Dean closed the gate and walked up to Flory's front door. He put down a large bundle and took the key from his pocket. He unlocked the door and started to gently open it. A paw emerged from the other side of the door. The door opening accelerated, the gap rapidly growing in size. Tickles three flew outwards and streaked past Dean. She leapt onto a section of garden wall, turning to stare willfully at Dean. Dean pulled the door, almost closed, and turned round. Tickles three, lovely to see you. Meow, replied Tickles three. Dean walked slowly towards Tickles three. Tickles three raised a paw and stretched it in a leisurely fashion towards Dean. Meow. Yes, that's right, said Dean, as he leaned in towards Tickles 3. You shouldn't be out the front. I'm obviously really pleased to see you, as I always am. But I'm going to have to pick you up, and... Tickles 3 dropped out of sight behind the wall. Dean looked over the wall. Oh, Tickles 3, please don't get me in trouble. Tickles 3 looked up at Dean and rolled over onto her back. Meow! Dean reached down and tickled her under the chin. With a gentle sliding motion, he reached his hand under her back and picked her up. Tickles three flopped in Dean's arms. She rubbed the sides of her face against Dean's arm. Dean headed towards the front door. The front door started to open. A paw appearing round the side of the door. A second paw appeared. Dean lowered his weight into his knees, powering towards the door. In a blur of fur, two cats burst from the house. Continuing towards the door, Dean allowed his weight to drop to one side, whilst guiding Tickles three into a one-arm hold. Dean's free arm reached forwards. The other two cats were disappearing from view. Another cat flew out of the gap. Dean grasped the door handle and started to close the door. Another paw appeared, ran the side of the door. Dean looked at the paw and hesitated. Tickles three explosively leapt out of Dean's arm. Dean let go of the door and lunged for Tickles three. She was flying and twisting through the air, escaping Dean's grasp. Dean was flailing and falling. The door was swinging. Another cat was bursting out of the house. Dean landed with a thump on his back. Fuh! <laughs> laughed someone from the direction of the gate. Dean leant onto his side and started to get up as he looked towards the gate. Abdul, help me. What happened? asked Abdul. Dean reached to the door and pulled it gently closed. Four, no five, I think. Cats escaped through the front door. Fuh! <laughs> Abdul laughed again. I have a feline that they've escaped for good. Seriously, Abdul, can you help please? I Look, there's one over there, Dean pointed. Sorry, Dean, about laughing. It's just... Flory understands that the cat lock doesn't really work if you're going back inside the house. And anyway, the cats can just use that. Abdul indicated towards a tunnel-like path two houses away. There's access to and from the rear garden through that. The cat lock is designed to make getting out a bit more awkward. She says it encourages them to develop territories away from the road. But it's not a major concern if they sometimes use the front door. Oh. No offence, Dean. I mean, you were deadly efficient with the robbers, but I'm guessing the marines didn't train you in. Abdul stifled a giggle. Hand to paw combat? Dean groaned loudly. What a perfectly hilarious joke. The table was set for lunch, with a plate of mini pastries and a plate of small round sandwiches already in position. Abdul was at the table, reading a textbook. 
Dean appeared from the kitchen and put down a plate of small triangular sandwiches and a plate of raw vegetable sticks, prompting Abdul to put away his book. Florrie appeared with three small bowls, decoratively arranged on a larger plate and a dish of strawberries. She added them to the table and sat down. Peanut dip, chickpea dip and cucumber dip and the strawberries were fresh from the greengrocer this morning and I would like to see them all eaten while they are at their best. Thank you, said Dean. Thanks, said Abdul. They both started helping themselves to food. That's all right, smiled Florrie. I like cooking for appreciative people. So I was wondering, said Dean. I was wondering why the cats don't pester us for food more. It's partly because I never ever feed them from the table, explained Florrie. That definitely helps. But it's also a bit of luck, because it varies from cat to cat how scavengy they are in different situations. I see, said Dean. And how's the garden going? asked Florrie. The garden's going well, said Dean. I found two bulk bags, the big bags that builders get gravel and sand delivered in, and I'm filling them up. You cutting everything back? asked Florrie. Don't worry, said Dean. I'm not cutting everything back. You've got a couple of nice slow growing bushes which I'm actually not going to touch at all while they recover a bit. Then there are some plants I'm taking out completely, like the brambles. This is a bonus, said Florrie. You sound like you know what you're doing. I used to have a summer job working for a gardener, explained Dean, and I've always been interested in plants and nature, obviously. Is that why you're helping Emily? asked Abdul. Yes, replied Dean, although it was also chance I just happened to be sleeping in the park when she did her first survey day, and chance we'd met at Power of Us. I've got a theory, said Abdul, that you have to find the things you like doing and do them. Then you'll meet the people who are similar to you. I think some people misdescribe it to fate, but really it's caused by convergence. Florrie looked at Abdul. How's the studying going this morning? Well, thanks, said Abdul. I've been learning about fundamental particles. They're pretty amazing. Although it's frustrating you can't see them. I'd love to be the scientist who finds a way to photograph really, really tiny things. Not me, said Dean. I'm quite happy with all the things we can see and discover in the world already. Including, laughed Florrie, uncovering the ancient remains hidden in my garden. Am I getting too carried away, asked Dean. I've been thinking of this as a multi-day project, at least. Florrie looked at Dean. I'd be very happy if you're thinking of this as a long-term project. Tuesday, the 12th of July. Cheryl was sat in her living room with Emily, Abdul, Kyle, Dean and Florrie forming a semicircle in front of her. A man is walking through a small market. He is part of a good-sized crowd, browsing, chatting, trying, comparing, tasting and buying. He stops by an artisan armourer's stall and peruses a pair of leather greaves. The artisan looks up and sees the man. Marcus, she cries, it is an honour to have possibly the greatest warrior in all the land reviewing my armaments. Why, thank you, replies Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. May I purchase these leg guards? The artisan armourer nods, reaches for the greaves and hands them to Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. Elsewhere in the market, at a stall selling fruits and vegetables, a man is looking at a neat display of star fruits. The greengrocer looks up and sees the man. Igor, he cries, it is an honour to have possibly the greatest warrior in all the land inspecting my fruits. Why, thank you, replies Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. May I purchase five of these star fruits? The greengrocer nods, reaches for a crinkly brown paper bag, fills it with five star fruits and hands them to Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. Why, look, a man from the market crowd suddenly shouts, there is Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. He pauses briefly as the crowd falls silent. He continues, and there is Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. He pauses again. He continues again, and today we have the opportunity to find out who actually is the greatest. And, cries someone else, make referring to each of them less of a mouthful in the future. Amidst whispered wagers, murmured excitement, peering glances and aborted purchases, people move aside and a clear space steadily grows between Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, and Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, and Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, look at each other. A young boy cries out, Why are these two men possibly the greatest warriors in all the land? That's because, comes the shouted reply, these two warriors have never before met, and yet both of them have met every other warrior in the land, and both have bested each and every one of those other warriors. How is that even possible? shouts the young man incredulously. This is a small and simple land, shouts someone in reply. So there are not that many warriors hereabouts. These are impressive and unlikely brags, and yet they are true. 
The excited murmurings of the crowd intensify as the artisan armourer appears from behind her stall carrying two wooden swords and two wooden shields. A little boy and a little girl run up, take a sword and shield each, and carry them at a run to Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, and Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land. A winner will be decided after five minutes, cries the armourer. Suddenly, from a stall selling household accoutrements, a loud bell sounds. The market falls silent. Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, stands completely still, with a relaxed but somehow ominous posture. Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, stands completely still with a tall but somehow bending posture. Seconds tick by. Neither warrior moves. Minutes tick by. Neither warrior moves. Suddenly a loud bell sounds. Five minutes, cries the armourer. The fight is over. Wait, shouts the young boy. Was that it? To the accompaniment of cancelled bets, disappointed mutterings and philosophical conjectures, the crowd disperses and normal market activity resumes. Marcus, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, and Igor, possibly the greatest warrior in all the land, resume their own small parts in the market's bustle. I like this one, said Abdul. I think they were both waiting for the other to move first. He looked at Dean. Dean, in a fight, do you always wait for the other person to make a mistake? Or move first? Or... Dean shrugged. I mean, I wasn't usually the one making decisions, but when I was, I was patient, stayed relaxed, and tried to make everything I did count for something. So, kind of, maybe. Carl looked at Cheryl. I think these stories are supposed to highlight general truths, which in reality are more nuanced. Cheryl stood up and headed for the kitchen. How are the grant applications going? asked Dean. Cheryl, Kyle and I are making good progress, said Abdul. I think we're about to send off two more. Kyle nodded. And the last one will be finished this week, continued Abdul, although we might be given additional things to do once they start being reviewed. And, added Kyle, I've set things up with Long Lodge so that they can look after the money we raise. Did you? started Cheryl. Yes, said Carl, as he headed for the bags. There's paperwork confirming the money will be held by a third party. That's all sorted. He pulled a board game from his bag and held it up. Abdul, I've got power grid for tonight. Great, said Abdul. Oh, I guess it's just the two of us then. Emily, said Carl questioningly. I don't like power grid, said Emily. Carl looked at Dean. It would be nice to recruit at least one more player. This is my favourite game, explained Abdul. It's got all the things I most like about board games, without any of the broken cards or extra rules. It's a true challenge of board game mastery. OK, said Dean. Try it, laughed Cheryl from the kitchen. I've got a feeling you might like it. Then count me in, said Dean. Excellent, said Abdul. If you're free, Emily, suggested Flory. Perhaps you can help me with some fundraising stuff. OK, said Emily. Count me in as well, said Cheryl, adding quickly, for the fundraising help, obviously. We don't have to play this, said Carl. It's OK, said Flory. You can play Power Thingamy. Although I did have one question. What's that? asked Carl. I'm working on something with a cafe, explained Flory. But the owner wants it so that if the grant doesn't happen, the money goes to a local food bank instead. Is that possible? Of course, replied Carl. Simply make it clear to the treasurer when the money is transferred. Every donation is individually tracked. And if you have any problems, just ask me for help. Flory smiled. Great, thanks Carl. Cheryl returned from the kitchen, joining Flory and Emily. By the way, Emily, how's the survey doing? It's going well, said Emily. We've added lots of species to the list, and on Sunday we're going to survey nocturnal wildlife. That's if Dean has time with his new job. Everyone looked at Dean. Dean looked at Emily, puzzled. What job? Gardening for Flory, of course, replied Emily. Flory looked down at her lap and blushed. Oh, the gardening, said Dean. What's this? asked Carl. Flory asked me to start sorting out her garden, explained Dean. It's going to look really nice. He stopped and looked at Flory. At least Flory's letting me make some decisions, and, well, absolutely. Flory smiled at Dean. I asked Dean to tidy the garden up a bit. And it's become a garden makeover, which is making me very happy. Really? Carl looked at Dean. Perhaps we could compare diaries and see if you can fit in a second customer. Thursday, the 14th of July. Dean climbed over a stile between a field and a single track dirt road. He adjusted his rucksack and looked at his phone. He looked up and down the road. The road was lined with trees and hedges. On one side lay the field Dean had just come from. On the other side, at intervals of approximately 100 metres, were stylish detached houses with sprawling gardens. Dean looked at the closest house on the right. It was large, with white walls and a slate roof. He looked down at his phone and nodded. Fancy, he said under his breath. He started walking towards the white house, alongside a hedge. Glimpses of garden peeked through the hedge. An extensive lush lawn was dotted with various sparsely filled curved flower beds and trees lay beyond. 
Reaching a gravel driveway, Dean turned and headed for the house. The driveway had room for ten or so cars, but just one blue Aston Martin was parked on it. The front door swung open. Morning, Dean, Carl appeared. I saw you coming across the field. If you need a lift back to the bus stop later, just let me know. Dean glanced at the Aston Martin. I'm tempted, but I actually get a kind of weird satisfaction from making my own way around. Plus, I probably won't catch the bus later. I think I saw a good camping spot from the bus. Well, the offer's there. They shook hands. Dean looked towards the garden and whistled softly. It must be, what, two acres? Three, actually. I'll explain. You can see it's mostly lawn, which is long overdue cutting, Carl indicated with his hand. Along the edge, we've got a hedge, which someone comes and does once a year. Well, they used to, but now that could be one of your jobs. And there are flower beds, which provide food for the rabbits. And if you look at the far corner, away from the road, Carl pointed. Dean looked in the direction Carl was pointing. The lawn had some of its otherwise rectangular shape missing, and its place was a small woodland. That copse is also mine, explained Carl. It has trees, benches, and, well, it's a nature garden, really. Emily would love it, I'm sure. This is a big job. I know, and you don't have to say yes. If you do, I have three simple requests. First, Carl pointed towards a massive garden shed. I've got a ride-on mower that you'll need to use to keep the lawn down. Oh, and that shed has a simple bathroom. Plus, you could store your rucksack in there if you like. And I can clear a shelf if you want to store things. Anyway, second, I'd like you to keep the nature garden clear enough to walk around. Third, I'd like you to use your initiative with the rest of your time. Be aware that an army of hungry rabbits are ready to eat any delicious new plants that you buy. And you said the hedge as well. Carl ran his eyes over the hedge thoughtfully. That's usually an autumn job, and so I could pay you then for extra days if you like, or whatever works for you. You don't have a garden already. I've not had one for a while, since when I've been keeping the grass down myself, so you're not taking the job from anyone else. Carl looked at Dean. What say you? Dean nodded. Yes, please. I'd love to. Half of the lawn was cut. It still looked green, but had a more uniform shade, and no errant blades of grass or weeds were breaking free. A dirty red ride-on lawnmower rested on the grass, with Dean sat nearby eating a sandwich. Carl was approaching from the house, carrying a plate and two packets of crisps. Hi, Dean. Hello, Carl. Dean started to get up. It's OK. You can stay sitting down. Can I join you? Of course. Carl sat down near to Dean, throwing him a packet of crisps. I'm going to assuage my guilt by giving you a packet as well. Dean laughed. Thanks. You managed to get it started, then? Yes, although I'm thinking of replacing a couple of consumables to get it running more smoothly. Just give me the receipt, said Carl. I'll pay for that kind of thing, obviously. The lawn's looking good, although I usually cut it shorter. Were you worried about overstressing the mower? Partly. Also, with the grass being so long, if I had cut it much shorter, it would have looked quite yellow. Hmm, that explains what I've been doing wrong. And will you then cut it shorter next time? Exactly, and I was wondering... Dean paused. Wondering? How do you feel about flowers in the lawn? I'm not sure, said Carl. Help me decide. What are you thinking? If I leave smaller flowers in the lawn, that's good for the wildlife. But the lawn still looks like a lawn. It simply has a touch of colour, mainly visible from close up. Then do that. Sounds good to me. OK, thanks, said Dean. Carl started on a sandwich, and Dean opened his packet of crisps. A robin flickered into view and landed on the mower. From its perch, it surveyed the ground around Dean and Carl. Suddenly, with a blur of wings, it darted down onto the ground, picked up a crumb, and returned to its perch on the mower. I'm really enjoying the gardening, said Dean. I get to be outdoors, and I get the space to just be on my own. Oh, Carl looked at Dean. Sorry, I didn't think. Do you want me to leave you in peace? No, no, replied Dean quickly. That's not what I meant. I just mean some workplaces can be a real bustle with people talking and telling you what to do, and it's not like that, doing this, I mean. I'm very similar, except for the gardening bit. I like having a nice garden, but I'm not really into the actual gardening thing. Talking of which, how's it going with Florrie? Really well. I'm managing to add features that won't simply be trashed by the cats, like sturdier shrubs, and I'm growing some stuff from seed so I can fill out the overall structure a bit. I meant, said Carl, how's it going with Flory, not with her garden? Oh, she's really nice. I can't believe how many friends I've made at Power of Us. Dean paused, and she's a really good cook. I really enjoy spending time with her. He paused and faintly frowned. But I still don't get what she does for a job. I don't think she gets paid for looking after the cats. She inherited some money a couple of years ago. Then the shop she was working in closed, and she hasn't got herself a new job yet. I get the impression she'll need another one at some point, but she doesn't seem to be in a rush. Sounds sensible to me. So, said Carl, are you still living out of that rucksack of yours? With all your new friends, has no one offered you a place to sleep yet? 
Flory said I could stay over last time we went for dinner. Really? That sounds great. She's got a sofa bed, explained Dean, and she said I could use it whenever I wanted. Kyle looked at Dean. And if you stayed over yet? I didn't want to impose. But surely she wouldn't offer if she didn't mean it. I suppose not, said Dean. Friday, the 15th of July. The sky over Store Park was half covered in fluffy white clouds. Dean was crossing the road from the park in the direction of Store Munchie's cafe. With his rucksack on his back, outside the cafe, Maria was kneeling next to the A-frame blackboard with a piece of chalk in her hand. A couple of the outside tables were occupied. Maria stood up. Hi, Dean. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And you? Good, thank you. Dean looked at the sign, looked at Maria, and smiled. Maria smiled back. Dean looked down at the sign. He casually looked at Maria. He smiled. So, said Maria, how's the park survey doing? Oh, really well. We're building a good list of species, and Emily wants us to look for bats on Sunday. She's got a bat detect, you see. It's going really well, thank you. That sounds great. Maria looked at Dean. Dean fiddled with a strap, hanging off the waistband of his rucksack. Did you want something? asked Maria. I, I was hoping to make a reservation for Saturday. Reservation? You don't need to do that. It's always first come, first served at store munchies. I know, said Dean, but I want to do something a bit special. Someone's been helping me out, and I want a nice way to say thank you. I'd like to make a reservation, just to be sure, for two, for tomorrow evening. For two? For Flurry and me. Maria paused. Um, okay, this sounds very important and worth making a special effort over. Let's make this happen. What time were you thinking? 7.30. 7.30, the... Maria paused. That's fine. Let's make it special. I'll see you then. Wait, I need to invite Flory first. Of course you do. Maria indicated towards the table. You can sit down if you like. Thank you. Dean turned away from Maria and walked towards the table. He reached the table and awkwardly put down his rucksack. He sat down. He pulled out his phone and tapped at the screen. His hand slowed to a stop with a finger hovering over the green call button on the screen. A house sparrow landed nearby and started feeding on some crumbs. It inched closer to Dean's table. Dean's gaze drifted away from his phone. He stared into space. Someone at another table laughed loudly. He looked back down at his phone. His finger wavered over the button. Suddenly his finger moved decisively. The green call button was tapped. He lifted the phone to his ear. Hello Dean, said Flory over the phone. Hello Flory. To what do I owe the pleasure of this call? I was wondering, said Dean, if you were free this Saturday evening I could pick you up at seven o'clock at yours? That would be lovely. I'd like that. Great, so I'll see you then. Goodbye. Dean lowered the phone away from his ear. Wait, I need to know what we're doing. Dean lifted the phone back up to his ear. But I want it to be a surprise, if that's okay with you. A surprise sounds great, but should I dress for a hike or a swimming pool or... Oh, sorry, I suppose if you could dress smart and not eat anything beforehand, then it involves about a five minute walk to get to. Ooh, mysterious, cooed Flurry. So I'll see you then? Of course. Great, said Dean. So, goodbye. He lowered the phone and moved to touch a red button on the screen. Oh, OK, said Flory. Good butt. Dean's finger reached the button and the call ended. He stood up and picked up his rucksack. He looked around and spotted Maria serving at a table. Maria acknowledged Dean with a wave. Dean smiled and gave a thumbs up. Maria gave a thumbs up in return. Dean headed off towards the park. Saturday, the 16th of July. The sun was on its way towards the horizon and the air was chilling slightly. Dean stood outside Flory's front door, adjusting his rucksack where it was scuffing up the shoulders of a new jacket. He knocked on the door. Meow, came a response from just inside. Meow, replied Dean. Claws scraped down the door. Footsteps sounded within the house. Hi, Dean, called out Flory from somewhere beyond the door. Dean replied loudly. Hi, Flory, I'm here. Ready when you are. Great, just a couple more minutes. The front door opened, and Dean jumped slightly. Hello, Flory. Hello, Dean. Flory looked Dean up and down. I see you can pull off the smart look, as well as the dashingly unkempt look. Unkempt? Dash? Flory smiled. Do you want to leave your bag in here? She indicated towards the catlock. That's a good idea. Dean took off his rucksack and put it inside. Thanks. Flory closed the door as Dean walked up to the gate and pulled it open smoothly on a shiny new pair of hinges. Flory smiled at Dean as she walked through the gate. Which way? asked Flory. Oh, sorry. Dean indicated along the pavement. This way. Ooh, we're going in the direction of the park. Hmm, I like surprises, but no, it's fine. I can wait, if I have to. They started walking together along the pavement. Dean looked across at Flory. How's your day? Good, thanks. 
So where are we going? You'll know in about five minutes, said Dean. Dean and Florrie were approaching store munchies. In the park, people were sitting, standing, walking, jogging, playing football, exercising, skateboarding. A small group with binoculars and telescopes were looking up at the peregrine falcon nest in the tower. Dean slowed and Florrie slowed with him. They came to a stop outside store munchies. The tables and chairs that would usually be outside were nowhere to be seen. Inside the cafe it was quiet, the lights were off and no one was around. Dean walked up to the door and gripped the door handle. The door jiggled and clanked in its frame. Hi, Dean peered inside. I'm sorry, Florrie. I thought I'd reserved, but I didn't actually confirm verbally with Maria. I just, um... Florrie pointed at a sign in the window. Look, it closes at seven on a Saturday. I'm sorry. That's okay. Should we go for a walk in the park for a bit and decide what to do? Dean looked around. I'm really sorry about this. Florrie led the way across the road and Dean followed. They stepped over the metal pole barrier and entered the park. So, said Florrie, tell me more about the survey you're doing with Emily. We're up to almost... Dean! A cry came from the direction of the cafe. Dean! Florrie! Where are you going? Dean and Florrie turned around. Maria was stood by the door of the cafe, waving. Dean smiled with relief. I guess dinner's back on, said Florrie. Dean and Florrie retraced their steps, returning to the cafe. Maria fiddled with something just inside the door, and some fairy lights came on inside. Come in, welcomed Maria. Florrie and Dean walked in, and the door closed with a clicking noise. Maria hung a sign on the door that read Private Function. Dean looked at Maria with a puzzled expression. Maria looked at Dean. I thought you... She paused and smiled. Welcome, Florrie and Dean. If you'd like to come this way... She indicated towards the table, next to the window. The table was the only one in the cafe that had been laid. It had two places set opposite each other, each with three sets of cutlery and a neatly folded napkin. In the centre of the table was an unlit candle in a glass candle holder. Maria pulled out Florrie's chair and Florrie sat down. Dean sat down opposite. Maria reached into a pocket of her apron, pulled out a box of matches and lit the candle. Florrie smiled. If Madam and Sir would like to wait a moment, I'll be back shortly. Maria motioned her hand towards the two filled glasses already on the table. Dean, you have a glass of water, and Florrie, you have your favourite, I think. Maria turned and walked quickly back towards the back of the cafe. This, screwed Florrie, is a good surprise. It's a surprise to me as well, laughed Dean. Florrie looked at Dean. Thank you. Maria appeared, carrying one large plate and two small plates. She put the large plate in the centre of the table and the smaller plates in front of Florrie and Dean. Mini bow buns, focaccia fingers, vegetable sticks, rosemary dip, peanut dip, cremini dip and zebra courgette bruschetta. Wow, said Dean. This is amazing, said Florrie. I hope we're not putting you out. Of course not, said Maria. When Dean suggested it, I wanted to help and I stay late once a week or so to do prep, so I'm simply doing my prep this evening. So don't rush, you can stay as long as you like, and for the moment I will leave you to enjoy your starter. It was turning dark outside. The candle was now lighting the scene at the table, and not just decorating it. Dean took a sip of water. Florrie placed a small dessert spoon into an empty glass bowl with a clink. What a lovely evening, said Florrie, but it doesn't have to be over yet. We could carry on chatting back at my house if you like. That would be nice, replied Dean. Maria appeared at the side of the table. How was it? Can I get you anything else? That was amazing, replied Florrie. I think we're both full now. She looked at Dean. Dean nodded in agreement. Thank you so much, continued Florrie. Maria smiled. You should thank Dean as well. It was his idea to, and I quote, do something special for you. Florrie quickly turned to look at Dean. Really? It's a thank you for all your help, said Dean, and for being a good friend. He reached into his pocket and pulled out some money. He offered it to Maria. For the meal. Thank you. Oh, Dean, said Maria. I wasn't expecting you to pay. Please. Dean proffered the money further forwards. Notwithstanding whether or not we pay, it was still a special meal and a special evening, and I'd like to pay my way on this one. Maria accepted the money and tucked it into her apron. Then, thank you, Dean. Now I've got to get back to the oven, so you just let yourselves out whenever you like. Bye, Florrie. Bye, Dean. Bye, Maria, said Florrie. Thank you again, Maria, said Dean. Maria headed towards the back of the cafe. Florrie and Dean headed for the door. I hadn't realised how dark it was, said Florrie. We must have been here nearly three hours. Dean opened the door, and Florrie walked through. Dean closed the door gently, and it clicked as it settled back into the frame. They began walking back in the direction of Florrie's house. I learned something about running a cafe this evening, said Dean. Namely, that you have to do cooking prep outside of opening hours. Maybe it depends on what they serve. Florrie looked at Dean. 
I guess everything has hidden layers, and talking of hidden layers, I've wanted to ask you something for ages. Go on. How do you wash if you're homeless? Because I've always thought you keep surprisingly clean, although, although there were some issues with your feet. Dean laughed. I think I fixed that. I've started using a deodorant on my boots every day, but cleaning it's... Uh, I could tell you, but are you sure you want to know? I'm intrigued. Okay, well, I use sinks in public toilets regularly, where I wash mainly my face and upper body. I also have a packet of wet wipes, you know the ones for cleaning babies, which are really cheap. And I use them to clean. Well, the bits of your body, they get smelly quickest. I developed a trick, actually. A trick. I add a bit of soap to the first wet wipe, then I use two more without soap to clean most of the soap away. So you don't even need showers then? Trust me I do, said Dean. I used to go to a hostel once a month, but now I get a shower every week at Cheryl's. I mean power of us. And obviously you let me use your shower sometimes. Plus Kyle has a basic bathroom in his massive garden shed, if you can even call it a shed. It seems odd. I mean, store community centre having a shower. Cheryl said it's because the building is really old, and years ago there was a living caretaker or something. Was this evening nice? asked Florrie. Or do you prefer being out in the wilds on your own? Dean sighed. I like this evening a lot. I just... Sometimes it's easier when you're on your own. Do you know what I mean? Not really. I like having things a certain way. I like having a system of things I do. Dean paused. No, that's not it. When the... You know it's nice to have things organised. Florrie laughed. I'm not organised like you are. But I think I know what you mean. Well, you have to be to live out of a rucksack, so... But... Actually, I'm not explaining this very well. I mean, I do like being out exploring and travelling. But I like being with friends as well. I just seem to find it hard to make friends. How about you? Me what? I don't know, said Dean. I think I mean, how about being friends? Friends would be nice. But we already are, I think. Yes, said Flory quickly. Yes, absolutely. Friends would be nice. So that's good then, said Dean. They were approaching Flory's house. They went in through the gate, which swung open neatly and smoothly. Flory found her keys as she walked up to the front door. She unlocked the door and opened it slowly, placing her leg in the growing gap. Suddenly she stepped into the house, reached down and swept a cat up into her arms. Nice try, Chipmunk. You'll have to go out the back and down the path if you really want to investigate the road. Dean followed Flory into the cat lock and they closed the door. They stood in close proximity within the cat lock. Flory released Chipmunk, who ran into the house through a small gap in the curtain. I started Dean. So started Flory. Flory giggled slightly. Good evening, called out Abdul from beyond the catlock. Flory jumped. Abdul. She opened the curtain and walked through. Hello, Abdul, said Dean. Abdul looked at Dean. What are you doing here? Flory looked at Abdul. And what are you doing here? I hope you don't mind, said Abdul. I tried calling, but you weren't answering. I know you said the key was so I could come in to do schoolwork, but I've got an urgent deadline. It's a grant application for the renovation of the community centre. Cheryl thought I'd done it. And I thought Cheryl had done it, and Cheryl is busy, and Carl's not really involved in this one. And I was struggling to concentrate at home. I just got here a few minutes ago. He looked at Dean. Actually, do you think you could help? Me? Dean looked at Flory. This sounds important, said Flory. Do you want me to help as well? It's Dean I need, said Abdul. Or Emily, but it's past her bedtime. I'm trying to add some information to the application about the wildlife in the park. I've kind of worked out some answers, but Dean, if you could check them for me. You know a lot more about wildlife. I tried calling you as well, but you weren't answering either. I had my phone off, said Dean. He looked at Flory. Flory and I were having a nice quiet evening together. Go on, encouraged Flory. Help Abdul. She looked at Abdul. Will it take long? It might, said Abdul. Then, Flory looked at Dean. I'm usually in bed early, so I'll say good night. But you're welcome to sleep over, as it's getting late for you too. If you wanted to sleep on the sofa bed, you know where it is. And if you want to say good night again, or need me for anything, my room is first on the left at the top of the stairs. Then, good night, Flory, said Dean, and thanks again for a great evening. And thank you, Dean, said Flory, and good night, Abdul, good luck with the application. Good night, Flory, said Abdul. Flory headed up the stairs as Dean watched her go. So, said Abdul, tell me about the park wildlife, in less than 500 words, hitting, he indicated a piece of paper, all these key aspects. Dean moved a chair and sat down next to Abdul. I thought, said Dean, that Emily already gave you a detailed wildlife list a few days ago. She did, and that's in the application already, but we need a general description, and I'm struggling a bit. I don't even recognise half the things on the list that Emily gave me, which means I don't know how to write a narrative summary. Plus there's other stuff to do before the midnight deadline. Maybe you could help me with those as well? Sure. Thanks, said Abdul. Bubbles shifted in Abdul's lap and gave a relaxed sounding breath as she settled into a new position. Abdul picked up his laptop and placed it in his backpack. I'm sorry it took so long. That's okay. I'm glad I could help. 
Abdul lifted Bubbles off his lap and stood up. I'm going now. Do you think you'll stay over? Yes, I think so. It's getting late and, well, it'd be good to have a break from sleeping out. Okay. Abdul headed for the catlock. I'll see you on Tuesday. Goodbye. Goodbye. Abdul entered the catlock and drew the curtain closed. The door opened and closed. Dean looked at the sofa bed. Three cats languishing on the sofa bed returned his gaze. Sorry guys, I'm going to need you to move. Something bumped against Dean's leg. He looked down. Meow. Tickles three. Where have you been? Meow. I've missed you too. Now listen, I don't want to disturb Flory, but between the two of us, I'm sure we can fathom out how this sofa bed works. Sunday, the 17th of July. The sun had dropped below the horizon, and Store Park was gloomy. Emily stood in the open, holding a small black box in the air. A woman in jeans and a jumper was holding a phone in the air near the black box. Dean was stood nearby with his rucksack on his back, looking at his phone. Click, 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 click. Sound clicked from the black box. Dean looked up from his phone. Definitely it says in the manual that we should be at 45 kilohertz. OK, replied Emily. Mum, are you getting the sound on your phone? I am, said Emily's mum. What are the clicks? Background noise, answered Emily, from insects or something. Click, clop, click. Did you hear that? said Emily. Dean yawned. One of them sounds a bit more poppy. That's click, clop, 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 loo, click. Pips draw bat, said Emily. Definitely. Dean took a notebook out of his pocket and moved next to Emily's mum. Excuse me, Kayla. He looked at the screen of her phone and wrote something in his notebook. Mum, asked Emily, did the audio recorder get that? Yes, said Kayla. The bars moved up like you said. Emily nodded. Thanks. Click, click. Over the river, said Dean. I see, said Emily. Perhaps it's a... Dean and Emily finished the sentence together. Door Bentons. Emily shifted the black box, directing it towards the river. Boap, 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 boap. Dean looked at Kayla's phone and wrote in his notebook. Let's try for Noctual, said Emily. They're at 25 kilohertz. She adjusted the dial on the box. Click, 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 tss, click. Wait, said Emily. She turned the dial back the other way. Dean, write down 32 kilohertz. And shall I write down the time? asked Dean. No, said Emily. I need a clearer signal to cut it out of the audio file as evidence. Click, click. I'm so impressed with Emily, said Kayla. She's very good at wildlife. Last year, she announced she'd read every single book on wildlife in the whole library, and she... Oh, Mum, please, interrupted Emily with a sigh. I didn't announce it, and it was every book in the young adult section, not every book in the library. Dean stifled a laugh, turning it into a yawn. So, what's at 32 kilohertz? A few things, said Emily. I thought I heard... B... Let's all be quiet for a bit. Click, click, tzz, click, click, click. Perhaps it was nothing, said Kayla. Shh, said Emily. Click, click, click. Tzz, tzz, click, click. Yes, said Emily. Barbara's still bat. Maybe. Quiet, everyone. Dean wrote in his notebook. Click, tzz, tzz, click, click, click. Emily whispered. That's it. Barbara's still bat. It's very rare. And now it's on our park list, said Dean. Don't they roost in the summer in nooks of trees? I think so, said Emily. They might be roosting in the actual park. Dean looked at Kayla's phone and wrote in his notebook. Is that it over there? asked Kayla, pointing. We need to carry on, said Emily. Tonight is a survey. I'm setting the back detector to 25 kilohertz. Click, click. Dean yawned. How can you be bored? asked Emily. This is amazing. I'm tired, said Dean. Is it difficult sleeping outside? asked Kayla. Actually, said Dean, I was sleeping on a sofa last night, but I kept being woken up by cats jumping on me, lying on my face, or otherwise being disruptive. Sofa? said Emily. Where? I was helping Abdul, said Dean, and it ended up being really late, and Flory said I could sleep on the sofa. That was nice of her, said Emily, but you couldn't sleep. No, said Dean, so I ended up leaving and trying to sleep here in Store Park. Long story short, I'm tired. Then thank you for coming out tonight, said Kayla. I said to Emily, after she exhibited her usual, she's, she's allowed to visit the park on her own during the day, but not at morning or night, though she said you always come with her anyway, and I know Maria knows you, but I wanted to meet you just to be sure, obviously. And Dean, it's great to this way, interrupted Emily as she started moving towards some trees. And Mum, remember to be quiet. Tuesday, the 19th of July. In the living room of Cheryl's flat, Emily, Abdul, Dean, Carl and Flory watched on as Cheryl started to speak. A travelling salesman arrives at a village early in the morning with a cart full of wares pulled by two towering shower horses. 
He stops his cart on the village green and unties the shire horses from the two shafts that project forward from the cart. The horses make a brief thundering canter before stopping and beginning to graze. A steady flow of villagers arrive on the green to browse the salesman's wares. There is a high demand for a new type of spice from the east. Excited murmurings accompany the salesman's announcement that he has a new sea potato that will grow an extra two or three potatoes per plant compared to average. The salesman demonstrates an effervescing powder that a natural philosopher to the north has posited aids the body in the processing of bile. Purchases are made, samples are tested, future orders are taken, news is exchanged. It is a lively atmosphere. Someone brings the salesman a drink to quench his thirst. As new purchases fizzle out, the salesman begins purchasing items himself. He barters for seeds, dried mushrooms, tools and clothes from some locals. As time further passes, the mingling crowd no longer talks of purchases. The talk has moved on completely to news, gossip, opinions, weather, the state of banditry on the main road westwards and the qualities of the two shire horses. With a final quick glance round the crowd, the salesman opens a drawer in the side of his cart and retrieves a ribbon. He measures ten long strides ahead of the cart and lays the ribbon on the ground. I offer a prize, cries the salesman, if someone can pull the cart as far as the ribbon. Then the prize will be won. The front of the cart must pass the ribbon. Another of your challenges, comes a shout from the crowd. Can you do with the trick with the carrot next, cries someone else. A tall, broad-shouldered man steps forwards. You can do it, Rickard, shouts someone from the crowd. Rickard takes off his tunic to reveal rippling muscles across his chest, shoulders, arms and back. He steps up to the front of the cart and takes hold of the two shafts, one in each hand. Rickard grunts and strains and digs his feet into the ground. The wheels begin to roll. The cart is moving. Gasps come from the crowd. The salesman's eyes widen in surprise. Suddenly, one of the wheels drops into a divot on the green. The cart jerks to a stop and Rickard falls face forward onto the grass. The crowd laughs. Good work, Rickard, cries someone. That was still pretty impressive. Rickard gets up and heads back into the crowd as admiring glances wash over him. An old man comes forward, leaning on a stick. Let me try. The crowd laughs raucously. The old man looks towards the crowd, nods to a group of people stood nearby, points to the back of the cart and winks. As he moves to the front of the wagon, the group moves to the back. The old man takes hold of one of the shafts and leans forwards. Meanwhile, the group at the back form a scrum accompanied by grunts and groans and cries of watch my foot and steady. To the additional accompaniment of various squeaks and strains of wood and metal, the wheels of the cart start to roll and soon the ribbon is passed. The salesman shakes his head. I'm sorry, but you weren't supposed to do that. I only remember you specifying, says the old man, how many people could pull. The salesman laughs. Then, I don't remember specifying the prize. He gives the old man a single hazelnut. A story about friends, said Emily. Or maybe, said Carl, a story about what is important. Shell stood up. The point of the... Abdul and Emily interrupted in unison. Of the story is whatever you want it to be. Cheryl and Florrie went to the kitchen. Kyle, Dean and Abdul started to move the table and chairs. Emily went to the bathroom. Dean and Kyle carried one end of the table and placed it in the centre of the room. Abdul followed, carrying two chairs. Kyle stopped and looked towards the kitchen. Looked at Dean. Looked back towards the kitchen. Kyle drifted away from the table, motioning for Dean to come with him. Dean frowned and followed Kyle. Dean, said Carl, let's sit down on the sofa. I want to chat about something. Carl and Dean sat down. How did it go on Saturday night? asked Carl. It went okay, said Dean. Okay? I thought the two of you were getting on really well. We are, I think. She's acting weird, and therefore I find myself asking whether perhaps you have been acting quiet and mysterious again. Dean shrugged. I'll take that as a yes. Tell me exactly what happened on Saturday night. We went for a meal. The cafe was closed. But then Maria appeared and said she was making a special meal just for the two of us. It was really great. We went back to Florrie's. Abdul was there. I helped him with a grant application. I slept on Florrie's sofa. Then I left early in the morning. You... Wait, ma... Uh, Carl frowned. Back up. You've never stayed over at Florrie's before, correct? No, but she said I could on Saturday. But she'd already said you could... Anyway, on Saturday you left early in the morning before she got up. The cats kept disturbing me, explained Dean. It was a nightmare, except it wasn't even a nightmare because I couldn't sleep. Carl frowned. And you've told her this? No, because, well, I didn't want to seem ungrateful. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. Then that would seem to be the thing you failed to do. Except, hang on a sec, 
Did you do a garden on Monday? No, replied Dean. I mean, we never officially said. I And I wasn't sure if... Oh, Dean, Dean, Dean. You should apologise. Explain that you'd like to try again. You mean the garden? Carl sighed. No, not the garden. Look, Dean, we're, we're all friends here. Just be yourself, except be slightly more talkative during the next couple of minutes than you usually are. Dean frowned. The next couple of minutes? Carl looked towards the kitchen. Florrie, can you come over here? Dean wants to talk to you. Dean glared at Carl. What do I do now? Talk. Carl got up and walked away. Thursday, the 21st of July. A wheelbarrow full of dandelions stood in the middle of the lawn in the heat of the midday sun. Dean was knelt down next to the wheelbarrow. He was levering a trowel with one hand and pulling on a dandelion rosette with the other. Suddenly, a shower of dirt and a long thick root shot up out of the ground. Dean coughed, wiping dirt away from his face with the back of his hand. He threw the dandelion into the wheelbarrow. Lunch time. Carl's voice appeared. Dean looked around. Carl was nearby, placing two deck chairs on the ground. Yes, said Dean. That sounds great. Carl sat down and pulled sandwiches and crisps from a canvas bag. Dean stood up, grabbed a lunchbox from a bag hanging off a handle of the wheelbarrow and sat down. Carl offered a packet of crisps to Dean. Crisps? Thanks. So Dean, I have a question. You said you'd leave some of the weeds in the lawn to add colour and encourage butterflies. Then why are you pulling these out? These are dandelions and they are fast growing, said Dean. They seed easily and their rosettes of leaves smother the other plants around them, meaning they kind of take over. The plan is to not feed the grass anymore, so that over time the grass is not quite so dominant. Then the less aggressive flowers like daisies, milkwort, vetches, trefoils and speedwells can grow. That way you effectively still have a lawn, but it will have swaths of colour through it. However, dandelions stand tall and change the structure of the lawn a lot. It will be less swathy with dandelions in it. I see. So, you know what? I don't mind if the flowers take over, so you can stop doing that if you like. You sure? Absolutely, said Carl. You, Emily... And this whole park thing are making me realise how important it is to share our surroundings with wildlife. And I'd prefer a sea of flowers and butterflies to a sea of grass. Then I'll think about the dandelions. I might still weed them for a bit while we encourage the other flowers. Whatever seems best, but please forget my original instructions regarding the lawn. Dean looked around the garden. Hmm, I was actually thinking about this anyway. In which case, next year I'll maintain some wavy paths through the lawn, and the rest I'll mow once every couple of months-ish, so the flowers have time to grow and see between cuts. He paused. I'll start experimenting with doing that in a small area now, but, like I said, we have to wait until next year to really make this work. So, said Carl, you were sat talking to Florrie for ages after I, um, encouraged you to talk. Any news? She's taking me out for a meal this evening. Excellent, said Carl. That's good to hear. And while you and Flory were talking, we got an update from Abdul. He was always taking the lead with the applications, and he has their primary contact on them, meaning we're always waiting on him to hear the latest news. So anyway, did you hear it? Dean shook his head. Apparently, he's had a grant application for the community centre restoration accepted. He's waiting to discover exactly how much match funding we need to provide. He's anticipating hearing by next Tuesday, when we should get a big update. I mean, you know what Abdul's like. He's very compartmentalised, so he could get a place at Oxford and he's still waiting until the official socialising part of the next Power of Us session to actually tell us. Seems sensible to me, said Dean. It's not good to assume other people are interested. Hmm, murmured Carl. Carl and Dean sat eating quietly, looking out over the garden. A robin flew over and landed on the edge of the tray of the wheelbarrow. He looked at Dean and Carl before making a darting flight out of sight amidst the dandelion debris. Q, Q. A queuing noise came from the sky above the garden. Dean and Carl looked up. A bird of prey was circling above. Its broad rounded wings held steady at a slight upwards angle. So it's just gliding, asked Carl, not using any energy to fly. Pretty much. The joints in its wings will lock into that position, which in the case of a buzzard is a characteristically slightly upwards V-shape meaning it just needs energy to keep its basic functions going like breathing and moving its head around to look. Otherwise, it's just floating through the air effortlessly. How long can they go without food? I'm not sure, said Dean. The thing is, a bird can't feed up too much or it becomes too heavy to fly. But I've heard that vultures, which are similar to buzzards, can easily go a week between meals. The robin reappeared from amidst the dandelions and flew off. So, asked Dean, is your Aston Martin nice to drive? My Aston Martin? Yes and no. Used to be a bit of a nightmare, but I paid my garage to retune the engine to go slower. Slower? 
It was just too fast all the time I was having to press the accelerator really gently. It's a bit daft really. And I found that took away some of the sense of speed. The fact I had to hold back so much, I mean. And anyway, it was making my ankle hurt, constantly restraining my foot from pressing too hard, so I had them retune it. I wonder why people even buy them, said Dean. I mean, if you can't really drive them properly, I suppose they're designed as racing cars, so it makes sense they'd be difficult to drive on the road. I think, said Carl, it's like buying a new pair of sunglasses, just on a larger scale. Well, no, for me that's not it. I just like cars, to be honest. Carl shrugged. Well, if you've got the money, why not? I guess so, said Carl. I... Try not to waste my money, though. Talking of which, said Dean. I was wondering. Well, more thinking, really. No, I mean wondering. What I mean is, well, actually, it doesn't matter. Go on. You've started to say you'll finish. I'd like to hear it now. No, it's fine, really, said Dean. Go on, said Carl. I presume you're about to take the conversation in an interesting direction. I think you know me well enough by now to know I won't take offence. I was thinking. If you have so much money which is fine, obviously, then why don't you help pay for the community centre repairs? Assuming you could, of course. I think, I mean, not... You You obviously care about the community centre, so, well, why not? It feels like something you could do, but obviously you're helping fundraise, so I mean, that. that's pretty much the answer already, so, yeah, it's cool. I'm not sure if it's cool or not, said Carl. I mean, I could help a bit, although I couldn't pay for it all, so in that sense it's a bit of a moot point. But I decided a long time ago to give most of my money to Amnesty International, which I then wrote into my will. And so when things like this crop up, including friends and family asking me for money, which happens sometimes, I can just say no with a clean conscience, or what feels like one anyway. That makes sense, said Dean. And I respect that you're not just leaving the money to a charity that works in a sector that for some reason touched you in the past. I mean, that's fine as well, obviously, but you'll be helping some of the truly helpless in the world today. A couple of times when I was on deployment, I saw Amnesty International doing really good work. That's nice to hear, Carl paused. Although, to play devil's advocate, perhaps if I really cared about and believed in the community centre, which I claim to, I'd put some of my money on the line as well. Over the years, that community centre has done a lot of good, so why not support it too? I'd not really thought about it, to be honest. I'm so in the habit of not doing so. And I bought my Aston Martin because I like it, so I've already set the precedent of sometimes spending money on things I like. Sorry, said Dean. That was a bit awkward. It's fine. And anyway, I've got this theory. I think difficult questions bring you closer to the people you'd want to be closer to, and they push you further away from the people you'd want to be further away from. And if you hold back from saying the difficult things, perhaps the people you want to be closer to will never learn who you really are. Dean laughed. You're starting to sound like Cheryl. (laughs) Except less cryptic, said Carl. Dean held his hands up in surrender. I take it back, you sound absolutely nothing like Cheryl. Thursday, the 21st of July, evening. Along Store High Street, the streetlights were switching on as dusk descended. Through the window of La Comida Feliz, mainly couples and groups could be seen eating burritos, tacos, nachos, fajitas, enchiladas, toastadas. The restaurant door opened. Florrie and Dean walked out together. This way, said Flurry. Thanks again for the meal, said Dean. That's okay. I thought it would be nice to take turns. I'm pleased we sorted this out, said Dean. But aren't we walking the wrong way? Well, before we try to solve the problem of the cats waking you up, I want to give you a present. Florrie reached into her handbag. She pulled out a box, a bit smaller than a paperback book, wrapped in silver paper with a black ribbon. Do I open it now? If you like. As they walked down the high street, Dean tugged on the ribbon. The ribbon untied, and the paper naturally began to open. Dean helped the paper aside to reveal a budget smartphone. A phone? Um, thank you. Florrie laughed gently. You seem confused. Let's stop and look in this newsagent's window. Tell me what you see. Sure. Okay. Dean looked at the window. I see a local advertising display. He started scanning the little advertising cards and posters. Florrie got out her phone. Oh, look, an advert for a local gardener. I'll call and see if I can book him in. She tapped at her phone. Dean frowned and looked at Florrie. Florrie lifted her phone up to her ear and looked at Dean. Oh, it's ringing. I wonder if the gardener will be able to do my garden tomorrow. What? started Dean. Bwee, bwee. The phone in Dean's hand started to ring. Bwee, bwee. Dean looked at Florrie. Florrie smiled. Are you going to answer it? We. Dean pressed a button on the phone and lifted it to his ear. Hello, Dean the gardener here. I'm free tomorrow if you need some gardening doing. 
How did you guess? Perhaps you can start after we've had breakfast together. Flurry hung up and put her phone away. Dean peered at one of the cards in the window. Dean the gardener. Skilled and friendly. All aspects of gardening undertaken. Small jobs and large projects. Wildlife gardening a speciality. I was talking to Carl on Wednesday, explained Flurry. He says you can just go and look at the jobs you're offered. You can always say no. That way you can slowly build up some regular customers. Why, Carl is such a good friend. Yes, actually. Dean moved towards Flurry and gave her a hug. Flurry hugged him back. And so are you, sniffed Dean. Thank you. Sunday, the 24th of July. Dawn was breaking over Store Park, a chorus of mainly blackbirds, robins, wrens, dunnocks, wood pigeons and black caps were singing in the new day. A car slowed to a stop in the community centre car park. A figure approached the car as the passenger door opened. Good morning, Emily, said Dean. Hello, Dean, replied Emily as she stepped out of the car. A fast food wrapper was kicked out with her and she reached down to pick it up and throw it back inside. Dean leant down to look inside the car. Good morning, Kayla. Morning, Dean, replied Kayla. Emily was putting on her camouflage backpack and placing her binoculars round her neck. Kayla leaned forwards to get a better view of Dean. Where's your rucksack? Emily stopped and stared at Dean. Yes, where is it? Are you all right? I'm fine, said Dean, holding up his binoculars. Look, I've got my binoculars. I'm ready to get started with the survey. But, Emily frowned, where's your rucksack? I, the... Dean stumbled for words. It's at Florrie's. Kayla laughed. We need to get going, said Emily. Of course you do, said Kayla. Dean, you're with Emily till nine, yes? And then, Emily, you can walk back on your own. Actually, said Dean, I'd rather walk Emily back to yours, just to be safe. OK, said Kayla, then I'll see you both later and I can make you lunch. Bye, Mum. Emily slammed the door shut and looked at Dean. Come on, we need to get to the river. And don't expect lunch, that never actually happens. Emily launched into a fast walk. Dean took a couple of quick steps to catch up and walked next to her. I love the dawn chorus, said Dean. I find the birds are so much noisier first thing in the morning. They walked across the grass towards the river. Birdsong filled the air, mixed with the occasional distant rumble of a car or bark of a dog. Is that a garden warbler singing? Dean indicated towards a bush. It sounds too flowing for a black cap. Emily kept walking and pulled out her phone. I'll record the sound. We can listen to it later. She tapped at the screen. Possible garden warbler. She held up her phone in the air, directing it towards the bush. Chee twoo chee chee twoo chee twoo she woo chee chee woo chee she chee. Emily lowered her phone and tapped at the screen. Got it. Dean pointed towards the edge of the woodland. Shall we approach the river via the trees? It would give us cover. Yes. Emily angled towards the trees. Their footsteps were almost silent on the soft grass. They looked around as they walked. Dean whispered, A few things moving in the wood. Probably blackbirds and squirrels. Was that a splash sound just then? added Dean. Think so, said Emily. They reached the edge of the wood, stopping at a spot with a view of the river through the trees. Emily suddenly reached for her camera. She whispered, branch in the river. Dean raised his binoculars and whispered in reply, got it. A branch was caught in a stand of bulrush within the river. The tall leaves of the bulrush were waving back and forth as the water flowed past. The branch was stuck firm. A silvery fish lay exposed on the branch. A dark brown furry head was digging into the fish's limp body. Click! Emily started to speak. I think. The dark brown head suddenly rose up in the air to reveal an otterish nose, stiff white whiskers, sharp pointy teeth and a small light coloured lump held within the teeth. The otter angled its head upwards and gulped the lump down whole. Click! Click! Dean whispered. Wow! The otter looked around and dove its head back into the fish. Click! 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 Emily put her camera away. We're supposed to be doing a survey, but... Agreed. Emily raised her binoculars, joining Dean in watching the otter. Emily's binoculars changed their angle, aiming slightly higher. Far bank. A V-shaped wave was moving from the other side of the river, heading towards the branch. At the front of the wave was another otterish nose, closed shut as it forged its way through the water. The otter, already feeding from the fish, turned to look at the approaching swimmer. It didn't move aside, but equally didn't act aggressively as the second otter came alongside to join in feeding. More wow, whispered Dean. tuck a tuck a tee tuck 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 a tuck 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 Darford Warbler, whispered Emily. She lowered her binoculars. I think so. The song's very scratchy. Emily and Dean looked towards a small area of scrub where a small, grey and russet bird with a long tail was perched singing. Click! 
We can't actually put that in the report, said Emily, as she wrote in her notebook. It's the wrong habitat. It might be a vagrant. But the developers, said Dean, didn't mind setting up a fake local Facebook group. What do you mean? asked Emily. I, I probably shouldn't have said that, Dean paused. It's only a theory I've got. I'm not certain. It just seems very convenient to me how they were convinced so quickly by the idea of the new community centre. Plus, they're not very good at sending out emails. But what I mean is, shouldn't we be doing everything we can? I don't want to include it. I want to be scientific. OK. Well, perhaps we should include it, said Dean, and say Store Park may be an important dispersal migration habitat for Dartford Warblers. Remember the Dartford Warbler is on the IUCN list of threatened species. Maybe, Emily wrote in her notebook. I'm writing down dispersal migration habitat question mark. How many birds are we up to now? asked Dean. 53, not including Dartford Warbler or Garden Warbler. Shall we retrace our steps a bit and try to see the Garden Warbler? asked Dean. That's a way to know for sure. Emily glanced towards the otters. I, yes, the survey is the most important thing. An otter is on the list now. This river has to be in their territory, or they just wouldn't be here. Tuesday, the 26th of July. In the living room of Cheryl's flat, Emily, Abdul, Carl, Dean and Flory sat in a semicircle. Cheryl was ready to tell a story. Amber, Betty and Claire are walking through a forest. They are surrounded by giant trees reaching high into the sky. The swaddling bark of the trees is crisped and crossed with veins and cracks that split the surface, creating flakes of different sizes and shapes. Years of flake fall have created a spongy, bouncy walking surface beneath the trees. Suddenly, Amber stops and points towards a tree trunk. Look, she says, it's that squirrel again. It's really very inquisitive. I wonder why. How? asks Betty. Do you know that it is inquisitive? Claire looks at the squirrel, then at Amber, then at Betty. Perhaps all of you are inquisitive. Cheryl stood up and headed for the kitchen. Emily, Carl, Abdul, Florian, and Dean remained sat down. Wait, said Emily, is that it? Perhaps, said Abdul. For me, said Florrie, the story always carries on in my mind. They're now walking along the path, looking for somewhere to have a picnic. Perhaps Cheryl wants other people to start telling stories, said Kyle. Cheryl looked back from the kitchen. If you think it should be longer next week, you can always have a go yourself. No thanks, replied Emily. I like your stories usually. I just didn't like that one. Everyone can have an off day. Carl, Dean and Emily started pulling the table and chairs away from the wall. Flory headed for the kitchen. Abdul headed for the pile of bags. Abdul, said Carl, I think we're all desperate to hear the grant application news. The grant news, said Abdul, is that we've got a grant for the refurbishment of the community centre and another one for the purchase of the parkland. Yay! shouted Emily. And there's bad news, asked Dean gently. Sort of, said Abdul. The refurbishment grant for the community centre is only for 60% of the total costs, not as much as we were really hoping for. We have to fundraise the remaining 40% before the planning committee meeting next Monday, or we don't get that one at all. But obviously any grant is better than no grant, so fundamentally it's good news. But without the rest of the money, we don't get the grant. Schrodinger's cat is now revealed, and, unlike its quantum mechanical namesake, it is giving us a grey answer. I started Flory, and, continued Abdul, Abdul and Flory stopped and looked at each other. Cheryl spoke decisively from the direction of the kitchen. Let's all sit down, and we can take our time. Look at everything in the round. Everyone moved to sit at the table. Abdul put a folder down in front of him as he sat down. Abdul looked at Flory. After you. So, flustered Flory, it's just, well, I thought my job was to raise 10% of the community centre costs. 10%, repeated Abdul. Why? Sorry, carry on. And, continued Flory, I'm trying really hard, and I've got a big event planned for Saturday, but actually I'm not sure it'll even make 10% once I tried to raise money for the cats, and I hardly raised any at all. Abdul fiddled with his folder. Emily looked at Abdul's folder. Dean smiled reassuringly at Flory. Kyle looked at Cheryl. Cheryl broke the silence. Let's keep talking about the fundraising. Flory, how about you tell all the others what you told me, in particular the reason you're running just the one event? Yes, said Flory. Then, so, I got two books on fundraising from the library. Also, I talked to a friend who's done lots of fundraising. She said the same as the books. It's best to run one fundraising thing than ten. I mean, not if there are ten of you, although even then. Anyway, if there's just one of you, it's better to focus your energy. Flory took a breath. That's what both books said, and my friend. One of the books kept going on about having a way for people to donate more. If you just sell cups of tea and coffee for a fixed price, it's not good because you're limiting how much, how much people can give. But if you have a fixed price for the tea and coffee but offer biscuits for an extra donation, well, that's where you really make money. 
If people believe in the cause, they might pay a lot for the biscuits, like really a lot. Plus, some people like to donate a lot to show off. It's like doing a sponsored walk in disguise. At least, that's what the book said. She went quiet. This sounds great, said Carl. I can see you've really thought it all through. And cat dating is a very catchy idea. Cat dating, said Emily. That sounds good. It's called the Cat Date Cafe, said Florrie proudly. I've been going round all the local shops with posters. Even if they won't take a poster, it's still publicity because I get to talk to them. Maria says she's taken bookings already. And I was hoping, well, help would be good because the cats will need a lot of looking after. Then, said Cheryl, do you want me to help distribute posters? That would be great, said Florrie. And at the actual event on Saturday, I need volunteers to dress like waiters and waitresses. Although you'll be there to do cat care, not actual cafe jobs. They, I mean the cats, are going to be in cat carriers some of the time. And they'll have snacks throughout the day, so they don't try too much to steal food. So only wear clothes that you don't mind maybe being scratched. And well, I still need to sort a few things out, but I'll be ready for Saturday. I'm here to help with anything you need, says Cheryl, including on the day. And me, said Dean, although you knew that already. And me, said Carl. I'm in, said Abdul. I can't make it, said Emily. Abdul was tapping absentmindedly at his folder. Great work, Flory, said Cheryl. She turned to look at Abdul. And Abdul, let's hear more about the grants. And, continued Abdul, we've got 100% funding for the purchase of the park. Great. Wow. Nice one. Which, explained Abdul, is from the grant I found when we were at the library together, the obscure one in the book. It was actually relatively easy to get, but for complicated reasons, as I hinted in the library, the grant doesn't actually give us enough, even though there is no match funding arrangement. So, I'm saying 100%, but really it's 100% of a figure that is too small, and they've offered us barely more than one half of what the developers are intending to pay for the land. I think the trustees of the grant have failed to adjust it correctly for contemporaneous house prices, and it's all or nothing. You can't use it in partial payment for something more expensive, and there's no progress on any other grants for the park. Kyle looked at Dean and Emily. Then, have we found enough rare wildlife to devalue the land by half? Dean looked at Emily. Emily frowned. If you ask me, what we're finding is making the land worth more. We, we know, said Dean. You, you know what Carl means. And I know too, said Emily. But I'm not giving up now. We can keep looking. Are you off school now? asked Dean. Can we do extra survey days? I can't, replied Emily. I've got summer school this whole week. It even runs on Saturday. I booked it before I knew about this. Shall I do some extra surveying this week on my own? suggested Dean. Emily nodded. Yes, remember to take photographs and to write everything down. Yes, ma'am, replied Dean. Kyle looked at Cheryl and raised his eyebrows. Cheryl looked at Emily and Dean. Sorry, was that a yes or a no? A tentative yes, replied Dean. We think we can help make Abdul's Park grant work. If we can keep documenting more wildlife, he looked at Emily. Emily shrugged. I know what I'm going to say at the meeting. I've got an idea, said Carl. First, Abdul has done a great job. Without the grants, we'd really be nowhere. So, anyway, it's the fortnightly meeting of Long Lodge tomorrow evening. We sometimes have fundraising stores, and so I've reserved one for this week. I've never run one before, so I'm hoping I can call in some favours. In fact, it's never really a member running a stall anyway, which means this will be a novelty. And I want Dean to come along. It's pretty much only men at Long Lodge, and I know they'll think you're cool and probably want to show off and make a big donation. And anyway, if it's a good cause and it's local, I think a lot of them will want to help. And having you there with me will help to emphasise that. I think it will work. I think it will help us to reach the community centre target. Me, sighed Dean. What about the article in the paper? Seriously, said Carl, I wouldn't worry about that. Most of them, like me, don't trust a word they read in the newspaper. They'll like hearing your side of the story. It's a nice angle, I think. I'm not so sure, said Dean. I mean, I'm not regular at small talk. How many of us really are, said Carl. You'll be fine. We chat at lunch when you do my gardening. Actually, no, you won't be fine. You'll be great. Just be yourself. Long Lodge is basically a bunch of guys chatting awkwardly all evening as they eat nice food. If you're not very good at small talk, then you'll fit right in. Flory looked at Dean and smiled. Go on, Dean. I think you'll have fun. Yes, said Carl. Definitely, we're going to have fun. And don't eat beforehand, as the food is always fantastic. I'll pick you up from Flory's at half six tomorrow evening. Dean looked round the table. I'm not getting a choice, am I? Wednesday, the 27th of July. A large, wood-panelled entrance hall was lit by two ostentatious chandeliers. One wall was dominated by an enormous oil painting portrait of a man in a suit, a bronze plaque beneath, read Lord Lonk, 1872-1973. to 1973. 
The other walls had smaller portraits, some of which were paintings and some of which were photographs, each with its own smaller bronze plaque. From a massive door leading outside, a rug ran across the floor, split in two near the centre of the room, and continued onwards to two smaller doors at each side of the opposite interior wall. Kyle and Dean were stood behind a table, near where the carpet split, facing the outer door. Kyle was wearing an expensive-looking grey suit with a slight sheen. Dean was wearing dark trousers with a belt, a white shirt and a tie. On the table were photographs of Store Community Centre, Store Park and wildlife such as birds, butterflies and mammals. A smart-looking clipboard had a piece of paper with two empty columns labelled Name and Donation. Next to the clipboard was a pen. Kyle picked up the clipboard and pen. He started to write. There we go. That should get the ball rolling. Dean looked at what Kyle had written. Wow, that's a lot. I thought you said... I know. But remember, I'm allowed to make donations here and there, outside of my usual rule. And this is to encourage the others to be generous. The trick is to always have a high amount at the top of every page. If the first donation on the second page is low, we just put it to one side and start the per third page immediately. Same if we get a run of low amounts. OK, so I won't write a donation down then. Definitely not, said Carl. I mean, that's not your job tonight. Tonight's about getting some big donations in from... He looked towards the door. Let's get started. A stocky man in his late fifties was walking in. He had full ruddy cheeks and a broad smile. He wore a dark blue, generously tailored suit. Nigel, said Carl. Nigel headed towards the table. His smile broadened. Hello, Carl. How are you? He offered his hand forwards. I'm good, thanks, replied Carl, as he shook Nigel's hand. How are you? Can't complain, said Nigel. Can't complain. Carl indicated towards Dean. This is Dean. Hello, Dean. Nigel offered his hand. Dean and Nigel shook hands. Good evening, Nigel, said Dean. Nigel looked towards the photographs on the table. It's a beautiful spot in town, isn't it, said Dean. He picked up a photograph of an otter. I was there on Sunday watching this otter feeding on the river. Hmm, said Nigel. What's this stall about, then? It's a chance, laughed Carl, to lighten that heavy wallet of yours. We need donations, or Capital Flight Investments are going to use Store Park to bolster their residential property portfolio. Well, not directly. They're up to various planning permission shenanigans, and we're fundraising to protect the community centre, and by extension the park. If this works out, the community centre will be completely renovated, and the park will become a community asset in perpetuity, with full protection from development forever. Are they local? asked Nigel. They're based in London, said Carl. Nigel raised an eyebrow, and I bet they're going to let us build on Hyde Park in return. How do I sign up? Carl indicated towards the clipboard and pen. You can sign up here. He reached down and produced a small piece of paper from under the table. And you can use this slip of paper for your confidential information. Nigel picked up the clipboard and looked at it. Very generous, Carl. I'm sure I can match that. Thank you, said Dean. Nigel took the slip of paper, picked up the pen and started to write. So, Dean, I've not seen you before. Carl invited me to come along tonight, said Dean. I'm helping survey the park so we can demonstrate its value for wildlife and hopefully that will stop them from building on it. If Dean and Emily's survey is a success, added Carl, then it makes it harder to get the planning permission and then it's easier for us to outbid capital fly investments. So you're an ecologist? Nigel put the clipboard and pen back down on the table and handed the smaller piece of paper back to Carl. A tall man in a dark suit came in through the door. Carl waved him over. No, replied Dean, I'm actually ex-Navy and ex-Army and now I'm working as a gardener. Navy, said the new arrival, as he walked up to the table. Nice to meet you. My name's Colin. I used to be the captain of a frigate. Retired for a while now, and you were? My name is Dean, sir. I used to be a marine. Colin proffered his hand. Dean reached out and shook it. We're all lonkers here tonight, said Colin, so you can call me Colin, and not sir. Dean glanced at Carl, as though momentarily lost in thought. They're fundraising for Store Park, said Nigel, as he pushed the clipboard and pen towards Colin. Donations welcome. Colin looked at Dean. I thought I recognised you from somewhere, Dean. Weren't you in the newspaper? They said you were... Colin paused. You don't look like... I take it the newspaper was distorting the truth somewhat. Dean looked down at the floor. Carl spoke up. Yes, they were. I think Dean's too nice to defend himself, but he was constantly de-escalating the situation and only acted in self-defence. Just like a well-trained Marine should, said Colin, as he picked up the clipboard and pen and started to write. And anyway, Dean, I never believe anything I read in the newspapers. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir, said Dean. Kyle caught Dean's eye and winked. A hum of talking, clicking of cutlery and tapping of waiters' footsteps filled the hall. It was decorated similarly to the entrance hall. Nine circular tables were laid out in an irregular yet neat pattern, with five or six smartly dressed men and the occasional woman sat round each of them. 
Dean leant to his right slightly. A waiter reached in from Dean's left and placed a small plate in front of him. The plate had a circular pattern of identically sized mushrooms and miniature toasted rolls with, in the centre, a neatly cut slice of pate. Wow, said Dean, this is impressive. I think I'll copy this idea and try it out on Flory. Flory, asked Nigel, who was sat next to him. We met at a social group at the community centre, said Dean. It's also where I met Carl, and, well, and Kyle, continued Dean's sentence for him. Dean's no longer homeless. He's moved into Flory's house. This is great news. Nigel peered at Dean. Yes? Carl answered for Dean. It's not official yet, by which I mean we all know that Dean and Flory haven't announced it yet. But we're all very pleased for them. Dean looked up. Hi. Yes. It's nice to have a roof over my head, although it's a bit odd being stuck in one place. And you know the nicest thing which I never expected? Talking to someone every day. I was scared of that, but it's quite nice actually. So, are you worried about being stuck in one place? asked Nigel. Actually, said Dean, Flory's interested in travel just like I am, so it's fine. We're thinking of going on a little holiday around Europe this winter. Flory wants to go to Spain, and I love France, and have some places I'd like to share with her, so we're going to combine them into one trip. I've got the gardening now, but work will be quieter in the winter. That sounds good. Nigel looked at Kyle. Talking of gardening, how's your new gardener doing? Kyle laughed. You can ask him directly if you like. Kyle's blue Aston Martin was purring its way along a country road. The two headlights shone at fractionally different angles, illuminating the road ahead and the hedges to each side. Kyle was in the driver's seat and Dean was in the passenger seat. Dean was looking at the clipboard in his lap. How did we do? asked Carl. We've managed just over 29% of the total, meaning Flory now has to raise just slightly over 10%, which is still a lot to be honest. I think this sounds very promising, said Carl. And that assumes everyone pays up, added Dean. I'm sure they will. Long Lodge isn't that big, and it would be embarrassing not to, and it's never been a problem before. Carl paused, and cat dating sounds like a catchy idea. I think it could make up the rest. It's definitely a catchy idea, said Dean. Carl groaned. Sorry, that was accidental. Clawful puns aside. Thanks for your help this evening. It was good to have someone else to keep the conversation flowing and loosen everyone else's purse strings. Thanks, it was pretty clawsome tonight. I enjoyed it, but I'm not sure I'd want to go every fortnight. You've got to find your own thing, but if you want to be my plus one occasionally, just let me know. Thanks, said Dean. Thursday, the 28th of June. Dean was kneeling within a curved flower bed within the lawn. A massive green garden waste bag, about twice the size of a wheelbarrow, sat on the grass nearby. In the distance, a rabbit sat watching. Is now a good time for a break? Carl's voice came from behind Dean. Dean turned to look. Carl was setting up two deck chairs. Sounds good to me. Dean stood up and threw a handful of weeds into the green bag. Dean walked over to the large green bag and retrieved a small bag from inside. The rabbit meandered casually across the grass. Carl laughed. Where's your pet wheelbarrow? I'm having a weed day. Dean sat down in the second deck chair. And the wheelbarrow just isn't big enough. You do work hard, Dean. Carl passed Dean a packet of crisps. I might start paying you a bit more. We should look at what the going rate is for a gardener. You don't have to. I know I don't have to, said Carl, but we're friends and that means I don't want either of us taking advantage of the other. I want to pay a fair rate. If it turns out you're paying me too much, we can drop it a bit. Deal. I had a question, said Dean. I've not seen any new people at Power of Us since I started. Didn't someone, probably Abdul, say there's a new person on average every couple of weeks? Well, it's always quiet in the summer. Our theory is people are out enjoying the evening sun, going on holiday, visiting the beach, that sort of thing. Then there's nearly always a rush of new people in September. I bring my older board games in September, and January too, so my nice ones don't get trashed. I suppose it also doesn't help that it's running at Cheryl's at the moment. Probably not, agreed Carl. They sat eating. A robin flew down onto the flower bed, pecked at the ground and flew off. The rabbit was grazing casually on the grass, drifting closer. That rabbit, said Dean, has been around most of the morning. Don't tell Florrie, laughed Carl, or she might try to adopt it. Dean laughed. Actually, she only seems to adopt animals that are homeless, and these rabbits have a burrow over by the woodland area. There's been a burrow there for years, so I guess they're safe. Yes. Unlike, Carl laughed, you. Do? Dean fell silent. Carl looked to Dean. Hey, Dean, it was just a joke. It's all good. Oh. Talking of which, continued Carl, do you want to come over for dinner tonight, you and Flory? Nigel's coming over with his wife, and they suggested, well, insisted actually, that you both join us. It was very specific. I was supposed to have checked with you already, but I thought I'd just ask you now. Nigel is obsessed with cooking, and he's bringing lots of nice food. That sounds nice, if you're sure. Carl nodded. 
We were going to have a quiet night in, said Dean, but I'm sure Flory would like to come. He got out his phone, tapped at the screen and lifted it to his ear. The rabbit began moving decisively towards the massive green bag. Hi, Flory, Dean paused and listened. Yeah, so Kyle has invited us over for dinner. Should I say yes? Dean paused, listened, nodded. OK, just a second. He looked at Carl. Flory is asking what time. Seven o'clock, said Carl loudly. Hello, Flory, by the way. The rabbit turned in a panic and sprinted away in the direction of the woodland. Flory says hello back and... Dean paused, listen. And she says yes to dinner and... And she's asking if we should bring anything. Just yourselves, shouted Carl. See you later, Flory. Thursday, the 28th of July. Evening. Five people sat eating at the dinner table. Partly emptied serving plates of the remains of roasted squash, two quiches, steamed vegetables, squares of pâté, roasted vegetable spirals and quinoa. The room itself was spacious, with one wall home to long shelves crammed with hundreds of board games and the other walls decorated with paintings of mainly cars and aircraft. Kyle and Nigel laughed conspiratorially. Dean smirked. Flurry looked at a woman who was sat next to Nigel. Sorry, Laura, apologised Nigel. Boys in their toy cars, sighed Laura. Is it a nice colour? That's all I need to know. Laura looked at Dean. Dean, you into cars? I'm afraid I am, replied Dean. Although I don't have a car right now, I walk everywhere and catch the bus. I'm trying to save money. Yes, added Flory. This winter we're planning to... Ting, ting. Can I answer your door? asked Nigel as he stood up. Carl laughed. Feel free. After organising a meal at my house, inviting the guests and cooking all the food, you can now open my front door. Nigel disappeared into the hallway. The sound of the front door opening was followed by footsteps crunching on gravel. Come on. Laura looked at Dean and Flurry encouragingly. Let's go and see what's happening. Laura, Flurry, Dean and Kyle headed into the hallway. This is mysterious, said Flurry. Just keep going, said Laura. All will become clear. They walked out of the front door and stood on the gravel, looking out over the driveway. They walked out of the front door and stood on the gravel, looking out over the driveway. A massive flatbed truck was parked up. An old motorhome was sat on the bed of the truck with its rear end hanging slightly off the back. The truck had left enough space behind it for the motorhome to roll onto the gravel. A motorhome, said Carl. The bed of the truck with the motorhome on top of it shuddered. The bed began to slide backwards and tip upwards. It was repositioning so that the motorhome would more easily roll backwards onto the driveway. The motorhome stuttered on its suspension, suddenly slipping backwards a couple of inches and coming to a juddering stop, poised, ready to roll further. Well done, that's perfect, shouted Nigel, from where he stood off to the side of the truck. Click, 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 click. The bed of the truck remained stationary, and the motorhome began rolling slowly backwards off it. As the motorhome headed for the gravel with its rear two wheels touching down, a chain came into view. The chain was unwinding from a winch behind the cab of the truck. Dean, Carl and Flory watched the motorhome. Laura smiled as she watched Flory and Dean's faces. Nigel looked towards the others. What do you think? A motorhome, said Carl. Is being unloaded onto my driveway. It's nice, whistled Dean. See, Laura called out to Nigel. I told you he'd like it. She looked at Flory. And Flory, what do you think? Flory spoke tentatively. It looks great. Nigel called out. It's yours, Dean. We'd like you to have it. But, said Dean, I can't. It must be worth a fortune. It's old, said Nigel, at least compared to the ones I sell. And some of the ones I sell cost more than the price of a small house. Whereas this one, well, it's not as bad as it looks, actually. We took it in part exchange when someone spent an eye-watering amount of money on a new one, although I should warn you that the engine is dead and crunch, squeak. The front wheels thudded onto the ground, completing the motorhome's journey onto the driveway. The motorhome quivered as a squeak came from somewhere underneath. Someone jumped out of the motorhome's driver's side door and disappeared round the front of the motorhome. That's a Fiat Ducato, and they have really reliable engines, said Dean. At least they're usually fixable if you know what you're doing. In the army, I used to keep much older and less reliable vehicles on the road than this. I'm happy to fix it up for you, and you could sell it on. You fixing it up sounds like an excellent idea, said Nigel, and me selling it on sounds like an awful idea. This is never going anywhere near one of my show homes again. In business, you have to focus on what makes you profit, and something like this is effectively a distraction costing my business money. I normally just sell them on eBay for pennies, which is a faff in itself, and anyway, please take this off my hands, and you'll be doing me a favour. You better stop arguing and say thank you, said Carl. Nigel obviously wants you to have this, and just for the record, I didn't know this was going to happen. I'm hoping Nigel doesn't make a habit of dumping unwanted vehicles on my drive. Nigel laughed. Now there's an idea. It's not unwanted, squealed Flurry. She paused and looked at Dean. Dean nodded in reply. It's perfect for our winter holiday. Flurry grabbed Laura and gave her a hug. Laura hugged Flurry in return. Fantastic. 
Dean gave a thumbs up towards Nigel. Nigel gave a nod in reply. Laura and Flory unwrapped from their hug. And I need your phone number, said Laura, for my regular WhatsApp photo updates of your motorhome adventure. Of course, Flory pulled out her phone and started tapping at the screen. The man reappeared from the front of the motorhome. Nigel, are we ready to go? We've left all the parts and consumables in the rear. Of course, said Nigel, come in tomorrow or late if you want, or take overtime. Thanks, boss. The man thumped on the back of the truck cab. Shkur clack, skur clack, skur clack. A metallic scraping sound and a clacking sound marked the passage of the chain as it began dragging across the bed of the truck and winding back onto the winch. Wow, this is fantastic, said Dean. At least let me pay for the spare parts it sounds like you've given me. No, said Nigel. But how about you owe me a couple of days gardening and I'll cash that in sometime. Deal, said Dean. I can do a pro project for you or something. Can we see inside, asked Flory. Come on. Laura led the way. There were a couple of them and I picked this one because I thought the living area had more potential. I didn't worry about the colour on this occasion. Dean, said Carl quietly. Joking aside, I'm happy for you to leave it here as long as you need. How about in return you keep quiet about the name for a Lonk Lodge member? Flory stifled a laugh, and Laura sniggered. I think it's a bit late for that, Carl, said Laura, as she opened a door in the back of the motorhome. home. Ta-da! What do you think? On the floor of the living area lay a heap of small and medium-sized cardboard boxes. Along the wall opposite was a small kitchen with an oven, fridge and sink. Towards the front was a bench-like sofa on each side. Toward the back were two beds and a small cubicle with a door. This looks great, said Flory. Couple of cushions here, lick of paint there. Could soon look, as if she looked at Dean. If you'd like my help. Of course, said Dean. I feel like it's going to be our motorhome. He looked at Carl. Would you be okay with me actually leaving the garden for a couple of months this winter? I'm thinking we could go away for longer if we've got this. Carl nodded. Of course. The garden pretty much hibernates in winter. Saturday, the 30th of July. The sky was bright blue, and the sun shone down on store munchies. Kyle and Dean were moving a table into position at the front of the cafe. Abdul and Cheryl were arranging chairs. Flory and a teenage girl were knelt by the A-frame blackboard, adding finishing touches to the words Cat Date Cafe and a cartoon picture of a smiling cat. Everyone was dressed smartly, like a waiter or waitress. Maria appeared from within the cafe and joined the others. So, I need to get started in the kitchen. Shall we talk through the plan? A circular huddle formed. Maria looked at Flory. Flory looked at Maria. We're almost fully booked, yes? Yes, said Maria. The available cat dates are almost fully booked, and the rest of the tables are available for normal customers on a drop-in basis, as usual. You'll see that all the cat date tables have reserved signs on them. Flory looked at the teenage girl. Olivia, you're the other professional here. If Maria is busy in the kitchen, can we ask you for help? Olivia nodded and gave a big smile. Flory pointed towards a row of pet carriers inside the cafe. I've handpicked nine feline assistants for the day who are not likely to run away and who, if they do, have good road smarts and they're all lap friendly. Each has their name on their basket and on their collar so you can introduce them to their dates and you know where to put them back afterwards and only take them to an outside table if there is a blue tag saying outside on their carrier. Can you explain the date thing again, said Carl. They really are dates, said Flory, and as I think most of you know I'm not really a crazy cat lady, Dean coughed. Because, continued Flory, I'm always trying to find homes for the cats I rescue. However much I might fall in love with them, eventually I know they're going to find a new home. So as well as being a fundraiser, this is a chance for these nine cats to find loving new homes. Which, added Maria, adds to the charm of the event. Won't we steadily run out of cats through the day? asked Carl. I mean, we could run out of cats too early, and so what do we do then? Do we... sorry, I guess you've thought of this. All nine cats are staying here all day, explained Flory. If they are matched, then you'll know because there will be a green match tag on their carrier with the name of the new owner. But that doesn't mean they can't be a cute dinner companion for someone else later in the day. Just explain there are more cats in my house. Tell them they should impress the cat they're about to spend time with because perhaps they will be telling their cat friends when they get home. And then maybe another cat will be interested and get in contact with them. Well, sort of. Something cute like that anyway. But obviously, to avoid disappointment, you have to make it clear if a cat is already matched. So look for the green tags. That makes sense, said Olivia. This all sounds great, said Carl. Can you help me with one more question? I thought cats had minds of their own. How do we know they won't just go running around or start stealing food? That would normally be a risk, agreed Flory. We're just lucky a lot of the cats I have at the moment are suitable. Nine of them, to be exact. Flory has had me helping, explained Dean. We've been testing them out in similar scenarios at home. And all these eight, or is it nine, sorry, lays around more during the day, like being petted and don't beg too much for food from the table. Remember to push the idea of adoption, said Flory. I've got a stack of leaflets about how many cats are waiting for homes at rescue centres, with details of some local ones. This is a chance to educate people as well. 
There are so many cats out there looking for a good home. Tickles three, asked Dean casually. Isn't here today, is she? Of course she is, replied Flurry. She's so adorable. I'm sure she'll have plenty of offers. That is good, said Dean. I'm sure that would make Tickles three really happy. Three cats will always be resting in their carriers, continued Flurry. At least. There's a rotor on a clipboard by the carriers, though actually, sorry, I'll be in charge of the carriers and the off-duty cats, so a lot of what I just said wasn't necessary. But anyway, finally, remember the cats aren't toys. They're animals with feelings. Oh, and I've got dry food for them so they don't get too hungry, and please, they're not to be given human food. Shall I explain about the fundraising, suggested Maria. Yes, please, said Flurry. I'm going to collect the money in the usual way, explained Maria. I mean the usual way we do here at Store Munchies. Then, at the end of the day, I'll be transferring it all to the Long Lodge Fund. Everything has to go through the till, and if you get a cash tip, put it through the till as well. But I thought, started Flurry. I've decided, said Maria firmly, that all the money is going to go to the community centre fund, and Olivia has insisted we add the tips to the fundraising as well. We think we can make the target, and so we want to help. Personally, I enjoy running a cafe right next to a park, and so, if only for selfish reasons, I want to make every penny go towards trying to save it. Olivia nodded in agreement. That's fantastic, said Carl. And the menu is the same as usual, continued Maria. And remember the voluntary donation. This is really important. We're going to ask people to pay for the cats. They were they were a paying customer at the cafe. Maria looked at Flory. Make a big joke of it, explained Flory. Say how the cats are eating lots of cat biscuits. Say they're very expensive dates. And explain how the money is going to a really good cause. Don't get drawn on how much they should give, however hard they push. But you could mention the amount we're still trying to raise, as that might encourage big donations. And, Maria pointed across the road at two women approaching across the park. I think these might be our first two customers. Sorry, one last thing, asked Carl quickly. What if someone isn't here for the cat dating? Then it's business as usual, replied Maria. But never give them one of the reserve tables, and remember their money is still being added towards the fundraising. Olivia and I will deal with the non-date customers, although the rest of you can help out with them if you wish. I'll double check the reserve signs, said Olivia. Maria and Olivia headed inside. Flory stood and looked towards the approaching couple. The others stood behind Flory. The two women crossed the road and stopped. Olivia appeared next to Flory and handed her a clipboard. Thanks, Olivia. Flory took the clipboard and looked at the top page. The two women came towards Flory. We're Lila and Jasmine. We're here to meet Smudge. That's fantastic, said Flory, and I've got you sitting inside, as Smudge is a bit of an indoor cat. A queue of twenty or so people were lined up on the pavement leading to store munchies. The angle of the sun showed it was early afternoon. Almost all the tables were occupied with Dean, Kyle, Olivia and Abdul waitering and waitressing. Flory was attending to the cat carriers. Cheryl was stood at the front of the queue of people with a clipboard. If you've made a reservation for a cat date, said Cheryl clearly and loudly, you can come to the front. A young girl, a man and a woman stepped out from the back of the queue and headed for the front. Cheryl smiled and encouraged them on. She looked around and caught Abdul's eye. Abdul, do you want to come and help these three with their reservation? Abdul nodded and walked over. Good afternoon. Can I take your names? And who are you here to meet? We're here to meet Bubbles, said the little girl. Ah, said Abdul. Bubbles is a good friend of mine. She's very friendly. And your name is? The reservation is in my name, said the woman, Sally Wilson. Then let me show your good selves, the Wilson family, to your table, and I will personally let Bubbles know you've arrived. Cheryl looked around and caught Dean's eye. She waved him over. How's it going? asked Cheryl as Dean approached. Good, I think, replied Dean. The cats are behaving themselves very well, for cats. And um, with all of us waiting tables and helping, it's pretty much under control. But I mean, they are cats. Is Flory over by the cat carriers? asked Cheryl. Yes, replied Dean. She said that if you weren't too busy, and if the queue got too long, I should send you out into the park with Tickles 3 and run a cat playtime. We've plenty of reservations for this afternoon, and we don't think there will be enough spare tables. Tickles 3 has had a diary blocked out this afternoon for just this contingency. Cheryl indicated towards the queue. A woman at the front of the queue interrupted. That sounds like a great idea. She looked down at a boy stood next to her. Jack, what do you think? Yes, please, said Jack. So, Dean, said Cheryl, if you can ask Flory for Tickles 3, and she has a couple of toys to give you, and a donations box as well. A refreshing cooling of the air was marking the arrival of late afternoon. Dean was crossing the road from the direction of the park towards store munchies. Tickles 3 was snuggled up in the nook of his right arm. In his left hand was the donations box. Hanging from a pocket were two cat toys. Only two customers remained at store munchies, and they were sat outside, each with a cat purring in their lap. The only other person outside was Cheryl, who was sat at an empty table. Everyone else was inside. Hello, Dean. Colin gave Dean a salute. 
The cat in Colin's lap purred softly. Sir! Dean gave a smartish salute, despite being encumbered. Sorry, I mean Colin. Good to see you. Mrs. Ying, my wife. Colin indicated towards the woman sharing the table with him. Good afternoon, Dean, said Ying. Nice to meet you, Ying, said Dean. Colin laughed. I hear that you were helping Tickles 3 with cat playtime in the park. That's exactly what was happening. Dean laughed in reply. Although she did eventually get tired of chasing after the toys, and then the cat selfie started. And now it seems to be nap time. A paw reached up from Colin's lap and tapped to his arm. Colin reached down and started to stroke. This one seems to think it's permanently cuddle time. Whereas, said Dean, Tickles 3 somehow seems to be all cuddled out. I'm going to return her to a carrier basket so she can chill. Does she mind being in a carrier, asked Ying. Florrie is a true cat whisperer, said Dean. Regarding cat carriers, she has them open in the house all the time and often hides treats in them. Most of the cats voluntarily go into their carriers to sleep sometimes. That's interesting, said Ying, as she looked down into her lap and smiled. Dean walked towards the indoor part of the cafe. The door opened as he approached. Come in, said Florrie, reaching her arms out. Let me take Tickles 3. Tickles 3 allowed herself to be transferred, and Florrie headed towards the carriers. Dean glanced casually over towards Tickle 3's carrier. The door was hanging open. Florrie reached to place Tickles 3 inside. On the way in, Tickles 3 playfully poured at a green match tag hanging above the door. Green tags were hanging from all the other carriers as well. Dean looked away and walked towards Maria, who was stood by the till. Maria looked up as Dean approached. Are you all right, Dean? Yes, fine, said Dean. I hear the donations I collected with Tickles 3 in the park. She... He stopped talking. He put down the donations box and headed towards the door. Thanks, Dean, said Maria. Dean walked out of the door. Cheryl was sat outside. She looked up at Dean and raised her hand in a simple greeting. Hello, Dean. Well, wasn't that a long day? Yes, said Dean, as he wandered through the tables, drifting away from Cheryl. He stopped and looked out towards the park. A scattering of white fluffy clouds were moving through the sky. The tops of the trees swished gently in the wind. Glimpses of movement and wisps of noise gave the park a gentle energy as people, dogs, birds, squirrels and other creatures walked, chatted, chased, scavenged and did other things. Dean sat down at one of the empty tables. Florrie and Olivia came out of the cafe and headed towards Colin and Ying. How are you doing? asked Florrie. Can I get you anything else? No, thank you, replied Colin. I can see you're closing. Perhaps we could pay the bill? Of course. Olivia handed over a payment terminal. Now, of course, the cats are denoting their time specifically to raise money for the community centre refurbishment. They're both helping you might tip generously to help reach the total. Florrie smiled. Colin tapped at the payment terminal. I'm sure we can do that. Suddenly, the cafe door burst open and Maria appeared, holding a stack of bits of paper. We made it, she cried. Everyone turned to look. That's great, said Cheryl. Well done, all of you, said Colin. Florrie was looking at Maria, with something resembling anxiety on her face. Um, I just had a thought. Did I give you the updated target? Maria paused. You updated me on Monday. Carl, Abdul and Olivia joined Maria in the doorway. Monday, repeated Florrie. Yes, Monday, repeated Maria. It's changed, said Florrie. We actually need a bit more. Abdul said that, and then Carl and Dean managed, so it's not changed much, just, um... Florrie looked at Abdul. How much are you sure, asked Colin. Abdul attracted more and more glances, until everyone was looking at him. I think, said Abdul, as he looked at the pieces of paper Maria was holding. In that case, so, hmm, we'd have needed to, approximately... Maria was adjusting the bits of paper so that Abdul could read them better. We'd have needed seven, no, eight-ish more customers. That would have been enough. How about, Colin motioned for Abdul to come over. You help me work out how much to tip so we can make up the difference. Abdul joined Olivia at Colin's table. He looked at the payment terminal and pointed towards two numbers on the screen. If you swap over the position of those two numbers and add a two at the start, then that's exactly right. Colin looked at Olivia. Does this button, he pointed at a yellow button, let me change it. Olivia nodded, yes. Colin pressed the yellow button and tapped at the screen. And there we go. He handed the payment terminal to Olivia. Now we really have done it. Hooray, said Cheryl. Thank you, Colin. And Florrie, well done. And thank you, Maria. And well done, everyone. Yes, said Ying. Good work, everyone. Florrie looked across to where Dean was sat on his own, not joining in with the celebrations. Oh no, she said quietly to herself. I forgot. She disappeared back inside the cafe. Do you want a hand tidying up? asked Colin. We're good, thanks, said Maria. There's plenty of us, and uh, not much left to do, but thank you for the offer. Colin and Ying stood up, lifting two reluctant cats up with them. Abdul took the cat from Colin. Kyle accepted the cat from Ying. Florrie reappeared from inside the cafe and headed towards Dean. Dean, said Florrie, as she approached his table. If you're... I'm fine, interrupted Dean. 
I'm happy that we made the total. I'm happy that so many cats found a good home. But Dean, said Florrie, Tickle's three years is, interrupted Dean, going to a loving, permanent home where she can be loved and cared for. I know, I'm happy for her, obviously. It's just, I'm fine. I'm sorry, Dean. I meant to tell you before. I know how much... Please, interrupted Dean. Just give me a couple more minutes. You're you're more used to this than I am. You've done an amazing thing today, and I'm so proud of you, and I just, just need a couple more. Florrie was sliding a green tag along the table into Dean's eye line. Dean's eyes focused on the green tag. Oh. Florrie hugged Dean from behind. Dean reached up and hugged Florrie awkwardly in return. He was smiling and a tear was rolling down one cheek. Why didn't you tell me? I, I meant to, Dean. I'm sorry. I only thought to do it this morning. When I saw your reaction to the idea Tickles 3 might have a new home. So I quickly wrote your name on a match tag and put it on her carrier. And then I meant to tell you, but we've just been so busy I forgot. Sunday, the 31st of July. Dawn was rising over Store Park. Dean and Emily were crouched next to a fallen tree in the woodland, fairly close to the river bank. Dean pointed at a pile of logs, with bramble growing over it, and whispered, That's where I saw a woodmouse. Wednesday. No photo. Emily whispered, OK. Tick, 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 tick. A patter of something was impacting on the forest floor. Emily looked upwards. In the canopy, a squirrel was nibbling on a pine cone. Swish, swash, crinkle. In one spot, the leaf litter was moving and crinkling. Dean peered through the trees. On the forest floor, a blackbird was sweeping aside leaves with its beak, occasionally stopping to eat an insect or a worm. Plit. The faintest of new sounds joined the forest soundscape. Emily looked towards the pile of logs. She whispered, almost inaudibly, Mouse! Log! She raised her camera. A wood mouse was sat on top of the log. Click! The mouse's large rounded ears twitched and it scurried out of sight. Emily put the camera away in her shoulder bag and gave Dean a thumbs up. Dean was looking through his binoculars towards a patch of grass amidst the trees near the river. A smallish brownish something was within the grass. It moved. Dean whispered questioningly. What of all? Emily pulled out her camera and aimed it towards the grass. The grass shifted slightly and around his face, with a dark nose, appeared. Click. Emily whispered. Agreed. Water vole. Click, click. Emily put her camera away and raised her binoculars. I didn't know water vole were here. Nor me. Dean adjusted the focus of his binoculars. I guess this is our reward for really getting to know the place. I don't think I'd normally be able to pick out quite so many of the sounds. The water vole took a few steps and stopped to investigate a temptingly green emergent blade of grass. It positioned the blade of grass between its two front paws and started to chew rapidly, causing its whiskers to vibrate. So cute, whispered Emily. How was summer school yesterday, whispered Dean, as he continued to watch the water vole. Fine, replied Emily, and Florrie raised the rest of the money and all the cats were adopted, right? Yes to the money, and yes to all but one of the cats, and that was only because Florrie decided not to let Tickles 3 be adopted. Oh, your cat? Of course not. My, whispered Dean, so that hardly counts. Why was Tickles 3 even there? What do you... Sounds good, anyway, said Emily. If people are adopting cats that need a home, I like that. I just don't like how some people breed more cats, when some still need homes, and really, I don't like how they eat birds and water voles and... The water vole suddenly sprinted away. It bounded through the undergrowth and leapt into the water. Splash! Emily and Dean started to look around. Dean raised his binoculars and began scanning along the river. See something? asked Emily. No, I'm just... Ugh, it's a dog. Dean lowered his binoculars. I'm surprised there are any water voles with all the dogs that come into the park. Added to which, there'll be cats coming in to hunt as well. Even if it doesn't get caught, it'll be constantly having to run off and hide. Perhaps this one's found a safer spot here in the woodland. So what's next? Emily stood up. Butterflies. Apparently they can be difficult to mitigate. She sighed exaggeratedly. They walked down a brown, crumbly path through the woodland. The path approached the edge of the trees at the same time as the understory thickened with tangly bramble and other plants. Here, said Emily, indicating a patch of grass just beyond the woodland, near a flowering section of bramble. I've got my breakfast. We can sit and wait for the butterflies. She paused and looked at Dean, focusing towards his back. Oh, wait. Do you want some? It's OK. I've got something to eat, too. I thought it might be a long day. Emily was staring at Dean. You look funny without your rucksack. It confuses me, and sometimes I think it's still there, even though it isn't. They sat down. Dean took a brown paper bag out of his pocket. He opened it to reveal a homemade sandwich made with seeded bread. Emily stared at the sandwich. She stared at Dean's trousers, which looked new. She stared at Dean's hair, which looked neatly, recently trimmed. Dean stared at Emily. Aren't you supposed to be looking for butterflies? The 
The sun was just over halfway between the horizon and the highest point in the sky. The park was alive with walkers talking, joggers wheezing, dogs barking, birds singing. Emily and Dean sat in front of the flowering bramble, watching butterflies. Dean was talking. Over here I've got small heath, small white, green veined white. You sure it's small white? Pretty sure. Another blue, squealed Emily. A butterfly with deep blue wings landed on a yellow flower. Click! The butterfly had a white border to its vibrant blue wings, with small black lines reaching across the white. Adonis blue, said Emily. The colour's wrong for common blue. Too vibrant, agreed Dean. Plus the black lines along the edge are characteristic. That's... Emily looked down and wrote in her notebook. 32 species of butterfly. Plus we're at 78 species of bird and 8 species of mammal. And 6 species of fungi, added Dean. And 160 species of plant, added Emily. Well done, Emily, said Dean. Are we stopping now? The park's getting busy, and the butterflies are quite flighty now, and I need to finish the report. Yes. Do you want a hand? You don't have to, said Emily, packing her binoculars away and standing up. I can do it. I know I don't have to, but I've kept the whole day free. I can help if you want, otherwise I'll go and do some more work on my motorhome. Emily started walking towards the road. We need to add what we've seen today, then we can check it all. Then let's do that. We need this as good as we can make it so we can convince the planning committee meeting not to give planning permission. Well, actually, that's not it, is it? We're trying to make it so that Sebastian's planning permission has too many mitigation requirements attached, meaning the developers won't want to buy it off him because they won't make a profit, meaning we can afford to buy it with our grant. But you know, I'm still not sure this will work. Although I think Cheryl's up to something. She mentioned something about seeing Sebastian before the meeting. Cheryl told me to add nice photographs to the report, said Emily. And she said to make it more emotional. Then I told her that's not very scientific. Then she sent me a link that says scientists tailor their writing to their audience. It's simple, actually. You just put some of the science stuff in appendices. Appendices are like extra chapters at the end of the book. And she's calling me later. Intriguing, said Dean. Are you going to live in your motorhome? asked Emily. I thought you were living at Florrie's now. Both are true. Flora and I are going around Europe in it this winter, and thereby taking a break from living in her house. What about the cats? She's training up Abdul, explained Dean. He'll be taking care of them while we're away, and in return he continues to have somewhere quiet to study. Monday, the 1st of August A plain white corridor ran into the distance, with doors at regular intervals, and the occasional bench set against the wall. Cheryl, Emily, Dean, Florrie, Abdul and Carl stood next to a pair of double doors that led into a large auditorium. Within the auditorium, four people sat at the front on a low stage and approximately 25 people were sat in the many rows of seats. Approaching along the corridor came a middle-aged man in brown trousers and a tweed jacket. He was being followed by a young woman in a grey suit and an older man in a charcoal suit. Cheryl glanced at Emily and mouthed, Are you ready? Emily nodded in reply. The man in the tweed jacket slowed down. Miss Hartwright? Cheryl stepped forwards and offered her hand. Mr Leverson Gower? The man in the tweed jacket shook hands with Cheryl. Yes, and please call me Sebastian. Cheryl indicated towards Emily. This is Emily, the young girl I told you about. Hello, Emily. Sebastian indicated towards the bench. Shall we sit down? OK, said Emily. Sebastian and Emily sat down on the bench. The others waited nearby. Emily looked down at some pieces of paper in her lap and started to read. Many people think of the park as a place to walk their dogs, meet their friends, go jogging or have a picnic. If you come to the park at the weekend, it is very busy. She paused. But it's not just busy with people, it's busy with wildlife too. She moved a piece of paper to show Sebastian. This is a map of the park. Sebastian looked at the map. And, said Emily, this gives us a minimum of 173 species of plant, 78 species of bird, 32 species of butterfly, and 8 species of mammal. The cost of mitigation would be very high. Store Park is part of a wildlife corridor that runs all along the Stour River, as evidenced by the otters, little egrets, water voles, and Dartford warbler. This is almost impossible to mitigate and make sure planning permission, even Sebastian held up a hand. Stop, please. You've all done an incredible job, but... Sir, the young woman in the grey suit interrupted him. The meeting is about to start. Sebastian nodded. He stood up and moved towards the auditorium. Emily stared at the bits of paper in her lap. Dean opened his mouth, closed it again. Carl was watching Sebastian. Florrie sighed. Abdul looked at Cheryl questioningly. 
Cheryl walked over to Emily and placed her hand on her shoulder. Emily, remember, we're still... Sebastian stopped in the doorway. He spoke to the young woman in the grey suit. Can you go and explain that I need five more minutes? Sir, replied the young woman, I'm not sure that's a good idea to make them wait on me. Sebastian indicated for her to continue into the auditorium without him. She disappeared into the auditorium. Sebastian turned to look at Emily. Emily? Emily looked up. Cheryl moved away slightly. Emily, said Sebastian, I want you to start again, but I want you to put away those notes. Perhaps give them to Miss Hartwright. Cheryl looked at Emily and offered a hand. Emily shrugged and handed over the pieces of paper. Sebastian went and sat back down on the bench. I want you to stop telling me about the costs of mitigation, if only because you look like you're being forced to eat a Brussels sprout every time you say it. He smiled. You seem to care about the park a lot. Tell me what it's like. Paint a picture for me. But what? Emily stopped talking and frowned. You're doing a good job, said Sebastian gently. Just finish it off, but without your notes and without the M word. It sounds like an amazing place. It is, said Emily. It's beautiful, especially early in the morning. There are birds singing. The trees can look alive as their leaves move in the wind. When it's misty, they look like they're dancing, as though they think we can't see them in the mist. We saw two otter in the river recently, and I want to do a school project on them. The butterflies are amazing too, especially when they're warming their wings in the first rays of sun. On one school trip to the park, a red admiral, which is a species of butterfly, spent the whole lunch break landing on everyone's legs and backpacks and hands. We all took photographs and we talked about it for weeks. And this Sunday we saw a waterfall, which is really interesting, because I thought we could try to improve the park by getting a section of the woodland fenced off, so that, although that assumes, I mean, obviously that's not going to happen, I mean, not if the park is unimproved. Emily stopped talking. So, says Sebastian, even if you weren't breaking my heart right now, You've anyway got a brutally detailed report, one that is going to make this whole process dashedly complicated and expensive. Cheryl nodded in reply. Sir, the young woman in the grey suit had reappeared. Sebastian looked at Cheryl. I still wish to be paid for the land, but I am willing to accept your reduced offer. I understand that you also have enough money to refurbish the community centre. We do, said Cheryl. Then this will work. Sebastian looked at the old man in the charcoal suit. Please go in and tell them that I have changed my mind, and that I won't be applying for planning permission. And obviously, I am also no longer selling to capital flight investments. The older man in the charcoal suit nodded. He headed into the auditorium. Sebastian indicated to the young woman in the grey suit, Please can you organise us putting our signatures in the correct places so that Store Park is gifted to the local council via the grant these people have arranged? He looked at Cheryl. You have the paperwork with you, yes? I do, said Cheryl. If this is what you want, said the young woman in the grey suit, then I should check the paperwork over. I'll likely need a few minutes. Sebastian nodded. Of course. Do that now, please. Tuesday, the 4th of October. Power of Us was underway in Cheryl's flat. Emily, Abdul, Dean, Flory, Kyle, Colin, Ying, and a man in his thirties sat in a semicircle. Cheryl was sat in front of them on a chair. Story time, grinned Emily. Cheryl looked at the man in his thirties. Yannick, we always have a story at the end, and any of us can tell it. And, added Carl, we always let Cheryl tell the story because she's just too good at it. Cheryl looked at Dean. Dean nodded in reply. Cheryl and Dean stood up and swapped places. Oh, said Emily, exciting. Dean made himself comfortable on the chair. He looked down at a piece of paper in his lap. A man had heard many stories of the most beautiful of all the flowers. It was said to be found far from the known lands and so he resolved one day to go and search for it. The man packed his bag and left his house. He stopped and smelt the white roses in a neighbour's front garden. Before starting his journey, he reached into his bag and pulled out a bound sketchbook with clean white pages. Across a pair of facing pages, he drew the white roses. As he finished the drawing, a woman walked past. Can you tell me which way it is to the most beautiful of all the flowers? he asked. She pointed south. The man reached a crossroads. Delicate blue papery flowers rippled in the wind in nearby fields. He stopped, took out his sketchbook and drew some of the blue papery flowers. As he finished the drawing, a man appeared at the crossroads on a horse. Can you tell me which way it is to the most beautiful of all the flowers? he asked. The man on the horse pointed to a grassy hill in the distance. The man reached the top of the grassy hill, which turned out to be bestrewn with multicoloured flowers. A small flock of sheep were grazing contentedly with a shepherd sat nearby. The man took out his sketchbook and drew the meadow with the multicoloured flowers and the sheep and the shepherd. 
After finishing the drawing, he walked up to the shepherd. Can you tell me which way it is to the most beautiful of all the flowers? he asked. The shepherd pointed to a mountain that lay beyond the grassy hill, beyond another hill, and beyond another hill after that. The man descended the hill he was on, ascended and descended a series of hills, and finally climbed the mountain. At the very top of the mountain was a hut. A delicate white flower with furry leaves lay by the door. He got out his sketchbook and drew the delicate white flower with furry leaves. After capturing the nature of the flower with his drawing, he opened the door and went inside. A man was lying in a hammock. Can you tell me which way it is the most beautiful of all the flowers? he asked. The man in the hammock got up, walked out of the hut, stepped carefully round the delicate white flower with furry leaves and pointed at a neighbouring mountain. The man descended the mountain he was on, climbed the neighbouring mountain and found an empty hut at the very top. The roof of the hut was covered in a bright green moss with tiny pink flowers. He got out his sketchbook and took his time drawing the bright green moss with tiny pink flowers. Upon finishing his drawing he entered the hut. As he slept for the night he dreamt of flowers of many forms and colours and dispositions including white roses, blue papery flowers, multicoloured flowers arrayed across a meadow, a delicate white flower with furry leaves and a moss with tiny pink flowers. The next day he went outside and no one was around to ask the way. And he was content, and so he stayed and passed the day admiring the view of the mountains. The next night he again dreamt of a multitudinous variety of flowers, with new shapes and forms and colours added from his imagination. The next morning there was a knock on the door, and the woman came in. Can you tell me which way it is to the most beautiful of all the flowers? she asked. I was about to ask the same question, the man replied. Dean folded up the piece of paper and put it in his pocket. I think, said Emily, your story is about Store Park. You're saying that beautiful nature can be found everywhere. You're also saying that it's important to appreciate the things around you and protect them. And I think, said Flurry, Dean is describing our motorhome trip that starts tomorrow. He's saying that we'll see some amazing things, but also that we're leaving behind an amazing place here. And so he's saying that we're looking forward to seeing you all again when we come back. And I think, said Ying, it is about how the most beautiful flowers are found within. Dean smiled. The point of the story. Thank you for listening to my story. I've got other videos. I've got other books. I've got other stories. There'll be links in the description. That kind of thing.